This is Audible. Return Fire, Book 3 of the Earth at War series. Written by Rick Partlow. Narrated by Scott Aiello. Chapter 1 Back in the USSR, Chief Warrant Officer Mark Tremonti sang softly under his breath. You don't know how lucky you are. I laughed. Your mic is hot, Pops, I told him, and your lyrics are outdated. Hasn't been in a USSR in almost 50 years. Hell, we aren't even over the Russian Republic, technically. This is the Ukraine. Though you couldn't have proven it by me. Even with the enhanced optics of the shuttle's main view screen turning overcast zero dark thirty into high noon, I couldn't see anything below us but rolling hills and a pincushion of conifers. Running nap of the earth, it could have been anywhere in the northern hemisphere. Tell that to President Popov, sir, the weathered Delta Force operator shot back. I couldn't see his face behind his helmet's visor, but there was an edge to the words, a darkness to the humor. He's pretty much dedicated himself to pulling together as much of the old Soviet Union as he can, and if he doesn't have international communism as a cause, good old Russian nationalism will do just fine. You know... Julie said, craning her head back from the pilot's seat, her smile twisted at the corner. You're both on hot mics, and I got enough to worry about up here without debating the relative merits of Beatles songs and geopolitics. They know we're coming, and they're not happy about it. Which they? I asked her, shifting in my seat to get a better look at her. It wasn't easy to turn strapped into the shuttle's acceleration couch in Svalen armor, but it was worth a look. Colonel Julie Nieves was the best pilot I'd ever met, and smoking hot. I might have been biased, though, since I was in love with her. The Ukrainians, the Russians, or Chernobog? Yes, she replied. Now shut up and let me fly. We got four MiGs coming in, boss, Lieutenant Lopez, the ship's gunner, warned. The position was a combination of a Rio radar intercept officer from a Navy two-seater, the navigator from an Air Force two-seater, the co-pilot from larger jets, and the gunner from an attack helicopter. And the last had one out because one of the gunner's chief responsibilities was firing the shuttle's primary armament, a coil gun. Eleven o'clock. Ten clicks out. Only four? Julie said, sniffing. I feel vaguely insulted. Well, it's like three in the morning here, I told her. I said shut up, Major she reminded me. Don't make me turn this thing around and go home. They're launching missiles, Lopez announced. Activating countermeasures. Most of the countermeasures were electronic, but a series of hammer blows echoed from the rear of the aerospacecraft as the chaff flare launchers spat out chunks of burning magnesium and clouds of electrostatically charged metal filings. The shuttle's jet engines took a slightly deeper tone and acceleration pushed me back into my seat which fell out from beneath me as Julie took the ship into a dive. The Hammerhead aerospacecraft was huge, over a hundred yards long and at least seventy-five from wingtip to wingtip, but she handled as if she was an F-35. Yeah, that did it, Lopez said after a few seconds. The missiles are chasing their own tails. The MiGs are still coming after us, though. He inclined his head forward, indicating the aircraft. You want me to warn them off? That'd spoil the surprise. Take them down, Lewis. The words could have been light, playful, but they weren't. She knew what she was ordering. No point in wasting time with the main gun. Missiles should do. Targeting, he confirmed. His fingers traced lines across the touchscreen, the computer technology courtesy of the Helta, but the software application strictly human. The Helta didn't use missiles much. Firing four. The fuselage shuddered, one missile after another shaking loose from the internal weapons bay before their rocket engines ignited and they streaked away, glowing spears heading out into the night. They're breaking, Lopez narrated. Launching flares. Not gonna work, he added dispassionately, as if he were watching a football game on TV and didn't care who won. Our missiles had curved away in pursuit of the fleeing Russian jets, and all I could see of them was the faint glow of their exhaust trails. Whatever happened next was distant, physically as well as emotionally. When Lopez's pronouncement came a few moments later, it was anticlimactic. They're down, not seeing any shoots. The screen is clear, so antiseptic. It reminded me of a space battle, and of why I disliked space battles. Get your people ready, Andy, Julie told me, her voice businesslike. We're on the ground in three. Lieutenant Landry, I said, twisting around instinctively to look back into the cargo hold, even though I was speaking over my helmet radio. 
We ought to ask the bird in three. Yes, sir. The kid's voice wavered just a little, and I couldn't say as I blamed him. This was his first combat operation, which was why his ranger platoon had been chosen to run support for the Delta team. If everything went well, he'd just stay back and engage any targets we missed, and if it went to shit, Pops would tell him what to do. He was green enough and in awe enough of the very concept of working with Delta Force that he'd do it without question. I couldn't have picked him out of the identical camo-colored exoskeletal armored Svalin suits strapped into identical seats in the back of the shuttle, but he had the same immutable human instinct as me, and turned to face his platoon as he gave them orders. I couldn't hear him, his voice trapped inside his helmet, his commands on their platoon frequency. I assumed they were the same sort of standard, redundant bullshit I'd said to my platoon when I'd been a brand new officer fresh out of training. His platoon sergeant would make sure he didn't fuck up too badly. And Quinn was in his platoon, which was another reason I'd chosen them to back us up. I didn't know many of the rangers, but Corporal Randolph Quinn had seemed competent from the first time I'd met him during training, and I felt more comfortable with him watching my back. There it is, Pops said. I turned back to the forward view screens, something in my gut rebelling at the idea that the whole view was a projection, that the shuttle had no physical canopy. I mean, it made sense. The bird was constructed from honeycomb boron composite, shit we could only have made by the ounce before the Helta came along. Heat resistant enough to take a shot from one of the lasers the Tavinians used on their fighters, and tough enough to probably absorb the blast from an air-to-air missile. It would have been particularly stupid to leave a gap in the ship's armor right over the cockpit, just for the sake of tradition. Then again, fighter pilots were big on tradition, and it had been a hell of a tussle between the pilots and the engineers. What had finally convinced them was the inarguable fact that the shuttle simply couldn't be flown dead stick. If the power went out, so did the controls, and ejecting was the only option, which involved the whole cockpit separating from the rest of the bird. Of course, I was hoping it wouldn't come to that. The compound was just visible now over the rolling hills, what could have been and probably used to be an industrial park out in the middle of what Jambo would have called bumfuck Egypt, the only ground approach a single gravel road. It was innocuous enough, just a cluster of sheet metal buildings with a few semis parked outside. Until the SAM turrets rose from one of those buildings. You seeing that, Lewis? Julie asked. It constantly amazed me how she could sound so calm flying a hunk of metal twice as long as a B-52 bomber at supersonic speeds. Yeah, Lopez confirmed. Don't know if I have time to target each one, though. Better just take out the whole building. Controls are yours. The nose of the shuttle dipped as Lieutenant Lopez edged it downward with the joystick, and his own targeting reticle coalesced on the main screen, hovering over the tallest of the sheet metal buildings. The reticle drifted left, and so did we, but I could barely feel it, and when it was lined up with the corner of the warehouse, maybe twenty feet down from the roof, Lopez's finger caressed the trigger. Guns, he announced. The shuttle was riding on the most powerful jet engines that had ever taken the air, powered by a particle bed reactor rather than aviation fuel, putting out hundreds of thousands of pounds of thrust. But when the coil gun fired, it nearly stalled us out. The tungsten slug hit the building at thousands of yards per second, plumes of dust billowing from the entrance and exit wounds. For the space of a breath, I was prepared to believe the round had made a clean wound, in and out, with a little bleeding, but not bones or blood vessels or major damage, like the kind you always see in the movies when the hero gets hit. But this warehouse was not, apparently, an action hero. The structural support for the roof had been blown into fragments, and those fragments had taken out everything in their way. The top floor of the building collapsed inward, taking with it the surface-to-air missile turrets, and then rapidly the rest of the structure. Tiny figures scattered from ground floor exits, racing ahead of the falling roof, disappearing in clouds of black smoke and debris. I hope, Pops commented from beside me, that our target wasn't taking a walk through that building just now, Lieutenant Lopez. Sorry, Mr. Tremonti, Lopez said, not sounding the least bit apologetic. But it's my job to get you on the ground alive. The rest is up to you. I grinned unabashedly, not worried about aggravating Pops since he couldn't see it.
Pops, along with the rest of the team, had gotten used to a certain level of awe being demonstrated towards Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, or Delta Force, or the Unit, or Combat Applications Group, or whatever their official designation happened to be this week. After all, he was working with Rangers and Zoomies, Space Force, anyway, which was just rebranded Zoomies. As the saying went, when it came to Delta operators, Zoomies wanted them and Rangers wanted to be them, and that was the natural order of things. But familiarity had bred, if not contempt, at least comfort, and the officers picked to work in the first interplanetary detachment were the best of the best in their own right. Set us down just inside the fence line, I told Julie, forcing my mind back to the mission. North side. That should give us some cover with all the smoke from the building. Gotcha. Get off the mark quick, though. Next shuttle is about thirty seconds behind us. It was a risk, bringing two of the birds out here. They were invaluable, and even though we were pretty sure the Russians didn't have anything that could touch them, all it would take was one golden BB, and irreplaceable Helta technology and engineering would be left burning in the depths of rural Ukraine, which would probably make Popov laugh like a son of a bitch. Thirty seconds, Julie said. Then, after a pause, Lewis, we got some dismounts gathering in our LZ. Encourage them to move. A missile streaked up from the skittering ants on the ground. A man pad, or man portable air defense system. The fancy military name for a shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missile launcher. I was opening my mouth to shout a warning, but Julie had already seen it, and she jerked the shuttle into a barrel roll, leaving my stomach somewhere around a thousand feet up. I gritted my teeth and clenched my jaws tight to keep my last meal from redecorating the cockpit. And over the scream of turbojets and the surprise squawks filling the team band in my earphones, I caught the thump-thump of the countermeasures launching again. They must have worked, because we leveled out again almost immediately. Then, a stuttering white thread connected the ship's chin turret with the ground for a full second. It was the same weapon, the coil gun, but Lopez had set the variable rate of fire for full auto and reduced the muzzle velocity. The same control had switched out the ammunition from armor-piercing tungsten penetrators to sintered metal incendiary rounds, ignited by an energy pulse at the emitter into a superheated plasma. I didn't see the round's impact, but I couldn't imagine it was too pleasant for the troops on the ground. I might have felt more sympathy if they weren't a bunch of bloodthirsty mercenaries. Chernobog was so outlandish, it was hard to believe they were real. They'd been founded by a friend of the late and unlamented Vladimir Putin, a man named Yevgeny Lermontov, who had made a name for himself as a particularly amoral GRU officer. Lermontov was, to put it mildly, a nutburger. The mercenary company was named in honor of the Slavic paganism Lermontov and the other high-ranking officers professed to believe which was odd enough, but the man himself was a butcher, who professed to admire the career of Adolf Hitler. Putin had used Lermontov's Chernobog company in Syria, the Ukraine, and Central Africa to carry out Russian policy while maintaining plausible deniability, and Popov had used him the same way, to infiltrate the shipyards in lunar orbit, to kidnap our Tavinian prisoner, and steal one of the three hyperdrive starships that were under construction, which was why we were here. Touching down, Julie said, yelling over the banshee scream of the landing jets. Everybody up, Pops commanded. Loud enough, everyone could probably have heard him without the helmet radios. I hit the quick release for my seat restraints, and I was up before them, grabbing the back of the acceleration couch for balance and locking the magnets in my boot heels to the deck. The landing gear slammed into the packed dirt of the courtyard, sinking to the limits of the hydraulics before springing back up. The belly ramp was part way down, and the rangers ducked out through the gap, led by Quinn's fire team. Lieutenant Landry went out right behind them, as eager to get into the action and lead from the front as any other dumbass kid who wanted nothing more than to be a ranger. I let the rangers go first because age had taught me something, but I went out ahead of the Delta team because it apparently hadn't taught me enough. Back in the USSR... Chapter 2 The night was on fire. I could have read a book by the glare of the burning warehouse, even if my helmet optics hadn't turned everything to daylight. Bodies and pieces of bodies were scattered around the LZ, ripped apart and burned black by plasma incendiary rounds from the shuttle. 
I tried not to look at them. I knew too well it was a losing battle, but I'd see them again in nightmares, but there was too much to do for me to worry about it. Move off the LZ, I ordered. Next bird touches down in 30 seconds. Everyone off the LZ. The ramp was swinging up, and the belly jets were kicking up clouds of dirt and gravel, the stones pinging off my armor in off-key notes. The impossibly huge aerospacecraft climbed back into the sky on columns of fire. The rangers had curved into a perimeter, a half-circle facing away from the nine-foot-high wire fence. And now, the semicircle shifted into a pair of arrowhead wedges, moving toward the demolished warehouse. The shuttle's belly jets braided the smoke from the wrecked building as it rose, the exhaust a faint glow. The next lander was somewhere out there, maybe a couple miles away, but I didn't look for it. I knew the dozen or so troops who died on the LZ weren't a fraction of Chernabog's full strength. We caught them flat-footed, but these guys, whatever I thought of them, were not amateurs. Most were former Spetsnots, and Svalin armor or not, underestimating them would be the last thing we did. We got movement to the southwest, Quinn said. I can't make anything out on thermal because of the fires. Spread out. I told Landry. You guys take the flanks. We're heading straight up the middle for the command center. I held my KE rifle out ahead of me and waved for the Delta team to follow. This way. Communications protocols had been one of the first casualties of the Svalin armor. When the radio was a connection to someone far away, to be used only when a report was due or support was needed, there was time and a need to strictly identify everyone transmitting to carefully delineate when a transmission began and ended so that part of it didn't get stepped on and ignored. With the helmets constantly on and the visors usually closed, every communication between infantry soldiers was a radio call, and there just wasn't time for all that protocol when soldiers were trying to maneuver under fire. Luckily, the new comm system developed in concert with the Helta had rendered the ordinary protocols unnecessary. They could transmit and receive simultaneously, and if one transmission stepped on another, the system recorded the missed transmission and played it right after the end of the first. And there was little need to identify yourself because the IFF, Identification Friend or Foe Tracker, in the helmet's heads-up display showed you the name and position of responsibility of the person transmitting. The command center, which was a fancy-sounding name for what was essentially a three-story office building, was a hundred yards across the compound on the other side of the warehouse. We curved around the wreckage, letting two squads of rangers cover our rear approach, and I thought I could hear the roar of jet engines coming in for a landing, but the building was between us and the landing zone, and I couldn't be sure. Contact right! I didn't know who said it. I didn't recognize the voice, so it wasn't Quinn or Landry or Platoon Sergeant Kim. The messenger wasn't as important as the message. The Chernabog forces were streaming out of the command center like hornets from a nest, and I received sudden and dramatic confirmation that our intelligence reports had been unfortunately accurate. They were wearing powered armor. It wasn't as advanced as our Svalins, probably because they hadn't had Helta engineers hanging around to brainstorm with every time they ran into a problem. The edges were rough, the look clunky and clutched together with pistons running off the major joints under jury-rigged armored collars. They also lacked our KE rifles, thank God, though I'm sure they would have found a way to steal the design eventually. Being Russian, they'd gone a simpler way, mounting 127 millimeter heavy machine guns and recoilless rifles on gimbals attached to their backpacks. It was a system with drawbacks, the primary one being that it would be impossible to fire the weapons from the prone, but they had the typical Russian virtues of being big, cheap, and powerful. Those virtues were easy to appreciate, with machine gun rounds the size of my little finger zipping through the air around us. A sledgehammer smacked into my right shoulder, and I stumbled, cursing reflexively and hunting for a target. The round hadn't quite penetrated, but it had been a close thing. I fired by instinct into the middle of the line of charging mercenaries, the whole battle like some absurd 18th century engagement where troops rushed across the battlefield at each other, counting on luck and bad aim for survival. Not that there was much choice for either side. The Chernabog mercenaries had to know that the walls of their buildings were only temporary shelter. They'd lost air superiority, and they had nothing to match the firepower of our shuttles. So, staying inside just meant dying in the burning rubble. As for us... We had to get inside that building before they had time to scrub their hard drives. 
The gunfire sounded odd to me after more than a year of facing laser weapons on starships and space stations and alien worlds, lending an unpleasant air of reality and immediacy to the confrontation. My M900 butted hard against my shoulder, a kick I could feel even through the armor, and a bulky, awkward suit of Russian armor tumbled sideways, the pencil-thick hole punched through its chest plate seeming minor and unimpressive. I knew the truth, though had seen it in the aftermath of combat. The round had been traveling at 10,000 feet per second, and when it passed through a human torso, it turned everything in its wake into jelly. What was left of the Russians' internal organs could have been poured into a bucket, and the extra armor hadn't done more than slow it down a thousand feet per second. Which wasn't a knock on their armor, since ours wouldn't have done any better. It was unnerving seeing proof of that played out before my eyes as one after another of the mercenaries dropped to our gunfire, and I uttered a silent prayer to an agnostic's god that we wouldn't have to face anyone else with the technology, even though I knew it was inevitable in the long run. The gun battle was the work of ten seconds, fifteen at the most. Confusion and chaos stretched time, perception fraying in the chest-deep thump of heavy machine guns the cacophony of recoilless rifles discharging, the kettle drum roll of exploding shells. Men and women were wounded, dying, dead, and not all of them were the enemy. I wanted to pull the Russians out of their armor and berate them before they died, to ask them why, when we'd finally encountered something beyond ourselves, they were still grubbing for pennies on the ground. But I knew what they'd say if they could answer. This was how it had always been, and this was how it would always be. They were Russians. Jambo told me once that the definition of fatalistic in Merriam-Webster's dictionary was in Russian. They might have won. They outnumbered us, and despite the disparity of our weapons, quantity, as Stalin said, has a quality all its own. But the tide turned when a fire hose spray of tungsten slugs ripped into the Chernobog forces from their opposite flank. The other shuttle had landed, and two platoons of rangers had circled around the burning warehouse to catch the mercenaries in a crossfire. K.E. gunfire shifted the corpses from one side to the other, but nothing moved of its own accord, and I thought it was over, until a machine gun barrel crashed through a window on the top floor of the office building and erupted with a deep-throated report. At least a half a dozen K.E. rifles returned fire, and the window disappeared, along with about six square feet of the wall around it. Pops! I yelled. Hit the door! Dog! Pops ordered. Preacher! Take it out! Ringo, you're on point. Those weren't their real names, of course. It wasn't code and had nothing to do with operational security. It was just their nicknames. No one picked their own nickname either. And if someone transferred onto a team, keeping their old nickname wasn't a sure thing. You earned it, either by what you did or who you were. Preacher and Ringo were new, replacements for casualties from our last mission. And it was a little unusual for them to have nicknames this early in their tenure. But Pops knew Ringo from way back and had given him a pass. And Preacher? Well, sitting down next to the man for an hour and hearing him extol the virtues of CrossFit was enough explanation for his nom de guerre. The double doors that were the front entrance of the office building were solid, reinforced steel, probably sturdy enough that we couldn't take it down with a doorbuster round from a 12-gauge or a man-portable battering ram. Lucky for us, we had something a bit more energetic. Dog and Preacher had their K.E. guns set for full auto. The velocity of the rounds dialed back in exchange for a higher rate of fire, and they stitched a double line up the inside of both doors, blowing fist-sized holes through the thick metal with each impact. The doors swung open under the barrage of slugs and Ringo sprinted inside, firing as he went, with Dog and Preacher at his heels. I was right behind them, not because I felt the need to prove anything, but because this was a snatch-and-grab mission and it was my responsibility to make sure no one got froggy and put a round through Lermontov. Someone had made the mistake of standing too close to the doors, and he'd paid for it with his life, catching three or four rounds through the torso. His face was mostly intact, and it wasn't our target, so I kicked his AK clear of his body, left him for the rangers to identify, and pushed ahead. What had been a reception desk when this place was an office park was a security barrier now for when Chernobog brought potential clients in to talk business, I suppose. They made most of their money working for Popov, but that didn't mean they'd turn down a payday if they could get the job approved by the Russian government.
The barrier was constructed of bulletproof plexiglass, but no one had been stupid enough to try to hide behind it. Beyond the barrier were three ancient metal desks with ancient computer monitors that had been as old as Corporal Quinn, and past those, in the left-hand corner, was a staircase heading to the upper stories. Preacher and Dog were covering it. Ringo was across the room, looking through a doorway down another set of steps, these going down to the basement. Up or down, boss? Dog asked me, motioning with the finger of his off hand between the two stairways. Pops, I said, looking back over my shoulder. In an instinct, I couldn't break even after so many months wearing the armor. I'm taking Preacher, Dog, Scooter, and Ringo to the basement to secure the servers. You take the rest of the team upstairs and get Lermontov if he's there. Yeah, the older man drawled, clomping past me to the staircase. Don't think I don't know you're taking the basement because you think that's where Lermontov is. I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Tremonti, I said archly, trying to sound serious, but not quite pulling it off. Dog, you're on point. I hate stairs, Dog admitted. He yanked a flashbang off his vest, thumbed out the pin with a motion that would never have worked without the enhanced musculature of the suit, and tossed it down the stairs. Fire in the hole, he added belatedly, just before the concussion grenade exploded somewhere twenty yards below us. The thunderclap of the blast was still echoing when he jumped with a screeching battle cry wasted on the rest of us since no one could hear it through his helmet. Preacher and Ringo scrambled down the stairs behind him, mostly, I think, because they wanted to beat me to it. But I managed to get ahead of Scooter. I barely made it through the door before I heard gunfire from below and knew I'd made the right choice. Preacher left a man-shaped indentation in the wall on the landing smashing into the sheetrock with his armored shoulder to arrest his descent and scramble down the second flight of steps. But Ringo slowed down the more conventional way, which meant he was going slow enough to take a burst of machine gun fire in the chest. It didn't penetrate, but the impact was enough to send him stumbling backwards off balance into Scooter's path behind me. And I did something very stupid and launched myself down the stairs past him. So many bad things could have happened in the long second it took me to hit the floor at the bottom of the stairs, from getting shot to slipping and breaking an expensive part in my expensive suit to running straight into the back of one of my own men like a huge fucking idiot. None of them did, because God smiles on the simple-minded. I landed with a whine of overtaxed servo motors between dog and preacher crouched at the bottom of the steps laying down suppressive fire against a doorway at the end of a long hall, a good fifty feet away. K.E. rounds were ripping pieces off the wall. They had to have their weapons set at the minimum velocity, or they would have simply passed through and killed whatever was on the other side. And I knew it was time to do one more stupid thing. Cover me, I yelled, and sprinted for the end of the hall. The door was on the left, which meant I couldn't just barrel right through. Svalin armor is more agile than you'd think, but it did bring my cumulative weight to somewhere north of 800 pounds. You don't just stop on a dime running 20 miles an hour with nearly 600 pounds of metal strapped to your ass. I was thinking fast and trying not to let my body outrun my head. The wall ahead of me was a dead end, but my thermal filter showed neat rows of mechanical heat sources behind it. What I was betting were the power sources for the computer servers, which meant the wall wasn't thick and might not be load-bearing. This should work. I sped up and was running about 25 miles an hour when I slammed my right shoulder into the wall. It turned out to be sheetrock over cement block, and thank God for shoddy Soviet-era workmanship and lack of supplies, because if there had been rebar through the pour, I would have looked damn silly bouncing off of it. Instead, I crashed through in a spray of rubble and dust, and very nearly ran straight into the barrel of a cord 127 millimeter heavy machine gun. The Chernobog mercenary holding it was wearing their version of powered armor. And up close, it was even more the very model of Russian engineering. Rife with bolts and welds and even duct tape in some spots. I grabbed the barrel in my left hand and jammed the muzzle of my KE rifle under his chin. I couldn't see his face through his visor, but he was too short to be Lermontov, so I put a round through his head. He didn't fall. His joints locked and held him upright, a metal statue erected to the vanished Russian space age by some modern artist, the back of his helmet ruptured and splattered with blood. Beyond him, the room was swathed in a haze of gun smoke and dust, 
the blinking lights of dozens of computer servers each wreathed in their own individual halos. A small man with short, dark hair and glasses was working frantically at a panel, and I had a hunch he intended to wipe whatever information was stored here. I didn't like shooting an unarmed man, but there was no way I could reach him in time, and a bad guy with a computer was just as dangerous as one with a gun. He spun away when the tungsten slug took him in the chest, probably dead before he even knew he'd been hit. Are you okay, boss? Dog asked, scrambling through the door behind me, but I didn't answer. The room was maybe thirty yards long and twenty wide, the majority of the space taken up by the servers. I couldn't see another soul besides the two I'd already killed, but I knew Lermontov was down here somewhere. It was just gut instinct, but an old one. I dealt with people like him in Venezuela. Russia hadn't wanted the country to fall to the United States, but they hadn't wanted to risk open war with us, not with their economy and population so hard hit by the Wuhan virus not that long before. They'd sent mercenaries to aid the Venezuelan junta, not Chernobog that time, but close enough. Even though they nominally worked for money, they were patriots to the core, and there was no way Lermontov would run which meant he wouldn't be on the ground floor, where the chance for escape was the greatest. And he wasn't stupid, so he wouldn't have gone upstairs, where he could be cut off. No, he was down here. He wanted to take those servers out, and I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't have enough charges planted to take down the whole building. I scanned the walls on thermal. The sides were solid, and so was the floor, the only heat coming from power cables running in from the generators. But the back wall, there was a heat source back there. The wall was insulated, so I couldn't make out what the hot thing was back there, but I was willing to bet it was Russian. I couldn't remember making the decision, but I was moving. It had worked once, and if it ain't broke, then keep hitting it until it breaks. I used my foot this time because I didn't need to go tumbling into the hidden room head first, and it did the job. I'd found the hidden door, and it smashed inward, the boards splintering under the sole of my boot, and I was face to face with Yevgeny Lermontov. He was wearing powered armor, but he had his helmet off, revealing the same long, horse-like face, etched with the deep lines of every single one of his fifty-six years. His short hair and handlebar mustache shot with gray. His steel-blue eyes burned with the same fanaticism others had seen in the last moments of their lives. A small electronic control was in his left hand, a set of wires in his right, and I wanted to make some droll commentary on the irony of a man in powered armor setting up an explosive charge with a detonation rig from 50 years ago, but this was Russia, so I punched him in the face instead. The detonator went flying, and when Lermontov didn't, I thought I might have to hit him again, but his eyes were crossed and his mouth was open, blood pouring from his nose. He lost his balance, and the armor did as it was told and toppled backward like a felled tree. The crash was impressive. Stepping over him, I put the muzzle of my K.E. rifle in his face, then leaned down and stripped the CZ 9mm from his chest holster. Colonel Yevgeny Lermontov, I told him, though I wasn't sure if he was conscious or whether he spoke English. Greetings from the United States Marine Corps. You fuck with the wrong people this time, you low-life piece of shit. Boss, Dog said, standing in the remains of the door. I want you to know I say this with all due respect and not a little bit of love. You're fucking nuts. Chapter 3 This place hasn't changed one fucking bit. I hadn't meant the words to sound quite so bitter, but there it was. Caracas. Why the fuck was I in Caracas again? It was a good question, so I went ahead and asked the CIA field officer next to me in the minivan. Why the fuck are we in Caracas? His name, as far as any of us knew, was Justin Mansour, and I didn't like him. It was nothing personal. He was an open-faced, friendly type, ordinary-looking, with a widow's peak and a ready smile, and he hadn't shown anything but good manners and a civil tone, but I didn't like spooks. Maybe it's the way they always dressed the same, a forced casual that never seemed natural to me. Or maybe it was that slightly oily way they always agreed with you and tried to make you feel comfortable when you knew they'd fuck you over in a heartbeat if their mission required it, and they'd never tell you, not even after the knife had gone in. He looked away from the shadow-strewn roads of the Katia Barrio long enough to cock an eyebrow at me. What? he asked. 
You wanted us to do this illegal as shit interrogation in Idaho or Virginia? The dude's basically Russian military. And maybe this new alien tech we have can knock down ICBMs, but I sure as hell don't want to be the guy who makes us find out the hard way. We kept the Tavinian EPW at the construction station in lunar orbit, I reminded him. No cameras there. And no banditos waiting around the corner to ambush us either. Mansoor chuckled, which he might have meant to sound ingratiating, but instead seemed dismissive. No banditos around here these days, he insisted. At least none stupid enough to attack a gringo, not after President Martejena hung the last few from lamp posts with their guts hanging around their ankles. Oh yeah, Pops murmured from the back seat. That always does the trick. Katya was still a labyrinth out of Dante's nightmare. Narrow, winding streets climbing the hills, the tenements on either side squeezing in, claustrophobic, intimidating. It was worse at night, with street lights that only worked sporadically, and only then until someone vandalized them. I stared into the darkness, and the faces stared back, desperately poor, eternally angry. Hell, Mansoor said, as if reading my thoughts. We're building them a fucking fusion reactor. Martejena says he's going to use the free energy and the new fabrication plants to build free housing and tear these barrios down. Everyone will have enough to eat, clothes to wear, free entertainment. Noble idea, Pop said, leaning against the back of my seat. But it ain't gonna work for this generation. Maybe not the next either. Someday, though, Mansoor insisted. He grinned. And since we're all gonna live like three or four hundred years, we'll even be around to see it. Okay, that almost cheered me up. Here it is, Mansoor said, pulling the ancient Toyota into a driveway, pausing at a pitted and faded garage door and shutting off the headlights. He honked the horn, and it began to roll open, the sections hesitating on the way up as rusted hinges resisted with the inertia of age. We pulled into utter darkness, illuminated only by the red glow of the brake lights. The door closed, and we waited inside the van, until the final clunk sounded and the lights switched on. The garage was ordinary, faded and cracked cement and cheap plastic doors. The man standing by the light switch was not. He was Venezuelan military intelligence, if you wanted to use euphemisms. The death squads, if you wanted to be brutally honest. I could read it in his face, in the twist of his mouth, in the shark black eyes that had seen too much death and violence, and decided at some point that they liked it. My gut tightened and I tried not to remember fighting beside men like him. Not that I ever felt like we were supporting the wrong side. This was Venezuela, and there were only two kinds of people here, victims and victimizers. And for once, we hadn't even tried to pretend we'd come to set the people free or establish democracy. I mean, we'd tried afterward, and the jury was still out whether it would work. But we'd come here because Venezuela had become the Western Hemisphere's own version of 1990s Afghanistan a haven for terrorists and drug lords, and Russia wasn't going to do a damned thing about it. Guys, this is Carlos, Mansoor told us as we climbed out of the van. Carlos, these are the guys. Take us to Lermontov. Carlos didn't say a word, just eyed us with the flat expression of a venomous snake and pulled the door open. Anyway, Mansoor said, the reason we didn't do this in space was that no one trusts the security of the facility right now since the Tavinian got grabbed. I shot Mansoor a sharp look, but he shrugged it off. Carlos has already been read in. How the hell did you think he was going to help us interrogate the man without knowing the questions we needed to ask? Pops just shook his head and pulled the door shut behind us. The light in the hallway was dim, the bulb hidden behind a crystal globe half filled with dead bugs, and I could see well enough to make out the word Pop's mouth. Spooks. The interior of the house was surreal, as if someone had taken a security cell from a prison and plopped it into an urban townhouse in a barrio in Caracas. There were a couple of regular bedrooms. We passed them on the way to where the dining room should have been. Their doors hung open, revealing bare walls and a couple of folding cots with duffel bags propped in corners, overflowing with clothes. Presumably the clothes and the bags belonged to the four men guarding Colonel Lermontov. The Russian was strapped into what might have been an old dentist chair, which brought back uneasy memories of watching Marathon Man on TV as a kid, and I hope to God that wasn't the direction this was going to take. He'd already had a rough day. 
flying straight here from Poland in the hold of a C-17, and if he'd had any sleep, it had been accidental. I'd only caught about an hour in our shuttle, so I wasn't in the best of moods myself, but seeing Lermontov's twin black eyes and flattened nose certainly lifted my spirits. The guards were scattered around the mercenary commander, HKM-27s slung over their shoulders. They were bearded and hard-eyed and looking enough like locals that it was a coin flip whether they worked with Carlos or Mansour. The woman was the one who was out of place. She was clean and professional and well-dressed and a gringa and obviously didn't belong here. But the case open on the table beside her explained her purpose. Vials of clear liquid ready to load into an injector gun, a stethoscope, a sphygmomanometer, an ophthalmoscope, and other things, things I was less comfortable with and I hoped she wouldn't have to use. Dr. Valentine, Mansour said, nodding to the woman. Are we ready to go? Just waiting for you she said with the husky voice of a woman who'd spent far too many years smoking cigarettes. Doctors, they always have the worst habits. Mansour didn't introduce us, which upped my opinion of his competence. Lermontov, of course, needed no introduction. You think you can get me to talk? He scoffed, his English a little stiff, the muscles in his neck bunching, as if he would have been shaking his head if he hadn't been strapped down. Better men than you have tried. A true son of Russia, a Slav. We bow to no one, and especially not you American dogs. Oh boy, he's a real treat, isn't he? Mansour said, leaning casually against the wall as if he wanted to enjoy the show. You really punched him in the face? I can do it again if you like, I offered. You, Lermontov said, his eyes widening inside their raccoon mask of bruises. You are the pig who assaulted me. I am that pig, I confessed. And you're a lying sack of shit. You're no fucking Slav. Your parents and grandparents were German. And you're always bowing to someone, whether it's Popov or Putin or Stalin or Nicholas. So why don't we cut the shit and you can tell us who hired your people to steal our ship? I expected a denial, more bluster, more insistence we'd never get him to talk. Instead, he laughed. He laughed long and hard, spit flying out of his mouth, and I was glad I'd stayed a safe distance away. <laughs> Is that all? he wondered. Is that what you seek from me? I exchanged a look with Pops, and I wondered if my expression was as confused as his. I would have told you back in the Ukraine. Lermontov was jovial, like a man who just learned his team won the championship. There is no point in keeping it a secret, because there isn't a damned thing you can do about it. You tried to cheat us out of our place in the universe, to grab the power and riches for yourselves, as you Americans always do. But we have outsmarted you yet again. Mansour sighed, and it could have been that he was as exasperated as I was, but I thought it more likely that he was playing a role. Dr. Valentine, he said. I think we can proceed. The subject is obviously just playing for time. They do not need to play for time, Lermontov told him, his laugh mocking. You are the ones running out of time. Our allies are this very second, making our own deal to benefit the human race, not to defend a group of freakish mutations. When this war ends... What remains of the United States will beg us for aid, for the crumbs from our table. That was enough. I closed the distance between us with one step and grabbed his nose between my thumb and forefinger and squeezed. He screamed. Listen to me, you bloody-handed piece of mercenary shit, I grated out. Despite an adult life devoted primarily to applying overwhelming violence, I don't generally take pleasure in the pain of others. But I've had maybe an hour's sleep in the last four days, and I'm just so willing to make an exception in your case. Tell me who hired you to take our prisoner and steal our ship. The Chinese, he said, his voice comically distorted by the grip I had on his nose. I let go and hissed out a breath. It was the answer I'd expected, but one I'd hoped not to hear. If it had just been the Russian government, we might have been able to contain it. But if Chairman Zhang was involved in this... Fuck. No, you understand, American, Lermontov growled, the amusement and the laughter gone, but the satisfaction still there. No, you see, you have already lost. How many Chinese? I asked. 
How many of your men? He seemed as if he was going to be reluctant to answer the question, and I went for his nose again. A dozen of my men in powered armor, he told me. Ten Chinese, eight in the flight crew, plus a high-ranking Red Army officer and some sort of diplomat. They didn't get any of their names. They didn't need to know. And where were they headed? They didn't tell me that, he insisted, scoffing. Why would they? Do I seem to you a man knowledgeable of other star systems? I just know they're going to meet these... Tevinians. I turned away and rubbed a hand over the back of my head, fighting a yawn. Do you believe him? Pops asked me. I nodded, too exhausted to speak. Yeah, me too, Mansoor admitted, sighing. But we're gonna do our due diligence anyway. He motioned at Valentine. Doctor, if you would. She took the injector out of her bag and began loading a vial of some clear liquid. We gonna stick around for that? Pops wondered. I think I should get the word back, I told Mansoor. If his story changes, you'll let us know? Of course, he said. Then fished his keys out of his pocket and tossed them to me. Just leave the van at the airbase, keys in the visor. I'll get a ride. What about him? Pops asked, motioning at Lermontov. What happens to him once you've confirmed what he said? I don't know what you mean, Mansoor said, his smile coy. We certainly wouldn't risk open war with the Russian Federation by kidnapping one of their sovereign citizens and holding him against his will in another country. As far as anyone is concerned, Colonel Yevgeny Lermontov died in the mysterious attack on his compound in the Ukraine. Pops said nothing, just followed me into the hallway back out to the garage. I tossed him the keys, and he caught them without looking. Spooks, man, he murmured once the door was closed behind us. I hate fucking spooks. Chapter 4 Do you play golf, Major Clanton? Assistant Secretary of State for Interplanetary Affairs Roberto Garcia asked me, smiling broadly. I stared at him, trying to make my eyes focus. Two hours of sleep on the flight from Caracas to San Antonio hadn't helped as much as he might think. Garcia was Delia Strawbridge's replacement, or so I gathered from listening to him talk to General Michael Oliveira. The two were polar opposites, the general in his blue dress uniform, tall and straight-backed, with an aquiline nose and a recruiting poster jawline, and the career diplomat in his Brooks Brothers suit, his hair long and wavy his face soft around the edges. Yet the two apparently shared an undying love of golf, and they'd been going on about the different courses they'd played for the better part of an hour while we waited for the president to arrive. I tried to sleep with my eyes open without actually putting my head down on the conference table like a child at nap time. I do not, I admitted, unless you count miniature, and I play that badly. Oh boy, does he, Julie agreed from across the table. Maybe we could all go golfing sometime, Garcia suggested. I mean, assuming all this doesn't end up in World War III, and we're not all living in a radioactive wasteland in a few months, you could give it a try. I know this wonderful course in Nevada, not too far from where you live. On your feet, Oliveira barked, as the double doors to the conference room burst open at the push of Secret Service agents, and the President stalked into the room. I'm not trying to brag when I say that I knew the man well enough by now to tell when he was in a bad mood, and President Crenshaw was in a bad mood. He usually took the time to change out of his dress clothes at his ranch, but when he came in, he still wore a suit, along with the face grim enough to start the war Garcia had been joking about a moment earlier. Sit down, he snapped, dropping into a seat at the head of the table without a preamble. National Security Advisor Tommy Caldwell followed him and silently took a seat to his right. The man was a combat veteran, a hard charger, but today he looked as troubled as I had ever seen him. I want an assessment, Crenshaw said, his natural eye and the prosthetic beside it tracking each of us, daring us to speak. The likeliest location that the Chinese took our ship, he hissed in obvious frustration. Does the damn thing have a name yet? Because calling it the ship is beginning to get on my nerves. Anyone? Oliveira cleared his throat. No, sir. We were waiting for guidance from the Department of Defense as to what your office wished to name the ship. The president grunted dissatisfaction, but waved at him to continue. Mr. President, Oliveira said, answering the more important of the two questions. 
The ship they stole wasn't fully fueled. Fueled, the president repeated. I thought their drives used some sort of gravity field thing. I didn't blame him for not knowing the nomenclature. He'd been a SEAL, not a physicist. And the only reason I knew was because I, what seemed like a lifetime ago but was really only a year or so, had made a living writing science fiction. Oliveira might or might not have been impatient at the question, but the man was a general. And you didn't get to be a general without being an expert on asses. Who's to kick and who's to kiss. And the president's ass always got kissed, unless you were tired of your job. There are two different terms in use here, sir, he said. Fuel and reaction mass. Reaction mass is what leaves the exhaust in a conventional rocket, and Newton's laws being what they are makes the rocket go in the opposite direction. In a chemical rocket, there's the fuel and the oxidizer. In a nuclear-powered rocket, there's the fuel, as in the nuclear fuel rods, and the reaction mass, the thing they heat and accelerate out the exhaust. In the Helta warp engine, there is no reaction mass because it propels the ship by manipulating space-time, kind of like a boat propeller in water except the water in this case is the fabric of the universe. The same field is used to open a wormhole for the hyperdimensional translation for interstellar travel. However, as with a nuclear rocket, there is still fuel for the reactor, because the warp field generator requires a fusion reactor to power it. In this case, the fuel is metallic hydrogen. Right, President Crenshaw interrupted. I know about that. The Helta helped us build a production plant for it in lunar orbit. They did. The corners of Oliveira's eyes tensed ever so slightly, and I'd served with him long enough to know it reflected how very much he disliked being interrupted. But there was that whole asses thing, and he kept puckering up. The starship, the Chinese hijacked, was scheduled for a proving run out to Alpha Centauri. Today, actually. Since metallic hydrogen is expensive and has multiple uses, the ship was only loaded with enough fuel pellets for the round trip, but no more. He glanced at Julie, and she took up the thread, perhaps a bit reluctantly. She didn't like dealing with the politicians, but Oliveira, she told me, had insisted she learn to do it for her career's sake, which I suppose was a cool thing for him to do as a boss. He wasn't a bad guy, for all that he was a brass hat. There's only one Tavinian outpost we know of that's in range for the amount of fuel they had, Mr. President. She unfolded a tablet and touched the screen to activate the image she'd already had called up on it then handed it across the table to the president. HD 196761, he repeated, frowning. 46 light years? That seems awfully far away. I thought they were low on fuel. Oliveira sucked in a breath and let it out in a slow hiss. Warning sign number two, he was having to rein in his impatience. I decided he needed a break, so I took over. As I understand it, sir, hyperspace... I stopped myself and grimaced, remembering the official terminology... Hyperdimensional translation, that is, isn't based solely on the physical location of the star. It has to do with hyperdimensional pathways, like in another universe, involving gravitational interactions and all sorts of shit that's not really germane to the problem at hand. The bottom line is, the shortest distance between two points isn't a straight line when you're going outside our space-time. Systems that are dozens of light-years apart in real space are next-door neighbors in hyperspace. The president smiled, a twinkle coming into his eye. In other words, he said, traveling through hyperspace ain't like dusting crops, boy. I barked a laugh at the quote, which seemed to bring his mood up a little. I like to think he enjoyed having another door kicker in the room to balance out the Space Force tech heads. Pretty much, Mr. President. Oliveira jumped back in. And given what we know, this is the only place the Chinese could have taken the ship. All right, President Crenshaw said, sitting back, steepling his fingers at his chin. I want you launching in twelve hours. I want that damn ship back. Yes, sir, Oliveira said, nodding curtly. We'll get it done. Sir, I said, hating to interrupt, but too pissed off not to. What are we going to do about the Chinese? I hope I'm wrong, but I'm getting the feeling they're going to skate on this, just like they did after Wuhan. My jaw clenched, and I tried to force myself to relax. I lost two grandparents to the virus. They will pay for it, the president assured me. He squirmed a bit, about to use weasel words and hating himself for it, I knew from past dealings with him. But I have to admit, there are problems with confronting them openly. Tommy Caldwell cleared his throat, shrugging an apology whether to me or to God, I wasn't sure. 
If we admit to our allies that we let the Chinese steal a starship, the whole coalition we'd built over the last year could fall apart due to lack of confidence. At a minimum, we'd lose most of Western Europe. Do we need them? I wondered. Garcia winced at the remark, and I think it offended his diplomat sensibilities. Maybe not, Crenshaw admitted. But I'd like to have them anyway. We're putting everyone's lives at risk, Garcia pointed out, spreading his hands. Everyone on the planet. If we don't achieve a consensus, we could justifiably be seen as dictators, using the new technologies we traded for to rule the Earth instead of helping it. Exactly, the president agreed. And while I've always been an advocate for this country, by agreeing to help the Alliance, I've made myself, he shrugged, perhaps arrogated myself, as the other party likes to say, into a representative for the whole planet, for all of humanity. And they didn't vote for me, nor are they likely to have the chance any time soon, so I have to do what I can to keep their trust. By lying to them? I said, cocking an eyebrow. Well, Andy, he said, chuckling, welcome to politics. Speaking of trust, Olivera said, we have another problem. The conference. Oh, sweet Jesus, I moaned, rubbing a hand over the back of my neck. I forgot about that. That was why Garcia's promotion had been pushed through to replace Delia Strawbridge. We were scheduled to meet the other races of the Alliance for the formal vote on our acceptance into the organization in just two weeks. I think. There were some complicated space-time coordinates involved that I didn't understand and never bothered with, but the upshot was we had to be there in two weeks of our time, give or take. Under no circumstances. Garcia said, with a lot more authority and gravitas than I'd heard from him so far. Can we even hint to the Helta or the other races of the Alliance that we have internal divisions, or that any Earth nation is even thinking of dealing with the Tavinians? He speared me with a glare, and I wondered what I'd done to deserve it. None of us. Not officially, not unofficially, not between friends, nothing. If this gets out, even the Helta might not back us which wouldn't just mean we'd lose out on their technical aid and support. It would also mean that the Chinese and the Russians would have an inside road to the only game in town. He chuckled humorlessly. And if any of you have doubts about the United States being in control of the fate of the whole world, consider how much less you'd like it if the Russians and the Chinese were the ones calling the tune. You're very pragmatic for someone from Foggy Bottom. I observed. Thank you, he said, perhaps sarcastic or perhaps mistakenly believing I'd paid him a compliment. One crisis at a time, the president declared with a finality that told everyone the meeting was at an end. Get me back that ship. I hesitated with my finger hovering over the call button on my phone and glanced around the cabin of the V-22 Osprey transport. Oliveira was immersed in some report on his tablet, and Julie was curled up in the seat beside me sleeping. I had earbuds in, so the call should be fairly private, and no one was watching. I touched the screen and waited. It rang for a good ten seconds, and I had started to worry that I was calling at a bad time. Was it a school day? Hell, what month was it? I'd come straight from an interstellar mission. Had two days to prep for the trip to the Ukraine, from there to Caracas, from Caracas to San Antonio, and now back to Idaho, and then orbit. I'd lost track of just about everything. The screen switched from the call display to the face of a teenager, a face very much like my own, though with touches of his mother. Hey, Dad, he said, his eyes lighting up. I didn't think I was going to hear from you. Yeah, I've been kind of busy, I admitted. I'm actually about to head out again, but... I wanted to call before I did, just to see how you were doing. I nodded toward his image on the screen. Got a haircut, huh? It had been shaggy, almost to his shoulders the last time I'd seen him in Austin. Now it was almost regulation. Yeah, he said. A lot of the kids are getting it cut shorter now. He snorted. Mom says it's because of the, and I'm quoting her now, new militarism because of the war with the Divinians. Anyway, Gina likes it. He ran a hand across the short, buzzed sides. Gina, I raised an eyebrow. What happened to Laura? You know how it goes, he shrugged. We decided we weren't having fun, so we broke up. <laughs> you sure it was we who decided? I said, laughing. Okay, he admitted. She decided. But Gina is way cooler. She likes the same games I do, and she even wants to start going to the MMA gym with me. 
She does sound cool, I agreed. Anyway, I just wanted to check in and make sure you were doing okay. How's school? It's fine. I mean, I hate my English teacher. She keeps going on and on about politics in class, and she knows who you are, and she doesn't like your books. I didn't exactly write them for English teachers, but don't let her get to you. You gotta worry about your grade, not whether she likes you or not. If you don't, your mom will make you go to that tutor again, and I know how much she loves spending your afternoons at the library. Yeah, I know. He sighed and rolled his eyes in that way only a teenager can do. I'll be fine. I know you will, son. I love you. Love you too, Dad. Hey, um, I hesitated. This was the part where I could get into serious trouble. Could I talk to Paul real quick? Zack shrugged. Sure, hold on a sec. I think he's out in the backyard. The view on the phone swung around fast enough that I looked away to avoid getting motion sickness. When it finally settled down again, the well-manicured green of Paul Franklin's backyard came into focus, and a conversation between Zack and his stepfather buzzed just out of my hearing. When Paul's distinguished yet rugged face filled the screen, I had to remind myself that Allie and I hadn't been married for several years, and I should not be jealous. Hey there, Andy, Paul said. Sweat beaded his forehead, and he was wearing a baseball cap, which I'd never seen him do before. Just doing some yard work. You do it yourself? I asked, honestly surprised. I figured a place that large, you'd have a landscaping crew come out. Eh, it's relaxing. He pulled off his hat and wiped the back of his arm across his forehead. What's up? I chewed on my lip for a second. I'd thought about asking for Allie, but despite the fact that the two of us had made peace after years of unholy acrimony, I felt like Paul would be more likely to listen to me. Paul, you have a place out in Wyoming, right? Idaho, he corrected me, close to the Wyoming border, Swan Valley, not too far from Jackson Hole. You know, I was thinking it might be a great time for you to take the family and visit Swan Valley. What? His face screwed up in confusion. Why would... Realization hit him between the eyes, followed quickly by an ashen wash of fear. Are you... Are you sure? Was I sure? Damn good question. I'm sure that very soon a lot of people are going to wish they had a vacation house in the middle of nowhere, and a good stock of food and water, and some guns, if you have them, and know how to use them. Shit, he nodded. I know you're probably not supposed to be telling me this, so I won't ask anything else. But thanks. Thanks for letting me know. You're a good man, Paul. And those were some words I never expected myself to say a few years ago, when I first found out Allie had remarried a real estate magnate. Take care of Zach for me, okay? Paul smiled wanly, but I could see the strength in his eyes. I'll take care of him for both of us. I ended the call, then squeezed my eyes shut. They hurt the way they always did when I went too long without sleep. I felt a touch on my shoulder, and they snapped open again. Julie was awake. I wondered for how long, but the expression on her face told me. I know, I said. I shouldn't have. She stopped me with a finger across my lips and a gentle smile. I called my ex three hours ago, she told me. His parents have a place on Kauai. They go in there until I tell them it's okay. I cast a wary glance at Oliveira, but he still seemed totally involved in whatever was on his tablet screen. Are we bad people? I asked her. I mean... Everyone is in danger, not just our families. And we're the ones going out to stop it. She put her hand over mine and squeezed. So, we get to be human. I leaned back into my seat, and she rested her head against my shoulder, and I finally, inexorably, fell asleep. Chapter 5 Do we have to call it HD196761? I asked, watching the main view screen, waiting for it to show me something. I mean, that's the scientific designation, but we call most of these stars and planets by the Helta name. Don't we have one for this star? I could have sat down. The bridge had a couple of seats, engineered to handle the Svalin armor. But I found through experience that I didn't need to. There was a trick to locking the magnetic soles to the deck, letting the hips sway backward just a couple of degrees, and then freezing the lower joints in place and then just leaning back and letting the armor do all the work. I had my helmet off because I knew I'd be wearing it for hours once we jumped into the system, and I wanted to enjoy the recycled shipboard air a while longer before I had to breathe recycled suit air. 
Oliveira glanced back at me from the command station, looking a bit annoyed, though I wasn't sure if it was at the admittedly inane question or because when I stood behind him like this, I seemed to be perpetually looking over his shoulder. If they do, he informed me, they neglected to tell us. I'm sure if you have any suggestions, the Space Force and the Coalition will give them all the consideration they deserve. I laughed softly. He was being prickly, but he knew me well enough by now to realize that would only encourage me. Well, you can't just slap a name on a star without seeing it, I reasoned. That's why most of the time we're using the Helta names, right? Because they've been there? I mean, look at the names we have for stars. The only ones that sound cool are the Latinized Greek ones like Alpha Centauri and Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani. The rest just sound like someone put a random bunch of numbers and letters into a blender. Which was fine when all we were doing was looking at them through radio telescopes. But now we're visiting. You can't just call a place you're about to attack HD 196761. It's got to have some character. Tell you what, Andy, Julie said, her tone lighter. She was more prone to banter than Oliveira. You can have about ten minutes from the time we translate through the wormhole before you have to get down to the shuttles. If you can think up a good name for this place then... I promise I'll call the star that from now on. She wrinkled her nose. Even to the president? Oh, I so want to be there for that, Colonel Danny Brooks said. She was in her armor as well, but she stuck with the modified seats, a stickler for the book like most ranger officers. Her face was hard and angular, her dark hair short and tightly curled, which now that I think about it, it could also have described her personality when I first met her. She'd loosened up a bit as we'd gotten to know each other, though there seemed to be a physical limit on how far a ranger could loosen up. Yeah, how come you got to skip this last meeting? I challenged her. I mean, much as I appreciate somehow being important enough to meet with the president every time there's some threat to the existence of humanity and all, it would be nice if I didn't have to represent the ground pounders and door kickers all by my lonesome. I raised a hand in quick apology. Sorry, I forgot that Colonel Nieves has been officially granted honorary ground pounder slash door kicker status after our last operation. Oh, you can keep that shit all to yourself, Julie told me, not joking this time. There's a reason I'm a pilot, and part of the reason is that I don't want to carry a rifle or get shot at. Her attention was back to the helm readout, and her fingers danced across the controls. Ten seconds till translation. Battle stations. Oliveira intoned, and touched a control on his arm console. A red warning light flashed, and a klaxon sounded, a muted whooping. We don't know what's waiting for us here, he said, his voice carried around the ship by the PA system. Be prepared for a quick micro-jump if we run into enemy cruisers. I used to know the names and backgrounds of every one of the bridge crew, but they'd been switched out three times now with people training for other ships, for their own commands, and I couldn't have told you a thing about any of them except Julie. She told me Oliveira wanted her to accept the position as XO to prepare her to command her own ship, but she'd rejected it out of hand. I'm a pilot, she'd insisted. Not a boat captain. I don't even feel entirely comfortable at the controls of something as big as the Jambo, but at least I'm steering her. As a once-divorced man, I had learned when to keep my mouth shut, but in the privacy of my own head, I had my doubts as to how long she'd be able to get away with that. The military has a way of putting you where they think you're needed, your own feelings in the matter notwithstanding, which was how I had wound up where I was. Translating Jumping in and out of hyperspace was a psychically bruising experience. The eggheads had set up every possible instrument to measure the physical effects of the translation, but hadn't come up with anything they could point to on an instrument. We all knew there was an effect, though, and it wasn't just psychological, despite what the doctors said. It felt as if my consciousness, I was tempted to say my soul, was being stretched between two universes, just about to break before it snapped back to reality. It always felt like I stepped into my brain in media res, not like I'd been unconscious, but more like I'd been too distracted to pay attention for the first couple seconds after the jump. When I did, I heard the tactical officer shouting, Proximity warning! He was a big man, big enough I would have expected him to be wrapped in swollen armor fighting alongside the rangers, but I guess there are no height limits for the Navy. I thought his name was Davis, but I wouldn't have sworn to it without sneaking a look at his uniform name tape. We have four, no, six enemy vessels within one light second. The main screen switched to the tactical display, and we could all see what Davis was looking at. The half-dozen globular shapes burning in at us on flares of harnessed fusion. I didn't need him to tell me what they were. 
The reaction drives showed that immediately. But he announced it anyway because it was in his job description. The not cruisers. They're all conventional in-system short-range defense boats, the kind that Divinians make out of converted Helter freight haulers. I'm not picking up any active warp signatures in the system. If they have any cruisers here, they aren't using them at the moment. The defense boats were probably in lunar orbit when we jumped. About five minutes until they're in range. Of their weapons, I mean. We could destroy all of them right now with the impulse gun. Oliveira didn't respond to that, just touched a control and shoved the tactical display into half of the main view screen, filling the rest with an image of the G-Class star's one habitable planet, which was labeled with the unimaginative and clunky appellation HD19671-2. It was what I'd come to expect from the habitable worlds we'd encountered, not terribly different from Earth at first glance, because if it had been radically different, it likely wouldn't have been habitable. Blues and greens, a smattering of white, strips of brown desert. More land than Earth, I thought, or maybe it was simply that the water was scattered in dozens of inland seas rather than gathered into major oceans. I could make out a single moon, a bit smaller than our own, its shading darker. And I wondered if that meant it had more heavy minerals in it and less silica. All habitable worlds had moons as far as we knew. And if the elders had indeed terraformed most of them, then they'd also provided them with the satellites necessary to maintain an ecosystem. Just the thought of a race of beings advanced enough to haul a moon from one part of a system to another for shits and giggles made me want to wet my pants. With ten light seconds from HD196761-2, Julie supplied. They have weapons platforms in high orbit, Davis cautioned. I think maybe on the surface of that moon, too. Some sort of heavy industry there and a bunch of thermal signatures. That many defense boats, Oliveira murmured, cracking his knuckles in a nervous tick. If they fire in concert, they could overload our shields, which would bring down the drive field. Can't just bowl our way through this one. I think they're attempting to hail us, sir, the communications officer said. Lieutenant something or other, she was short and blonde, and I hadn't said a single word to her since she'd reported for duty, but the way she delivered that announcement made me sure she was a science fiction fan, because there was no way someone who hadn't grown up watching SF TV shows would have used that turn of phrase. Do you want me to put it through to you? Put it on the main screen, Oliveira ordered, sounding more curious than afraid. Me? I was getting a little nervous, and would have been happier if he'd put some distance between us and those enemy ships. True, they weren't shooting yet, but these things tended to jump off without warning. Don't reply yet. Just want to see it. Activating automatic computer translation, the blonde woman said. The screen divided into thirds. The tactile display, the planet, and now a face. It was a woman, the line of her jaw a bit softer than the other Tavinians I'd run into. Her green eyes set close together, red hair parted in the middle and wound into intricate braids. Her mouth was small, and when it moved, no sound came out for a moment, as the computer analyzed her words and vocal patterns, and used them to simulate her speaking to us in English. I am Captain Andraste of the Confederation warship Tip of the Spear. The computer version of her voice was haughty proud, and just a little too puffed up about being the commander of a tiny little in-system gunboat in the middle of nowhere. We are not detecting your transponder. If you are a Tevinian vessel, identify yourself immediately. Of course, they wouldn't be able to tell, Oliveira mused, half to himself, but I could still catch the gist of it. One cruiser pretty much looks like another. He glanced back at me, and a smile spread across his face. I think I might take a page from your book, Major Clanton. He turned back to the communications officer. Lieutenant Adams, run my voice through an auto-translator and send this message, audio only, starting in five, four, three. Oliveira stopped speaking the countdown and folded his fingers, as if he was an old-timey TV cameraman. I am Captain Versen Gederix, he said, of the Confederacy warship Oathkeeper. We were badly damaged in the battle at Helta Prime and have only now made it back to Tavinian space. We are in need of repairs. He slashed his fingers across his throat in a kill signal, and Adams nodded. That means cut the transmission, I told her helpfully. Not that we're dead. It was a test, and Adams passed, laughing to herself as she sent the message. Oh, good God, Julie moaned. And he's found a fellow nerd. That's my favorite movie, Adams remarked. Message sent, sir. Julie. Oliveira said, still smiling. 
on my signal. Be ready to go right through the middle of them at maximum acceleration. If you can pass close enough for the wake of our dry field to take out one or two, even better. Davis, he said to the tech officer, if any of them happen to be in the firing arc of our impulse gun, be prepared to fire. But I want you to target the lead vessel with the particle cannon. Tavinian group commanders lead from the front, so that's where Captain Andraste will be. The second I tell Helm to go, open fire. You copy? Yes, sir. Davis said, sounding eager to get into the fight, which probably meant it was his first. Well, it was the first for a lot of people, and even the old veterans like Oliveira and Julie only had a bare handful of space battles. We'd been lucky so far. Well, luck combined with the fog of war and strategic and tactical surprise. But that wouldn't last forever. I hoped Oliveira was as smart as he thought he was. She's replying, sir, Adams informed him. I have no record of an oathkeeper. Andraste said, the computer simulation of her voice adding the wary skepticism it had detected in the original Tavinian. Nor of a Captain Vercingetorix. Well, damn Tavinian record-keeping, Oliveira said, his smile twisting into a sour frown. Who would have thought the savages would be that efficient about paperwork? He motioned at Adams. Send this. This vessel was recently seized from the Helta shipyards and repurposed for the needs of the Confederacy. I had the honor of a field promotion when my own commander died a glorious death in battle. I snorted a laugh I couldn't quite hold in. Yeah, that sounds like a Divinian, I agreed. I studied the interrogation tapes from the prisoner, he told me. Know your enemy and all that. The reply was a long time coming. And while they weren't currently shooting at us, I began to wonder if the delay was worth it, if it gave them more time to ready their defenses. But finally... Oathkeeper. Heave to and prepare to receive a shuttle from my ship. If they confirm you are who you say you are, we will guide you to lunar orbit and assist you in making repairs. Sir, Davis exclaimed, almost stepping on the end of Andraste's words. I just picked up our ship. She's in lunar orbit, powered way down. Barely any reactor signature at all. No drive readings. Out of fuel, he surmised. And they haven't converted her into one of theirs yet. So maybe there's a reason for that. He nodded to Adams. Last message. Captain Andraste, we will comply with your order. Send your shuttle, now. He indicated the end of the message with a wave of his hand. Send it. Julie, Davis. He waited a few seconds until it was clear Adams had sent the signal. Now. What happened next was hard to follow, even with the screen back to just two views, one for tactical, one for helm. When you can accelerate at close to a hundred gravities, well, let's just say the Jambo would have broken the quarter-mile record at most drag strips. We went from about as close to motionless as you can get while under the gravitational influence of assorted celestial bodies to zooming right into the midst of the enemy ships in seconds. Captain Andraste seemed like a woman who was on the ball, who would have figured out what was going on really fast and given orders to counter it. Unfortunately for her, the Jambo happened to have the bow pointed directly at her, and that gave her the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be on the receiving end of a tungsten slug the size of a Volkswagen Beetle traveling at low relativistic velocities. The point of the spear disappeared in a supernova flare of liberated kinetic energy, almost whiting out the pale blue glow of the particle cannon seeking the next closest spherical ship. The show wasn't quite as dramatic, but the globe of white light blossoming off the port side of the ship couldn't have done them any good. Lasers began to target us, and warning klaxons sounded as the drive field began to attenuate under the influx of energy. But Oliveira remained stolid and stone-faced in his captain's chair. Either he was just as cool and commanding as naval commanders of old, or he was determined to pretend he was, so as not to give satisfaction to those who wished the Navy had been given command of the Jambo instead of the Space Force. Which I didn't care about, but I sure as hell thought we should have gone with the Space Marines instead of the damned Space Rangers. We passed within about a hundred clicks of another ship, and gravimetric tidal forces from our drive field ripped strips of armor hundreds of meters long off their hull, jets of flame shooting out where the atmosphere escaped and caught fire. A shudder went through the ship, and I knew from unfortunate experience that it was our drive field losing power from the battering of a very powerful energy weapon. We're taking long-range fire from their Luna base, Davis warned. Micro-jump, Julie. Oliveira ordered. Get me to the other side of their moon. 
Oh, damn, I hated micro jumps. Jump in now, Julie announced. Hold on to your lunch. That was the hard part, because the psychic slingshot feeling of the jump came not once, but twice in the space of a couple seconds. And the whole bridge, the whole universe, seemed to shimmer and haze over. And I couldn't make out what was on the screens, if there was anything on the screens. Someone's voice was buzzing in my ear, and I wondered how they'd recovered so much faster than I had. Didn't seem fair. We're still being targeted by the Luna Defense Laser. Davis. That was Davis. I knew it even if I couldn't quite focus on him, because he'd be the one making the pronouncement. Helm, give control to... tactical... Oliveira's voice was slurred, which made me feel better. At least someone else was having as bad a time as I was. Let's see what the impulse gun can do about that laser battery. Tactical, you have the con, Julie said. I laughed. That was a Navy thing. But Julie was former Navy and was doing everything she could to bring nautical terminology into the lexicon of starship commands because, as she so eloquently put it, fuck the Air Force. My vision cleared as Davis acknowledged the switchover. Tactical has the con. The view on the screen was radically different than it had been just a few moments ago. The planet and its moon were unbelievably close. The sensor dots of the remaining defense boats distant and invisible on the optical scopes, and the entire screen was shaking, vibrating in tune with the superstructure of the ship, which meant the drive field was taking way too much energy and was about to destabilize. The view drifted slightly to port, and a glowing red reticle came to rest over the computer outline of a Tavinian military station on the surface of the moon. Firing! The ship shuddered again, and in the time that it took me to blink, the lunar base was gone. I couldn't really see the facility, not from orbit, but I saw the plume of burning gas and dust rising up kilometers above it, like the puff of a bullet hitting the dirt 400 yards away. The target has been serviced, Davis said, in his finest Air Force bullshit euphemism, as if throwing it in Julie's face for trying to make the Space Force like her Navy. Take us into a matching orbit with our starship, Julie, Oliveira ordered. Major Clanton, Colonel Brooks, I believe you're up. Get us back our ship. Chapter 6 Everyone strapped in? Captain Lee asked, craning his neck back from the cockpit. Are we a go for launch? I did one final visual go over of the Delta team and got a thumbs up from Pops. Security team is a go, I told him. Rangers are a go! Lieutenant Landry was trying to be extra enthusiastic to make up for what he considered the horrible personal failure of being nervous before his first mission leading the Ranger platoon. At least that was my take on it. His platoon was backing us up, and we had another platoon of rangers on standby in the bird, carrying the load of reactor fuel. But most of this mission was going to be on us. Gunfighter 1 is a go, Jambo, Lee said. Launching now. Leaving the ship's hangar bay always reminded me of the only time I had launched into space the old-fashioned way, aboard what they used to call the disintegrating totem pole, that is, on the end of a rocket. Of course, that description wasn't quite accurate for Daniel Gatlin's single stage-to-orbit system, since his rockets didn't disintegrate, and in fact, landed intact for reuse. But it was a cool turn of phrase, and the rule of cool trumps all else when you're a science fiction writer. But the similarities were numerous. On the ship, we had the semblance of Earth-normal gravity thanks to the graph plates, and the absence of the discomfort of acceleration because our drives weren't controlled by Newton's laws. Leaving the jambo meant reverting to old-fashioned throw-shit-out-the-back-to-make-you-go-forward physics, and abandoning gravity control for the wonderful feeling of God grinding you under his heel for daring to boost at six gravities. Trying to distract myself from the heavy boost, I wondered what Gatlin was doing now. I used to see him at briefings in the president's own version of the Western White House, or sometimes in the real one, but then it had changed to teleconferencing, and lately... I hadn't seen him or talked to him at all. Oliveira assured me that Daniel Gatlin was hip deep in building the planet a real space transportation system. Not just a few military shuttles, not just the slapped together heavy cargo lifters we'd been using to build our military fleet, but enough cargo and passenger birds to turn us into a real spacefaring civilization. It had been his dream, and I knew from interviews I'd seen online that he'd never expected to see it in his lifetime. Now, not only would he realize his dream within a few years, but his lifetime was going to be a lot longer than he'd thought. Mine, too. 
Unless I wound up getting killed gallivanting around other star systems, inviting aliens to shoot at me. We taking any fire from the ship? I squeezed the words out past the pressure from the boost on my chest, trying to force my eyes to focus on the targeting display on the main screen. Lee dialed back the acceleration with a flick of his fingers, and the elephant crawled off my chest, leaving me breathing easier at near a single standard gravity. With the boost pressure gone, I could see the display clearly. The ship, and God knows the president was right, we needed to call her something else because that was getting old, hung silent and motionless on the cockpit display. But she was outfitted with coil guns as point defense turrets, and the shuttle's radar and lidar might not pick up slugs from those until it was too late. Nothing yet, Lieutenant Habib told me from the gunner's position. I don't think they have the juice to shoot at us. Yeah, Captain Lee agreed. According to the mission brief, they're probably burning fumes in the reactor. Should barely have enough to run life support and the grav plates. Thank God for government efficiency for once, Pops commented, hands and attention on his KE rifle, running a last-minute functions check. It would have made all the sense in the world just to fill the fuel tanks up to the top and not have to worry about it again for a few months. It's not like metallic hydrogen fuel pellets go bad or something. But some fucking bureaucrat decided that since the ship only had to make a test run out to Alpha Centauri and back, well, by God, that's how much fuel we're going to allocate her. Nobody tell them that, okay? Corporal Quinn said from the row of seats behind the Delta team. I hate for the Pentagon bean counters to get the idea they're actually useful. A round of chuckles came from the Delta team, which wasn't the norm. They'd accepted the Rangers as fellow professionals, but they didn't generally bullshit with them. But Quinn and a few others had sort of been accepted as honorary members of the team, since they were always sharing a shuttle with us. Not Lieutenant Landry, at least not yet, but there was always hope. They don't have any shuttles, I said, or at least they didn't when they left, which means the only opposition we're going to face is inside the ship. As long as the Jambo can keep the enemy ships off our back, Lee reminded me. Captain. Habib warned. I'm picking up a squadron of fighters in the planet's atmosphere. If they're dual environment, they'll be hitting orbit in a couple minutes. Lee regarded him with a sort of scowl, one of my D.I.s from boot camp reserve for a boot who'd said something particularly stupid. How much reaction mass do you think those things carry, Habib? He asked. They're like half our size, and we're on their fucking moon. Even assuming they could keep a 1G boost going the whole time, which they can't without going bingo fuel halfway here, it would take them like three hours to reach lunar orbit. I'm pretty confident we'll be gone by then. But I'll warn the cargo boat just in case. Sorry, Habib said, turning a bit red. I didn't think about how far it was. It's okay. You're a gunner, Lee consoled him. I wouldn't expect you to be a space pilot just yet. Space pilot, I murmured, shaking my head. Jesus Christ, it's like we're living in a 1950s movie serial. Lee, are those codes still working? We were close now. The aft end of the Coalition starship, Horse With No Name, as I was unofficially christening her, swelling in our screen, the hangar bay yawning dark and empty and airless ahead of us. They hadn't had the power to maintain the field to hold in the air, and none of them were bright enough to close the emergency bay doors. So they just turned off the lights and shut the vacuum seals on the internal locks and hoped for the best. Which was a very Russian thing for the Chinese to do. Which also meant, I hoped, that none of them had been forward-thinking enough to change the security codes since they'd arrived. We're about to find out, he said. Brace for high G deceleration. The shuttle spun end for end, and I closed my eyes, knowing what was coming. They say that nine Gs is the max the average pilot can take without blacking out. But even getting close to that mark without losing consciousness requires either a special suit that squeezes the blood from your extremities back to your brain, or special training to tighten your core muscles in just the right way and at just the right time. I had neither of those, and if we'd even hit eight Gs for any length of time, I would have passed out. I didn't, though I did begin to experience tunnel vision and hazy thinking. So, I assumed we were breaking at just under my limit, but it seemed to go on for hours. When it cut off, the cessation of pressure was so abrupt, I nearly decorated the inside of my helmet. But I was distracted by the violent thump of the landing gear smacking against the hangar bay deck plates. Gravity still works, Lee observed. Now let's see if the security codes do.
He tapped a virtual keypad, and the hangar bay lights flashed on, followed closely by a vibration up through the landing gear. Not a noise, because there was no air to conduct it, but the unmistakable grinding of metal on metal. We landed nose out in the hangar bay, and the view from the forward cameras showed the curtain-like hangar bay doors sliding shut, unfolding like an accordion from one side to the other until the grinding ended with a solid thump, and they were sealed. Repressurizing the bay now, he said, his fingers stroking a set of controls. All right, I said, unstrapping from my acceleration couch and rolling out to face the rest of the armored troops on board. Everybody up, just like we rehearsed. Pops, you take the security team engineering. Secure it until the flight crew comes in with the fuel boat. Rangers, you're with me, and we're heading for the bridge. Which was mostly because I didn't want a bunch of rangers shooting up the engine room. There was some fragile stuff in there, and we needed it to work if we were going to sail this ship out of here. If you encounter any hostiles on the way to your objective, do your best to take them prisoner, but not at the risk of the mission. Number one priority is getting this ship back. Got me? hoo sir! Fucking army. Pressure is equalized, Lee told me. You're clear to open the belly ramp. Quinn was already at the control, and at my signal, he slapped the green button, and the ramp began to lower. The light in the hangar bay was ghastly white, reflected back by the mirror polish of the emergency doors, turning the whole compartment into a scene from a horror movie, ready for some faceless alien demon to come massacre us one at a time. Luckily, I was in a science fiction movie instead, or close enough to one that I was constantly having to pinch myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming. The emergency vacuum hatches had rumbled into the overhead once the bay had repressurized and the two entrances to the bay, one for cargo and one for personnel, were both open and empty. If there was anyone left on this ship, they either didn't know we were here, or they weren't too eager to meet us. Be careful, Andy, Pops told me, leading the Delta team through the cargo entrance to the ramp leading to engineering. Don't let them rangers lead you into anything too stupid. I'm a Marine, Pops, I reassured him. They'll be following me. It was a joke, of course. I let Quinn and his fire team go first hanging with Lieutenant Landry just behind them. Because, as Pops had told me over and over, after the raid on the Chernabog headquarters, I was an officer, and I had to trust the grunts to be grunts. It still felt wrong. The suit nagged at me like a familiar spirit wanting to fight, wanting to be on point. I wondered if everyone who wore the Svalin armor felt the same way, or if I was just a special brand of crazy. This place smells like a new car, Quinn quipped softly from up front. I didn't smell anything through the helmet filters, but I took his meaning. Even the Jambo had a lived-in feel to it by now. A slightly grimy patina that softened her edges and made it clear she was a working ship with a full crew. A horse with no name felt like one of those model houses developers put on display in the new subdivisions popping up like cancers everywhere around Las Vegas. Everything was too bright, too clean, and you knew no one had ever called this ship home. By the time we reached the crew quarters, I was about convinced the entire human crew, Russian mercenaries, Chinese flight crew, and diplomatic staff had been taken off her, and the Divinians had left the ship to drift. That was, of course, almost the very second when some idiot took a shot at us. Contact left, Quinn shouted from about a dozen meters ahead of me, right at a T-junction in the living quarters. He must have caught a warning on thermal because I didn't see anything. One second, we were shuffling along. The next, heavy machine gun rounds were smacking into the bulkhead to my right and into the rangers. Fuck! I'm hit! That particularly helpful bit of knowledge came from Lieutenant Landry, and I caught a glimpse of him slamming to the floor beside me, but I couldn't spare the time to check on him just yet. There are two ways to react when you're ambushed. You can either seek the nearest cover, or you can assault through. Everyone in Corporal Quinn's fire team did the right thing in the face of the ambush. Unfortunately, two of them did one right thing, and two did the other. I didn't blame him for their reaction. It wasn't as if he'd had time to give orders while half a dozen enemy soldiers were firing at him, and the two who had run for cover had been right next to the open hatch of a cabin, while Quinn and the ranger beside him had been closest to the ambush. I was not paid, as Pops kept telling me, to be a bullet sponge, but certain instincts were too hard to fight. I charged into the teeth of the ambush and counted on my armor to keep me alive. It almost didn't. 
My helmet HUD was telling me the story, and I was absorbing it more on a subconscious level than actually thinking about it. Like, I'd known all along that the enemy was half a dozen Chernobog mercenaries, dressed in their half-assed version of Svalin armor, each carrying a chopped-down 12.7mm cord machine gun. They were firing from two different positions, one straight ahead in the galley, the other to the right in one of the cabins. Quinn and the other ranger had gone for the cabin, firing their K.E. rifles on full auto, probably thinking, as much as they had time to think at all, that they could take out the enemy and have the benefit of cover inside the cabin. I let them do their thing, while I went after the three mercenaries straight ahead, in a small galley between the berthing sections. The machine guns thundered, the reports echoing off the bulkheads, distorted into the demonic growl of some mythical dragon, their muzzle flashes throwing elongated shadows across the passageway. It was inevitable I was going to get hit, and I did. The chest armor on the Svalin was a combination of the best human and Helta materials technology and damned thick, thick enough to take a point-blank shot from a .50 Browning machine gun round, and the 12.7 millimeter was basically the Soviet-era ripoff of the .50 BMG. So I knew I'd survive the hit, and I didn't stumble even though it hurt like a son of a bitch. Forget everything you've seen in movies. You don't go flying when a bullet hits you, even a bullet as big as the 12.7 millimeter. Because if a bullet had enough kinetic energy to knock the person shot with it off their feet, it would also knock the one shooting it off their feet. When people fall backwards after they've been shot, it's either because they were already off balance or because of their psychological reaction to the pain of being shot. And it does hurt. It hurts a lot, even with body armor. But I was ready for it and running on a spike of adrenaline. I ignored the sledgehammer blows to my chest and my right thigh and left hip and just jammed down the trigger of my KE gun, spraying all three of them on full auto. As combat tactics went, it wasn't something I was particularly proud of, and the best thing to do would have been to break contact and pull back, but we were pressed for time. If we let the Russians hold us off at this junction, it might have taken an hour to work around them outside the ship. And we didn't know there weren't cruisers in the area. I guess, deep down, I accepted the idea that I was expendable and this ship was not. And I don't know if I like what that says about me. I would have asked the Russian mercenaries about my existential crisis, but they were having one of their own. As in, they didn't exist anymore. Well, two of them didn't. They'd been up front, and they'd taken the brunt of the 30 rounds I'd fired. I hadn't counted them, but the display in the corner of my helmet visor had. Even set at the lower velocity for full auto, the tungsten penetrators had worked as advertised, chopping through armor that, while just as thick as my own, was made from strictly earthly materials and couldn't hold up to repeated hits at that rate of fire. One of them had collapsed onto his chest, his hands stretched out still gripping the drum-fed heavy machine gun as if he were going to try to kill me from beyond the grave. The other had been propped up against the bulkhead and was still standing there, the joints of his armor locked, and I might have shot him again just to make sure, but the Russian's faceplate had been shattered and there wasn't much left of his face. The last of the three was down, writhing on the floor, his right arm clutched across his chest. The armor peeled away like he'd been hit with a can opener, blood coating the mangled remains. His machine gun was still attached to his armor by a motorized gimbal, but he was making no attempt to use it, paralyzed with agony. I felt bad for him, but not too bad because he'd shot me. I stomped down on the gimbal at the joint and broke it off his armor, then kicked the machine gun away from him. The gunfire had slacked off behind me, and I risked a glance back over my shoulder. The other two Russian mercenaries were sprawled on the floor, the awkwardness of their poses telling me they hadn't ever made the case to their armor designers that the suits needed to be able to fire from the prone. Quinn was emerging from the cabin, with the other ranger limping behind him. The armor over his leg splintered and cracked from the impact of the 12.7 millimeter rounds. His pain reminded me of my own, and it washed over me as if it was Tinkerbell, and all it needed to manifest itself was my belief in it. I clenched my teeth and tried to keep my thoughts straight. Any casualties? I asked. The wounded Russian finally began to gather his wits and tried to roll to his feet, the motion catching my eye. I scowled at him and stamped on his left knee, feeling the servo motors in the joint crumple under my weight. It must not have done his knee any good either, because he rolled to his side, his one good hand going from his wounded arm to his busted knee, as if he couldn't make up his mind which hurt worse. I'm hit, Landry said. Oh, yeah. 
He had said that, hadn't he? The rest of the contingent had caught up with us, and I waved the first squad leader over, pointing at the wounded enemy. McAfee, keep an eye on him. I found Landry lying on the deck, back where we started taking fire, his left leg stretched out in front of him, the top of his boot ripped open. I got shot in the foot, sir, he confessed, his voice tight. Damn it. I thought these boots were armored. They are, I told him, leaning down for a look. But the plate has to be flexible to let the foot move naturally, otherwise you couldn't run in it. And you just got that million-dollar wound right at the joint. I chuckled, shaking my head. Sorry, man. I know that's gotta hurt. It's starting to get better, he said. I had the armor inject me with a painkiller. Great. That meant he'd be loopy in about thirty seconds and useless. Sergeant Kim, I called. The IFF told me the platoon sergeant was making her way up from the rear where she'd been riding drag on our formation, way too far back to get any licks in during the gunfight. Lieutenant Landry is wounded and immobile. We also have a wounded prisoner. Detail a fire team to stay here with them, while you lead the rest of the platoon to the bridge. Yes, sir, she said, switched frequencies to talk to her people. I followed the hop and listened in, not because I didn't trust her to do her job, but because I was always on the lookout for people who were especially competent like Quinn so I knew who I could count on for the really difficult operations. McAfee, she said, obviously noting that the junior NCO was already standing by the prisoner, covering him with his KE rifle. Leave your Bravo team back here to keep an eye on the prisoner and take care of Lieutenant Landry, then fall in behind the rest of us. Quinn, move out. We're burning minutes here, boys and girls. Keep your thermal and sonic sensors scanning and make sure there aren't any more of these Russian knockoffs trying to sucker us. I like that. Quick and efficient, and not hesitating to step into the leadership role. And the crack about Russian knockoffs had been impressive. It wasn't easy to joke on the fly, and I admitted it freely, as someone who was much better at writing such things long after the fact to make myself look funnier than I was. Yes, Sergeant, Quinn said, sounding fresh and eager, much like someone who hadn't been shot multiple times. I sighed and resisted the urge to dose myself with painkillers, following Quinn's fire team. There were no more nasty little ambushes, for which I gave thanks to whoever might be listening. Not that I wasn't still an adrenaline junkie, as much as I was loath to admit it even to myself, but I was spending way too much time on our march through the passageways wondering exactly how many hits from a 12.7 millimeter my chest plates could take before it surrendered, and decided to let my flimsy flesh and blood deal with the problem. The bridge was sealed, but that was no surprise. The only surprise was the idea that whoever had sealed themselves in thought we wouldn't have the codes to open the blast shield. Kim, I said from the security terminal by the side of the blast shield, trying to decide which leg to limp on, with one hip and the other thigh badly bruised. I'm going to put in the override code. Get your people stacked for a dynamic entry. She had them ready in seconds, because if there was anything rangers lived for, it was dynamic entry. They stacked like something out of a textbook. If that textbook had been written by me, which it was, and included powered armor and spaceships. One fire team on either side of the hatch, the rest out of the line of fire and lined up to rush in and overpower any forces on the other side. The security panel had an input jack, something the Helta ships did not, because we humans like plugs and other physical connections and other ridiculously redundant and outmoded systems. I had to admit, there was something reassuring about plugging in the master key, which was what the ship designers had called the thumb drive with the security override app written into it. A red light flashed across the display screen, followed by a complicated Space Force way of saying the code was being processed, and then a green line and the blast shield began sliding back into the overhead. The rangers at the front ducked under the seal when it reached a meter off the deck, and I could hear yelling over the external speakers, one voice stepping on another, but the gist of it being multiple commands telling someone to get on their knees and put their hands behind their head. I didn't wait for the rest of the force to storm the bridge because it clearly wasn't necessary. Two fire teams worth of rangers were clustered around a single figure, a tall, bearded man in utility fatigues with the same one-generation-old camo pattern as the rest of the Chernabog mercenaries. His eyes were wide, his face pale, and a handgun was at his feet, newly dropped. "'Don't kill me!' he said in heavily accented English. "'I surrender! Throw me in jail if you want, but someone get me away from these fucking fanatics!' Quinn and another member of his fire team moved in and pushed the Russian to the deck, 
securing his wrists and ankles with zip ties. I flipped up my visor and knelt down beside him. Who are you? I asked. Gennady Kasparov, he said, voice strained at the pressure from Quinn's hand on his back. Major Gennady Kasparov, he said. With Chernobog? I nodded toward the markings on his sleeve, the Chernobog crest there. No, the answer was sullen, the set of his face resentful. I mean, that was my cover, but I'm GRU. I was sent to keep an eye on things, you know, make sure the Chinese didn't do anything stupid. So what happened? The fucking Chinese did something stupid, he said, goggling at me like I should have already known. They were supposed to tell the Tavinians we wanted to negotiate an alliance, make them come to us. Instead, they got on one of their starships and just took off and left me here with those Chernobog madmen. The ship barely had enough fuel to keep us alive for another week, and those idiots were worried about you taking us prisoner. He shook his head. Get me out of here and get me back to Earth, and I swear to God, I will tell you anything you want to know. Chapter 7 Where do we think they went? I'd asked the question to no one in particular, not expecting an answer, not even looking up from my plate in anticipation of one. Not that shipboard food was much to look at, maybe a half step up from freeze-dried camping food. We did have freezers, so it was theoretically possible for us to have something better than the beef stroganoff that was on the dinner menu tonight. But no one seemed to have given much thought to the food. Once we'd found out we'd have gravity so regular, military shit food would do fine. I swore to myself there and then, the next time we went out, I was going to smuggle a few packages of T-bones and some Idaho potatoes aboard and slip the galley crew a few bucks to cook it up for me. No, I'll bribe them to let me cook it myself. Those bastards would probably microwave everything. The Hiltas say... The Tavinian capital is five jumps down the line from HD-196761, General Oliveira answered, then shrugged. He hadn't touched his food in five minutes and seemed disinterested in it, but too apathetic to take the tray back to the recycler. But that's just a guess. They could have taken the Chinese to one of their military outposts, or hell, anywhere with a hyperspace transceiver. Not just the Chinese, Danny Brooks reminded him and me. Our new friend Gennady said they took half a dozen of the Chernobog mercenaries, too. Why is that significant? Julie asked. She was not a picky eater, and was scooping up the last of her dinner with gusto, seated close enough to me that her right shoulder brushed my left teasingly with each motion. We were sitting at what was jokingly referred to as the command table in the ship's galley, and I'd caught more than one junior officer staring at us when he thought we weren't looking probably wondering what earth-shaking policy discussions were going on away from the peons. Their armor, I replied, taking another desultory bite. At her curious look, I went on. The Tavinians aren't innovators. Their society wasn't built for it, and they didn't have the Black Plague, the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, and all that other good stuff that gave us atom bombs and flights to the moon. Everything they're using in their conquest, they stole or adapted from the Helta. It's been the one advantage we've had over them, Brooks agreed. They've got the numbers, they've got an absolutely psychotic willingness to throw their lives away, but they don't have anything in the way of modern military tactics, and the only time we've seen them do anything novel with the technology they've been given is turning cargo haulers into fighter carriers. So, I suppose it's not fair to say they don't have any tactical imagination, but they wouldn't even think to do something like the impulse gun using Helta technology to do something it wasn't designed for. But if they see that fucking armor... I took the thread back up after a sip of Diet Coke. I brought my own supply on board every mission. That's all it'll take for them to understand the advantage it could give them. And if they can't copy it themselves, they'll use the Helta engineers they've taken as slaves and have them do it. Or they'll get the Russians to help them. I sighed. The longer this thing drags on, the tougher they're going to be. I was really hoping the Battle of Helta Prime might have attrited their forces enough that we wouldn't have to deal with them for a while. The Battle of Helta Prime? Julie repeated, cocking an eyebrow in amusement. You made that up just now, didn't you? Hey, we gotta call it something, I protested, shrugging. What's your suggestion? I'm not the writer, she reminded me, leaning into my shoulder, harder. But that sounds like something from your TV show. Oh, good God, I moaned. Don't remind me. I'd almost managed to forget that thing existed. I bet you don't forget when the mortgage comes due on that house in Vegas, Hollywood boy. 
That house in Vegas doesn't have a mortgage, I said, leaning back on her, for which I am very grateful, but I just hate thinking about the way they trash the science in my science fiction. Oh, you mean they added ridiculous things like artificial gravity and hyperspace? Touché, I acknowledged. Then I looked up and realized that Oliveira and Brooks were staring at us with expressions that might have been amused or annoyed or both. Not to interrupt, Oliveira said, his tone dry enough to use for kindling. But I'd like to have some idea of what I'm going to tell the president when we arrive in system in... He checked his watch. Shit, in an hour. Tell him we did the best we could. Got him back his starship, I suggested. And we were damned lucky to do that without getting anyone killed. I rubbed at the remembered pain in my chest, very grateful for the medical technology the Helta had shared with us. And that part was pretty damn close. Yes, I heard, Brooks rumbled, leaning back in her chair and giving me the stink eye. You do know you're a major now, right, major? You have privates and corporals to do this sort of thing for you. You shouldn't be charging into Russian mercenaries and leading with your chin. That Svalin armor doesn't come with a big red S on its chest the last I checked. Yes, ma'am, I replied, grinning. I had heard it all from Pops right after he'd come back from engineering to check on us. Engineering had been a dry hole because no one had bothered to stake it out. There wasn't enough fuel left to sail the ship, so the Russians hadn't seen the point. It had all been a bit anticlimactic after that, just a matter of getting the fuel loaded onto the ship and the flight crew in place while Oliveira and the Jambo held off the defense boats. We'd all been back in hyperspace within an hour, and then it was just a matter of hopping out briefly to check the horse with no names systems, and back in again, with no stops till home. What can we tell him? Julie asked. This wasn't our fuck-up. If they hadn't wanted to keep the Tavinian around as a dog and pony show for Congress and the coalition partners, we could have handed him off to the Helta and been done with him. Now, not only do they know where we are and who we are, they know where our weak spots are. Maybe we're worrying for nothing, Brooks said, pointing with her fork for emphasis. I mean, it's not like the Tavinians are artists at political manipulation. Worst case scenario, they copy the armor and they come to the solar system. But they were hit hard at Helta Prime, like you said. If we can get the Alliance behind us, get a few ships to help us out, I think we can take them. Easy. As for the Chinese and the Russians, well, we got the ship back, and they don't have a shitload of assets to throw at us. I mean, once they see we got the ship back, and their plan didn't work, wouldn't they want to keep this quiet as much as we do? If they admit what they did, it might weaken us, but it'll sure as hell make people pissed off at them. She punctuated her last remark by eating the last bite of beef stroganoff on her plate. As long as no one starts flapping their gums, I think we'll be okay. Oh, I think I might have been too optimistic, Danny Brooks admitted, staring at the news broadcast displayed on the main screen of the Jambo. Everything had seemed fine when we jumped out into cislunar space. The horse with no name had popped out right behind us, which had been a great relief to Oliveira because he'd still been keyed up about the possibility that the Tavinians or the Chinese had left some sort of Trojan horse virus or undetectable sabotage on board the ship that would blow up in our faces when the crew took her into hyperspace. Then the first transmissions from Earth hit us like a big splash of muddy water in the face. I questioned Oliveira's decision to put them on the main screen, but he was the commander, and I guess he trusted the crew not to panic. I knew the CNN talking head personally, having had the misfortune to be in the same studio when I'd done an interview about the United Stars TV series. He was five foot four and 150 pounds of ego, in an expensive suit and a more expensive haircut, and just seeing him put me in a bad mood. His big puffy face and goatee floated beside video of a demonstration. At first, I couldn't even tell where it was. There was just a sea of humanity. Then the camera zoomed out, showing the Washington Monument and the reflecting pool in the background, and I whistled softly. I hadn't seen a crowd that big in D.C. for quite a while. The demonstrations have been almost continuous since the news leaked three days ago, Jeff Weitzer, the talking head, reported. While criticism of President Crenshaw's handling of this matter has been harsh among congressional Democrats, and there's been talk of impeachment hearings, there is no mistaking the mood of the demonstrations. The people in these crowds place the blame squarely on China. They did the predictable thing, a thing most people were wise to now, but they still did it. They picked the most inflammatory member of the crowd they can find, the biggest dumbass at the demonstration, a fat-bellied redneck with an American flag cape 
and a sign that read, The only G-O-O-D-E commie is a D-E-D commie, put him on camera and urged him to say the first thing that came to his little head. Them Chinese need to be nuked from orbit, he declared, wild-eyed. It's the only way to be sure. It's not a bad line, Adams murmured. I love that movie. I didn't quite laugh, just sort of grunted involuntarily. If I hadn't been head over heels in love with Julie, I would have asked Lieutenant Adams to marry me. Wiener, I mean, Weitzer, reappeared in place of Captain Redneck, general disapproval on his pinched face, unless it was constipation. The mood across the nation is shock, disbelief, and above all else, anger. Anger at the president for the lax security that allowed this to happen. Anger at the military. But most of all, anger at China and Russia for hijacking one of four starships controlled by President Crenshaw's coalition of nations and taking it, it is believed, to try to negotiate a deal with the Tavinians. An artist's conception of a Tavinian popped on screen, looking more than anything like the drummer in a Swedish death metal band. These, the human-like species who our new allies the Helta claim are the aggressors in the decades-old war, have become our enemy as well as theirs. But some believe we are on the wrong side in this war, that the Crenshaw administration has committed us to an unjust war against an oppressed people who are merely fighting for their right to equal footing with a colonial power bent on exploiting them. Oh, Judas priest on a bogo stick, Olivera said. I really hate that little prick. Join the club. I told him. It's large, but distinguished. Weitzer's face pinched even more, and I thought for a moment that his head was about to collapse into a black hole. And while there has been talk of impeachment here at home, among the other nations of President Crenshaw's coalition, there is unease and discontent. Some officials, speaking on condition of anonymity, have heard rumblings that their governments might withdraw from the coalition unless there is more accountability while others blame this on the Polish government for allowing Russian mercenaries to infiltrate their technical crews, assigned to work at the dry docks in lunar orbit. Anonymous sources are so helpful, Brooks said. My anonymous sources say that CNN has the best anonymous sources. I eyed her sidelong. That was almost funny, and I wondered if I was a bad influence on the colonel. But more worrisome, Weitzer said, are the calls for open war against China such as this statement on the House floor by Congressman James Ewell of Arkansas. Ewell was a big man, with the ruddy, weathered face of a lumberjack past his prime and the voice of a drive-time DJ from the 1990s. What good are all these high-tech toys the Helta gave us if we can't use them to defend ourselves from aggression right here on Earth? They'd caught Ewell in media res, and I wondered what the unedited quote would sound like when I listened to it. China should be held responsible for this act of war. The talking head reappeared, as if Weitzer couldn't bear for his own likeness to be off-screen very long. Thankfully, he seemed to be wrapping up the report. So far, the Crenshaw administration has not commented on the congressman's statement, nor have they made any public statements about their intentions in regard to China's actions. Chairman Zhang, meanwhile, has denied any involvement in the hijacking of the starship and continues to insist this is all subterfuge to justify American aggression against their peaceful country. President Popov of Russia has gone on record as saying that if any Russian citizens were involved, they were acting of their own accord and had no affiliation with the Federation military. Sir, Lieutenant Adams said, sudden urgency in her voice. We have a priority transmission from the White House. We also have a shuttle break in orbit, David said, leaning forward as if he could see the holographic display better from a few inches closer. One of ours? Adams asked, looking alarmed. As far as I know, Lieutenant Adams... Oliveira told her. We're the only people making them. His face clouded over. Then he nodded, as if to himself. Put the president on the main screen. Shit, that was ballsy. If it was a sensitive transmission, Crenshaw might not want it out in the open for the whole bridge crew. Still, he hadn't said it was sensitive, just priority. The face that appeared on the screen wasn't Crenshaw's, though. It was Tommy Caldwell's, and he didn't look happy. General Oliveira, he said. As you might have noticed, things are a bit hectic here. There's been a leak, which, of course, there's been a leak. He shook his head and closed his eyes for a beat before continuing. It's D.C. Once we informed the House Intelligence Committee, it was almost a given there would be a leak. The president is up to his eyeballs and shit and doesn't need the James Bowie stirring the mixture. The shuttle heading your way is carrying Assistant Secretary of State Garcia, among others. Transfer your prisoners to the shuttle, then the president wants you to head directly for the conference with the Alliance. 
He raised a hand to forestall any objection that might be coming. I know it's not fair to your crew, particularly the ground troops. You just returned from high-risk combat, had to come back and deal with Chernobog, and then go right back out to retrieve the ship. But the President would rather none of you are ambushed by the press while visiting your loved ones. And God willing, once we get the official vote and Earth's place in the Alliance is cemented, this will all quiet down. Are you certain this is a good time for the Jambo to be light years away, sir? Oliveira wondered. Besides the security station dirt side, well, we know that the Vinians took the Chinese somewhere. And according to the GRU officer we captured, the Chinese diplomats were singing like little stool pigeons. This is too valuable an opportunity for us to waste, Caldwell insisted. We're going to rush the fitting of weapons to the ship you retrieved. Between the ship and the defense platforms the Helta helped us build, we'll have at least some protection from a possible attack. The Tavidians know where we are, I said, and Caldwell's eyes flickered my way. So did Oliveira's, but I went on anyway, because someone had to say it and Caldwell had to hear it. An attack isn't just possible. Sure as shit, it's going to happen. Chapter 8 The Werewolf of London. That's what the Scrith reminded me of. Pardon me, the translator said in my ear, moments after the guttural sounds of Anu Nim Kloss's speech. You said something about wolves in a city? Oops, I hadn't realized I'd said any of that out loud, and I couldn't think of any way to climb out of that hole. But Roberto Garcia came to my rescue, smooth as a used car salesman. Major Clanton was referencing a work of literature from our culture, Ambassador Arnu, he said, putting a hand on my shoulder and squeezing just a bit tighter than he had to. It speaks of a grand vista such as the one on which your city is built. It was true, the vista was quite grand. The Scrith homeworld, which they called Critiana, or at least that was the phonetic spelling we'd use to represent a word I don't believe a human mouth could pronounce correctly, was bigger than Earth by nearly half, but had the same gravity due to lighter minerals in the core. But it had about the same amount of water, which meant a lot of this world was high and dry. Most of the water, along with all the thicker vegetation, was at the bottoms of deep canyons, where the rivers drained into inland seas. It would have made sense to live down there where the water was, where the plants grew, and the herd animals that ate them congregated. But the Scrith, apparently, didn't go for the easy way, because they built their cities on the plateaus, the highlands. That was what our translator had told us was the English equivalent of the Scrith name for the city unfolding below us, Highland. It was nothing a human would have built, and distinct from the Helta aesthetic as well. The Helta built in and around the trees, adjusting their living space to accommodate the giant sequoias. But the Scrith carved their homes out of the rock, and not like the cliff dwellings back on Earth. Highland was a work of art, a sculpture by one of the masters, as if Rodan himself had happened upon Monument Valley and decided he wanted to turn one of the mesas into a city. The primary star, someone had told me what their name for it was, and I had totally forgotten, but it was a G-type, I remember that much, was setting, turning the city and the rock it was carved from deep orange, almost glowing from within. We were sailing toward it in an airship, a genuine, honest-to-goodness, lighter-than-air airship, its gas bag looming above us, cylindrical and white and about a hundred yards long. The gondola was open and the breeze coming in off the plateau smacked me in the face with the chill of the high desert in winter. It was breathtaking, and nearly worth the hour-long trip from their spaceport, which had seemed excessive. But despite the majestic views and the winking stars rising in the darkness of the far horizon, I just couldn't take my eyes off the Scrith, particularly the ambassador they'd sent to accompany us. Anu Nim Kloss wasn't wearing an upper-class British leisure suit and didn't actually look like Henry Hull in the 1935 horror movie, but it was damned close. The widow's peak and slicked back hair, the pointed ears, the jutting jaw with the canines coming over his upper lip when he closed his mouth, the bushy eyebrows. It was uncanny. And I guess it made sense if you considered the elders had, at some point, tens or hundreds of thousands of years in the past, taken wolves or maybe dire wolves from Earth, and done genetic experiments on them to make them humanoid. It was the why of it all that fascinated me. Why bears, and wolves, and monitor lizards, and octopus? 
They had humans, who were already humanoid, and they took some of us at some point not all that long ago. Why had they bothered with the mad scientist lab experiments? Were we not good enough? Or maybe, and this was a theory I was becoming more and more convinced of as the time went by, this was a test of some kind. Not for them, but for us. I hadn't even told Julie about this one because it sounded way too wild, and I knew she'd make fun of me for being a shitty pulp science fiction writer. I could see in her eyes looking at me from near the railing, gently mocking even though she couldn't know what I was thinking. Well, maybe she was looking at me like I was an idiot because I'd called the Scrith ambassador the werewolf of London to his face. Yeah, that might have been it. Are you fucking nuts? Garcia murmured next to my ear, maintaining a pleasant salesman smile for the Scrith. Do you want to start an interspecies incident? It sounds so dirty when you say it like that. I told him, unwilling to pretend to be apologetic to the man because he hadn't earned it. As much as I had sometimes found Delia Strawbridge officious and annoying, she'd proven herself a tough customer, who knew how to negotiate from strength, and I'd respected her. I missed her, though I never thought I would. I walked away from Garcia before he could figure out how to curse at me, and still sound like everything was right with the world, and sought out Oliveira, who was probably just as miffed with me, but would be more honest about it. There's damned thin up here, he said, instead of chewing me out. He took a demonstrative sniff. Like the Rockies. Yeah, I wouldn't want to try running a marathon here, I agreed. Not that I intended to run any more marathons after the last one fucked up my knee. Wait, the anti-aging injection was supposed to have rejuvenated my body. Maybe I could try running long distance again. I was so caught up in pondering the question, I nearly didn't catch what Oliveira said next. The Hilta have arrived, he said again looking even more annoyed than before. The truth seeker is in orbit. He tapped his earpiece. Junpa is heading down on his shuttle. Shit, I muttered, looking back the way we'd come, squinting at the setting star. I know what Caldwell ordered, what the president ordered, Oliveira reminded me. But it's going to be hard keeping this a secret. It's not like our news broadcasts are encrypted or anything, and they just beam out into the universe and the Helta engineers at the Lunar Orbital Station aren't exactly on lockdown. Not that they sit around watching TV or surfing our internet, but they'll find out eventually. Hell, I snorted. The only reason they don't know already is that we fed them that bullshit about taking the ship out for an early test run, and we can't hold them prisoner. I shook my head. This is all going to blow up in our faces if we aren't honest, at least with Junpa. As shocking as it might sound, I agree with you. But I'm a military officer, obligated to follow legal orders, and so are you. So, no matter what we might think of the logic behind this, we can't tell the Helta about the Chinese. Yes, sir, I acknowledged. I wasn't happy about it, but he was right. I was in the military, and while that meant I got to have a hand in events that made a difference for the whole planet, it also meant doing shit like this that didn't sit well in my gut. Oliveira wandered off, and I let him not wanting to talk to him about it anymore because he wasn't going to give me permission to disobey a direct order from the White House, and nothing else was going to make me feel better. Anu Nim Klaas took his place, and I nodded to him, feeling awkward, and wondering if nodding actually meant the same thing here, or if I just told him to go fuck himself. He regarded me with yellow eyes, and I suddenly knew what a wounded elk felt like when the pack closed in. He wore a sleeveless vest made from something like tanned hide and his shoulders bulged out of it, a lot more muscular than mine and also much hairier. I do not know your literature, he said, or at least that's what the translator told me he said, but I believe you called me a half-man, half-wolf. A man is what you are, if I understand correctly, and we have wolves. I gulped, suddenly wishing I was wearing my Spallen armor instead of a Class A dress uniform and wishing I hadn't agreed to let Brooks have the first crack at pulling security, leaving Pops for the second shuttle down during the actual conference. I glanced at the squad of rangers clustered at the rear of the gondola, wearing theirs, their visors up, talking quietly with Danny Brooks. I supposed they'd try to stop Wolfman Jack from ripping my throat out, but they were a good thirty yards away, and those fangs looked awfully sharp. I did have my Glock 17 holstered inside my jacket, but killing the Scrith ambassador might throw a wrench into the whole being voted into the Alliance thing. I didn't mean it as an insult, I said, though I decided not to tell him I had meant it as a joke, because who the hell knew what sort of sense of humor Eddie Munster had. 
I didn't realize how it would translate. I apologize. He cocked his head to the side and sniffed, dog-like. I do not know if I understand the concept of this apology you speak of, he said. If the translator, he touched a device attached to his vest, is explaining correctly, then it is something I am free to accept or reject. It is, I agreed, though we consider it good manners to accept an apology given honestly in good faith. I do not reject it, he said, but I am unsure if I will accept it yet or not. He sniffed again. I will let you know. I sagged against the railing as he walked away. Oh, Andy, Julie said, sidling up next to me. I hadn't realized she'd been close enough to hear, but from her amused smile I could see she had. Making friends everywhere you go. She patted me on the arm. It's why I love you. Thanks. Can I just go back to shooting Russian mercenaries? Right now it seems so much safer. Cheer up she said. I understand that once the Helta party touches down, there's going to be dinner in our Anna. I cast a doubtful eye at Anu Nim Kloss. I wouldn't be surprised if I'm the main course. Wow, this place is really something, Garcia said, not even trying to keep the awe out of his voice. And he was right. The Grand Banquet Hall at the Scrith Government Palace in Highland was perhaps the most impressive piece of architecture I'd ever seen. Not that I was the best judge of such things, since a lot of the places I'd traveled to in the Marines had been devastated from years, if not decades, of war and terrorism, and as a civilian I lived in Las Vegas, the kitsch capital of the world. But even a Philistine like me could tell this was something special. The chamber looked as if it had been chiseled out of the rock by hand then polished to a mirror-bright sheen, the twists and curves of these support columns almost shimmering in the light of crystal chandeliers. Yes, I said chandeliers. I mean, they weren't shaped or decorated like any chandelier I'd seen on Earth, but they were hanging light fixtures with mirror-bright beads of glass, and I couldn't think of anything else to call them. I also couldn't figure out what they used for a light source, because there didn't seem to be any power leads running to them and their soft glow seemed almost like a chem light than anything else. And the Scrith had built this. I couldn't imagine it, and maybe that made me prejudiced. But architectural genius wasn't the first thing that came to mind when I saw fangs and hairy faces. And that was just the females. I actually wouldn't have minded picking Garcia's brain on the subject, since I was sure he'd read up on the Scrith as much as he could before and during the trip. But we hadn't yet made it to the dining area when the Helta delegation entered the hall, announced by one of the Scrith at the top of his lungs, in what could have been a howl, but the translator insisted was a formal greeting. And while all the Scrith still tended to look alike to me, I could definitely tell the Helta officer leading their party from the others. Andy, my brother, Junpa enthused, taking my hand in his. The elders smile upon us that we meet again so soon. It was a human gesture he'd learned during his time with us, not something the Helta would have done on their own. In fact, I'd come to understand it meant something very different to them, involving a challenge for dominance, and I hoped he hadn't taken it personally the first time I tried to shake his hand. Did bears on earth ever shake hands? I didn't think so, but I was hardly an expert on any bears, much less the Indian sun bears from which the Helter race had been engineered. Glad you're here, Junpa, I said. I was beginning to feel a little out of place. I turned off my translator with a touch on the side of the tiny speaker affixed to the lapel of my dress jacket. These guys are weird, I confided, trusting he had learned enough English to catch my meaning. He laughed, or what passed for laughing among his people. Yes, they are quite that, he agreed, but they are valuable allies, and as you've no doubt already seen, quite accomplished civil engineers. Captain Junpa, Garcia said interrupting us and adding a greeting gesture in the Helta tradition. It's a pleasure to meet you. I am Assistant Secretary of State Roberto Garcia, and I hope to be working closely with you and the Helta government for some time. Depending on how the election goes, I put in sotto voce, earning a dirty look. Junpa looked at me with a plea in his eyes. He's Delia Strawbridge's replacement, I supplied. Ah, such a tragedy what happened to her. Junpa said, returning Garcia's gesture. 
I trust she was honored by your government for her bravery and sacrifice. She was, and she is, Garcia assured him, taking the shift of conversational gears with aplomb. In fact, the decision has been made to name one of our new cruisers after her. The horse with no name? I blurted, and was grateful that I'd at least kept from flat out asking if it was the one the Chinese hijacked. Yes, Garcia agreed, the tight smile and baring of teeth, the slight widening of his eyes warning me wordlessly not to say anything else about it. It's one of the highest honors our government can afford. Then let us assure her sacrifice was not in vain, Junpa said. With this meeting, we will make official the inclusion of Earth in our alliance. Junpa's junior officers and entourage didn't say a word to us, nor did he offer to introduce them, which was also a healthy thing that had taken some getting used to. It wasn't, as near as I could tell, a slight to the junior officers. It was just part of their culture. I still couldn't help but feel bad for them, like they were being left out of the conversation. Honored guests, one of the scrith said, a female this time. I could mostly tell by her clothing, which was different from the males being looser and covering the upper arms. I greet you in the name of the Alpha, and I welcome you to our meal. May it bring you good health and a strong hunt. I'm not sure what I expected from the Scrith dining area, but it hadn't been this. Three wild pigs had been slaughtered and roasted in pits carved into the stone floor. Potatoes, squash, and other roots and fruits and vegetables I couldn't readily identify cooked on a bed of grass piled around them. There were no plates, and I suspected they'd only included the cushions clustered around two of the pits and the knives scattered at intervals around the roast pigs as a courtesy to their guests. The scrith waited patiently for the rest of us, and for once even Garcia seemed at a loss. He looked at me, then at Oliveira, and finally over to a party of half a dozen scrith, who I assumed were government officials or military officers, though I couldn't say for sure. They were all dressed identically, gathered around their own barbecue pit. They stared back, their eyes yellow and slitted and unreadable. Fuck it, I said, crouching down in front of the pig and picking up a knife. I was from Tampa. I'd eaten roast pig before. Usually I used a fork, but I knew where to cut. The knife sank into the right shoulder, strands of meat falling away from each other, and my mouth began watering immediately. No tongs, no serving fork. I shrugged and grabbed a second knife, using the two in conjunction to pull off a few inches of meat, then tilting back my head and dropping it into my mouth. Oh my god, I said around the succulent strands of pork. This is the best. You guys gotta try this. You're a pig, Andy. Julie said. She knelt beside me and somehow managed to do the same thing without dripping juice on her dress uniform. Now that's the pig, I pointed with my knife. Satisfied that their guests were eating, the scrith fell on their own roast pork like, well, wolves. Right down to the snarls and snaps, and at least one of them growling at another who tried to take a bite too close to her section of the carcass. Garcia and Oliveira paled at the sight, but I just shrugged. It reminded me of a Baptist church social from my youth. Them people can eat. I feel bad for Colonel Brooks, I said. She and the other rangers had been assigned to guard the feast from the outside, and we hadn't cared to ask the scrith if they minded, not since what had happened to our party on Helta Prime. She'd love this shit. The Helta were picking carefully and daintily at the fruits and vegetables around the edges of the roast. It was almost comical, but it seemed a bit rude and pointless. Of course, this was another culture and not a human one, so I was probably misreading it. Hey, Junpa, I said, how come they give you guys a pig of your own when they know you're all vegetarians? It's very simple, really, Junpa told me, between bites of a roast potato. They don't like us, and this is what they consider a subtle joke at our expense. Subtle, I repeated, an eyebrow shooting up. If this is their idea of subtle, I think I should send them some videos of an old TV series called Jackass. It would probably be right up their alley. Andy, Julie said softly in my ear, nudging me with her elbow. Sorry, I said. I know I'm not being diplomatic, but damn, that just seems petty, doesn't it? Andy, she repeated, her gaze flickering up over my shoulder. I winced. He's standing right behind me, isn't he? Your name is Andy?
I turned at the voice I thought I recognized as belonging to the only Skrith I'd talked to, but then again, Amunim Klaas was the only Skrith I'd talked to. It is, I told him. At least I could tell it was a male from the clothes. I stood up to face him, and his height was right, at least. Major Andy Clanton. What is your position here, Andy Clanton? I'm in charge of ship's security, I said, grateful I didn't have to guess if this was the right person. Security? His expression might have been confusion, but it could just as easily have been indigestion for all I knew. You provide safety for the ship? I provide safety for the ship's crew when they leave the ship, I clarified. Like now. This expression I could read. I'd seen it on my dog's face, and I knew it meant amusement. You think you could provide safety for them here, among us, he wondered. Oh, yeah, I said, nodding. I could keep them alive long enough for those people we left outside to get in, and just that one squad could probably take any force you could throw against us. I shrugged. Okay, I admit, holding out until the shuttle could come get us would be problematic, but we'd figure something out. Humans are pretty resourceful. I wasn't looking at Garcia, but I would have been willing to make a four-figure bet that his eyes were bugging out of his head. So we have heard, though I am still not sure how much of it I believe. He motioned toward the remains of the pig. Do you enjoy your meal? It's excellent, I said, eager to find something to say that wouldn't be controversial. You know, I love the health and all, but I gotta admit, they got that whole vegetarian thing going, and your food is so much better. I grinned. Since we're both meat eaters, we should get along fine, right? I have studied your history, Andy Clanton. I am not impressed with your propensity for war. It reminds me too much of the ones who even now seek to conquer what they could not possibly need. You kill for sport. You make war because you desire power for its own sake. You have used nuclear weapons against your own people. I do not see how we could be more different. That is not strictly accurate, Anunim Klaas, Garcia said, jumping into the conversation like a paratrooper on D-Day. I've studied you as well, and our people have many similarities. You value sport as much as we do, some of it just as violent as any of our wars. I do not object to your violence, the Skrith corrected him. I object to your motives. That's not all of us. We are as varied and diverse within our own species as you are from the Helta. We have sports called football and mixed martial arts and boxing that are very similar to the rituals your people go through to challenge yourselves, to prove your worthiness. Do not compare yourselves to us, hairless ape. Anu warned him, the hair at the back of his neck bristling, his lips peeling back from his fangs. We are not you, and you will not soil our name by the association. I put a hand over the handle of my Glock and got ready to call for Brooks and her rangers, but the Skrith managed to bring his temper under control, his breath slowly returning to normal. I apologize. Garcia stammered, clearly unused to his oily salesmanship failing this spectacularly. And I do not accept your apology, human. He stepped closer to Garcia and sniffed at him. You smell of fear and desperation, and you would say anything to garner our support. But we do not accept what the hell to have done in our name. His yellow eyes pinned Junpa. They are supposedly our equals in this alliance. Yet, when they needed aid, they broke our traditions and went to the source, thinking they know better than the elders. Why would they not come to us? My brother, Junpa said, coming to his feet, believe me, we value you as partners. The Tavinians were rolling over all of us, Helta and Skrith and Chamblisi and Vironian alike. They were months from conquering the whole alliance. We should have let them conquer it, if defeating them meant handing our fate over to senseless beasts such as this. Jesus Christ, you're a whiny fucking hypocrite. The words had clawed their way free despite my best efforts to hold them in, but I sighed with relief at their escape.
This time I could see Garcia's face, and Oliveira's, and if they'd been disturbed by Scrith eating habits, they were both absolutely horrified this time. Clanton, Oliveira growled, but it was too late. Let me ask you something, Anu Neem Kloss, I said, royally pissed off. How many thousands of years were you on this planet before the Helta came along and dropped star travel and fusion power and everything else in your lap? Ten thousand? Fifty? A hundred? The Scrith made no attempt to answer. It's damn convenient when you have tens of thousands of years for your civilization to grow, for your society to mature before you get anything more advanced than the fucking wheel. But that's not how it was with us. We developed our own technology whenever it happened naturally. And if we discovered destructive weapons and society-altering inventions before our species was ready for them, then that was just tough shit for us. And millions of people died before we managed to get a handle on it. And you think this excuses you for what you have become? I think if your civilization had gunpowder or the internal combustion engine dumped in your laps when you were less than 6,000 years from your first cities being built, that you'd have wiped them all off the map by now, I shot back at him. I think it's easy to be high and mighty about how you haven't dropped an atom bomb when you probably can't even dig uranium out of your crust. I think you have the self-righteous arrogance of someone who had everything handed to them and feels like you got it because you deserved it. Uh-oh, I might have gone too far there. Now, fuck it. He already said he wasn't going to support us in the vote, so yeah, fuck it. You have insulted me, Anu said, coming so close to my face that I could smell his breath. It smelled just like my old German shepherds after he'd finished dinner. You have insulted the Scrith Federation. This may not go unanswered. I challenge you, Major Andy Clanton of the humans, to a blood hunt he snarled, as viciously as he had when he'd been ripping into the roast pig. If you refuse, or if you fail, then the Scrith will oppose the inclusion of the Earth Coalition into our alliance. If you win, the look of amusement returned. Well, you will not win, not against me. But if you do, I will support you in the vote, and with my recommendation, the Federation Alpha will agree to it. On my honor. Oh, shit, Julie murmured beside me. Here we go again, in her eyes. Oliveira and Garcia were staring at me. Junpa was staring at me. The whole Scrith delegation was staring at me. What else could I say? I accept. Chapter 9 What the hell is a blood hunt? I wiped pig juice off my chin with a napkin Julie handed me and tried to ignore all the people giving me death glares. Now's a great time to be asking that, Oliveira snapped, falling into a seat in the common area of the suite of rooms we shared. It was a surprisingly human arrangement, and I wondered if this was common to both races or if they prepared it for us after the Helta had given them the details about our species. Then again, seeing how the Scrith treated the Helta, maybe I was giving them too much credit for hospitality. At least here we could actually sit, albeit on low and overly soft couches instead of crouching or kneeling. Are we sure we want to be allies with these people? Julie asked, arms folded, seemingly disgusted by the whole turn of events. I mean, they're rude, confrontational, insanely aggressive, and this is the second species we've run into in this alliance with some sort of fight-to-the-death challenge, which seems insane to me for a race that has faster-than-light travel. I was nodding in agreement with anyone who wasn't yelling at me for being an idiot, so I nodded even more vigorously. It's not a fight to the death, Garcia told us. He had, amazingly, not been among the ones yelling at me. In fact, he hadn't said a word the whole rest of the dinner, which we had been obligated to finish despite the awkwardness. Neither had Junpa, who had waved me to silence when I tried to talk to him about it. If you knew what it was, Julie asked him, why don't you say something back in the dining room? Because this is a huge opportunity for us, he told her, looking as if he wanted to rub his hands together gleefully like a greedy loan shark in a 1950s mob movie. And I didn't want Anonim Klaas to be able to take it back. My friends, I beg your leave to enter. The voice came from outside our suite, and the verbal request was necessary because not only was there no doorbell or intercom system, there wasn't even a door. Apparently, the Scrith didn't share our notions of what constituted privacy 
But I recognized it, and so did the others. Come in, Junpa, I said, pushing away from the couch, grunting with the effort it took to rise from the quicksand soft cushions. He was alone, and like Garcia, he didn't seem that upset by the turn of events. Junpa, Oliveira said, sounding as put out as I felt. Can you tell us what this blood hunt is? The Skrith are hunters, predators, as you may have gathered from our feast. I don't know that any human has been around Helta enough to pick up dry sarcasm from their body language, but I was sure it was dripping off that statement. Yet they are also what your people would call conservationists. There are quotas, limits, and a tradition of touch hunts, that is, sneaking up close enough to an animal to touch it. When they have public disagreements that could affect the reputations of those involved, one party challenges the other to a blood hunt. A blood hunt is rare, but it is to the death, the death of the animal being hunted. Whichever of the parties involved in the dispute makes the kill first is considered to have been in the right. Thank God, Oliveira sighed, his shoulders sagging. At least no one is going to get killed. And... Garcia added, practically bouncing from one foot to another. Hanu agreed to vote in favor of including us in the alliance if Clanton wins. Yes, Junpa agreed, also seeming pleased. And I was not sanguine about the Skrith's vote until now. We have political allies among the Shamblisi and the Vironians, but as you may have gathered, the Helta and the Skrith do not get along quite as well. Then why the hell did we have the conference here? Oliveira wondered. As a sign of respect, we hoped it would make them more favorably disposed to the vote. Look, I said, it's great that it isn't a duel to the death, but there's one little problem. I haven't been hunting in almost twenty years, and when I did, it was with a gun. Somehow I don't think Eddie Munster is going to let me use a gun. Julie snorted, punching me in the arm as punishment for the joke. I'm not going to have to take down a deer with my teeth, am I? I implored Junpa. Some allowances are going to be made for your different physiology, he assured me. I believe a spear was mentioned. A spear? I exclaimed. Do I look like I know how to use a fucking spear? As the challenged, you are allowed a second, Junpa informed me, unaffected by my histrionics. Someone to help you on the hunt, although you must be the one to make the actual kill. That's awesome, I sighed. Who? Who do we have available that's got some experience at this? General? I asked Oliveira. Don't look at me, he said, shaking his head. Last thing I hunted was squirrels with my cousin in Kentucky, and I wound up getting lost for sixteen hours. They had to bring out dogs to find me. I remembered my comms and touched the button on my earbud. Colonel Brooks, I called, the cell phone-like device on my uniform belt connecting me automatically. Go, Brooks said. She was still outside with the rangers. Colonel, do any of your people have hunting experience, preferably without firearms? I paused, wondering how much of this to share on what was probably an unsecured line. It's important. She didn't reply, and I wasn't sure if she was checking with her squad or just boggling at the question. Maybe I should take Pops, I said aside to Julie. I know he doesn't hunt for fun, but he's worked with indigenous militaries all over the world. One of them has to have taken him hunting. Wait one. Brooks interjected, addressing the suggestion I'd made to Julie. Don't do anything yet. I'll be right there. Brooks wasn't kidding. It was a good half mile from the entrance she had to use, but two of them were in our suite inside three minutes. They had to have been running, and I would have paid good money to see the Skrith reaction to the exoskeletons clomping through their stone palace. She'd brought Quinn with her, their visors up, curiosity written across both of their faces. I got your man right here, Andy, she said, gesturing at the corporal. Now tell me why you need him. I eyed the younger man doubtfully, but gave her a summary of what happened at the dinner. She was laughing by the time I'd finished, and not in a good way. Oh, Lord, Andy, your mouth gets you into more trouble than any three people I ever met. Didn't anyone tell you that majors are supposed to be boring, paper-pushing staff officers keeping their noses clean until they get promoted to lieutenant colonel? That's a natural major. I corrected her. I'm a major because my position was too important to give to a captain, but I'm way too irresponsible to be a colonel. At least you're self-aware, she conceded, which is better than most majors. Quinn, I said, trying to bring us back to the subject at hand. Tell me you're a hunter. 
I am a hunter, sir, he assured me, with a sort of confidence only a ranger or a marine can exude. I've been hunting feral hogs since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. Oh, Jesus, Quinn, I said, blanching at the accent he'd let slip through, one I'd never heard from him before. You never told me you were from Texas? He laughed, thinking I was joking, the poor fool. I am not, as a matter of fact, from Texas, he informed me, though I hunted there with my uncle. I'm from Oklahoma originally, but I lived in South Carolina since I was twelve. Oof, I said, wiping pretend sweat off my forehead. And you've done it without a gun? I don't know I've ever hunted pigs with a gun, and we did use a boar spear a couple times. He shrugged. And I hunted deer with a compound bow, though I don't know if that's going to help. Any experience you have is going to help, I insisted. I addressed Junpa. You seem to know more about this than we do. When is it supposed to happen, and what are we hunting? Normally there is a three-day preparation ritual, but this has to happen before the other delegations arrive, so I have been told you will all be flown down before dawn tomorrow. Oh, great, I said, sagging against a curved wall support. So much for getting a good night's sleep first. You would have been too keyed up to sleep anyway, Julie pointed out. I glanced around furtively, and she rolled her eyes. They know, Andy. Everyone knows, Olivera confirmed. No one cares. Get over it. Knows what? Quinn asked, frowning. Never mind, kid, Brooks consoled him, patting his arm. He said fly us down, Junpa, I reminded him. Down where? Into the canyons, the river valleys. That's where game congregates. The Skrith have farms and ranches down there as well where they raise most of the food for their cities. Almost nothing lives up here, at least nothing larger than a coyote. That made sense. I'd been thinking there wouldn't be any pigs living up here on the bare rock. They must have brought up the ones they'd fed us. That doesn't sound so bad, Oliveira said. The air should be thicker there, so you two won't be staggering around and wheezing the whole time. The only problem will be beating this Anu to the punch. He asked Garcia, Do we call him Anu? What's the convention here? To say the full name unless invited not to, was the reply. Wonderful. Then the only problem will be beating Anu Nim Klaas to the kill. He's obviously done this sort of thing before. And he knows the lay of the land. He'll know where the game is, how it behaves. Pigs are pigs, sir, Quinn said, shaking his head. Doesn't matter if they're in Florida or Russia or some alien planet, they always behave the same. They dig up the ground the same way everywhere, leave the same hog wallows. You get me down there, I can find their sign for you. I'm afraid there's been some misunderstanding, Junpa said. The Skrith hunt wild pigs for food and also raise them for slaughter, but that is not for the ritual. The ritual always involves something with more risk to the hunter, more challenge, else there wouldn't be as much sport. I don't know if I would characterize a wild hog as not risky to the hunter, Quinn said, especially when we're just using spears. I've seen what they can do to a dog that gets too close. Yes, well, the Skrith idea of risky is an order of magnitude greater than our own. How come you needed us if you have them, I wondered. They seem like they'd be fairly fierce in battle. As individuals, Oliveira explained. As hunters. Maybe if they had someone like us to train them for a few years, they'd be useful. Humans hunted wolves long before we had gunpowder. It's been a damned long time since the reverse was true. So what are we hunting? Quinn pressed. Not wolves, I hope, I said. I didn't think the Skrith would hunt predators, being so close to them in evolutionary terms, but she never knew. No, something the wolves would compete with you to kill. Junpa smiled, imitating with what might have been an attempt at reassuring us. Bull elk in rut at the moment. I pictured the elk I'd seen in Yellowstone, the size of a horse with sharp, pointy horns, ready to gore any minivan that came near them during their mating season. And then I pictured me trying to kill one with a fucking spear. I tried not to whimper. I really need to learn to keep my mouth shut. Chapter 10 this is going to be one of those war stories I tell over a few shots of tequila, I confided to Randolph Quinn. 
No shit, there I was, hiding behind a tree in a river valley at the bottom of a mile-deep canyon on an alien planet run by wolfmen, dressed in BDUs and smeared with mud and elk urine, getting ready to try to kill a 700-pound bull elk with a wooden spear tipped with polished ivory blades from mastodon tusks. I shook my head. What a damn silly way to get dinner. We should try to be quiet. Quinn admonished, dark eyes locked on the herd of grazing female elk drifting toward our position. Great, now I was being lectured on field craft by a fucking 21-year-old army ranger. I made the mistake of breathing through my nose and nearly gagged. Elk urine really stinks. It was beautiful here in the canyon, I had to admit that. Canyon was an odd word for it, an inexact translation of what the scrith and the helta meant. When I'd heard it, I'd pictured the Grand Canyon in Arizona, but this had more in common with the Rift Valleys of Africa, or Valles Marineris on Mars. Blood Canyon, and yes, that is what the Scrith called it, was 60 miles wide and 2,000 miles long, and the only way to see both walls of the rift at once was from space. If the cool, dry, thin air of Highland had reminded me of my adopted state of Nevada, then Blood Canyon, wetter, hotter, and thicker, was much more reminiscent of my home state of Florida. I swatted at a mosquito and remembered why I'd moved away. The bush, or tree, or whatever it was we were using for concealment, seemed to be a magnet for bugs, and we couldn't use chemical repellents or the elk would smell it. I was sure Quinn had to be getting bitten just like I was, but the kid didn't move a muscle, didn't seem to notice. Embracing himself against the soft ground with the butt of his spear, eyes focused ahead, he could have been some Stone Age hunter reincarnated. I was not. I was, medical revitalization notwithstanding, a forty-something writer who hadn't gotten enough sleep last night. I could embrace the suck with the best of them as a twenty-something platoon leader, but I'd lived the easy life too long, and even the combat of the last year or so was the sort of combat that involved lots of air conditioning and machines that did the work for me. I eyed the elk cows and their yearling calves, grazing by the placid river, hooves squishing in the mud, and tried to will them to come closer. The bull was about a hundred yards away from us, tossing its head back and bugling to warn any rivals away. He was a warrior king, with a head full of curving horns that any hunter on earth would have paid a year's salary to hang on his wall. I was never a big hunter, just went after some hog and deer with my family in Georgia, and I'd never understood trophy hunting. The animal was never going to look anywhere near as good hanging on the wall as it had alive, doing its thing, but to each their own, and since the trophy in this case was helping the earth become part of a galactic alliance, well, adios, Mr. Elk if we could get him to come close enough to us to use these spears, if he didn't kill us both in the attempt, and if Anu Nim Klaas didn't get it first. He was out there somewhere. We'd been dropped off at opposite ends of the herd, about three miles away from each other, and I was sure he'd made it here before us since he knew the place. I wondered if he was just sitting out there watching us, hoping to get a good laugh at the stupid hairless apes trying to kill an elk. We need to speed this up, I told Quinn. It won't do us any good to be the stealthiest assholes on this planet if the other guy gets to the horny bastard first. Well, there's one thing we could try, he said thoughtfully. I mean, it's kind of the opposite of stealthy, but if he thinks we're going after one of his cows, he might charge us. Fuck yes, he would, I agreed. I've been to Yellowstone in the fall, and I saw one almost as big as that guy. I indicated the bull with the tilt of my spear, ram his antlers right into the side of a minivan when it got too close. Then it hit me. You want to get him pissed off at us? Are you nuts, Quinn? The kid shrugged. You want safe or you want quick, sir? He added, belatedly and with some malice. Oh, shove that sir up your ass, I told him, turning back to the bull. Shit, I'd gotten us into this. All right, I acceded. We just... Walk right into the herd, then? When he starts coming at us, Quinn suggested, we should get on opposite sides of him so we won't know who to go after. Then we can stab him with the spears from both sides and pin him down so he can't just gallop away. These things are as fast as a horse. All right, I said, starting to rise from cover, but he stopped me with a hand on my arm. If we don't get a clean hit, he warned me, if he gets off the spearheads and starts whipping those antlers around, we need to split up and run like hell. 
Try to get a tree between you and him, maybe even climb it. I cast a skeptical glance at the stunted, waterlogged trees in the marshland beside the wide river and couldn't imagine one of them holding my weight. But no plan ever got implemented if you just sat around coming up with contingencies. Let's go, I said. We walked into the herd as if we owned the place, and at first the elk didn't seem to notice. They kept grazing, ignoring us, maybe because of the odor masking mud and piss mixture kicking our faces, necks, and hands, or maybe because we didn't smell like wolves or bears or scrith or anything else that hunted them on this world. You've done this before, right? I asked Quinn, my eyes locked on the king elk. Hunted with a spear? he asked, and I nodded. I've seen it done. I was like twelve and my uncle wouldn't let me take the kill because he didn't think I was big enough. Something you might have mentioned earlier, Corporal, I gritted through clenched teeth. Yes, sir, he said, no apology whatsoever in his voice. I regret keeping you from bringing one of all the other personnel we had available who knew anything about hunting with a spear. I wanted to snap at him, but I couldn't. Fair point. We were about thirty yards from the bull when he finally turned his head and fixed us with a regal glare, snorting his outrage. Oh, there we go, I murmured. Move left, Quinn instructed me, sidestepping to the right, making some space between us. I kept going forward but angled away from him just a few degrees. The ground was damp, the footing uncertain, and I stepped calf-deep in a puddle of marsh water soaking my boot and the sock beneath it. I pressed on, ignoring the discomfort. At about twenty yards away, the bull lowered his head. Now! Quinn yelled, lunging at the huge animal, the haft of his spear tucked in close to his side. I tried to imitate the form he'd showed me back at the Scrith Palace, with the spear close to my body, not extending my arms too far, keeping it in tight to increase the leverage. I ran at the left flank of the beast at almost the same time as Quinn lunged in from the right, but the elk pulled up short, prancing backwards, snorting in alarm at something coming from behind him, something running on two legs but hunched over, as if he might be more comfortable if he could have gone on all fours, something covered in thick, dark fur and a loincloth of tanned hide and nothing else. Anu Nim Kloss leaped with the grace of the wolf inside his genetic code, fangs bared, trying to latch onto the elk at the base of the animal's throat. I'd seen the same sort of attack on nature documentaries, and it didn't always go well for the wolf. The bull elk must have had a subscription to the same streaming service because he lashed out with a double kick of his rear hooves, and the Scrith ambassador went flying into the brush, leaving a frightened, pissed-off bull elk staring at the two humans who were his only convenient targets. Shit! Quinn dove to the side when the elk swung its antlers around at him. Run! Oh, that's helpful. I scrambled away, keeping the point of the spear between me and the elk as if the overgrown toothpick would save me from this angry ungulate. He didn't charge directly at me, so I figured he didn't realize how flimsy my weapon was and was being cautious. And who could blame him? He had a whole herd full of elk cows to try to impregnate, and who has time for getting stabbed with a spear when there's that much work to do? He took two steps forward, and I took about ten back, splashing into the water again, then back out of it. If I tripped and fell over backwards, he was going to gut me with those antlers, but I didn't dare look away from him to watch where I was going. Little details stood out, things I wouldn't have expected, like the cloud of bugs surrounding him, flies and mosquitoes dancing a constant ballet of torment, which would be enough reason for me to go into a murderous rage too. And his breath. If Godzilla ate bean burritos all night and then went to bed without brushing his teeth, his atomic breath would still have had nothing on this guy. And more than anything, I couldn't stop thinking about how incredibly massive the animal was and how easily he could kill me. You okay, Quinn? I called. Yeah, I think so, he said. I kind of twisted my ankle, though. Stepped in a hole. I risked just a flicker of my eyes in his direction and saw Quinn pushing himself to his feet using the spear for leverage. He was soaked, dirty water dripping off his camouflage field utilities, though that had to be an improvement over the crap we'd rubbed on our skin. Think you can get his attention over there? I wondered. Because right now, I think he's decided I am all that's wrong with the world. Another three steps backward to the bull's one forward, he tossed his head and bugled, a sound that set the hair on the back of my neck standing up. Intuition told me he was going to charge again, that he was working himself up to it. Yes, sir, Quinn said. 
I could make him out in the corner of my eye, and he was limping badly. Quinn, can you run on that ankle? Because I have a feeling we're going to need to run. Don't know, sir, he admitted. But I guess we'll find out. I was forgetting something. Oh, right. Anu, I yelled, hoping my translator was waterproof. Are you okay? You still alive over there? The speaker affixed to my collar spouted something in script, and I was impressed with its durability. I made a mental note to leave a five-star rating for it when I got back to Earth. The Skrith made no reply. Anonim Klaas, I tried again, wondering if the guy was dead or unconscious or just too proud to answer to the shortened name. Are you hurt? That was a dumb question, I realized. He'd taken a kick right to the chest. Of course he was hurt. The elk must have thought it was dumb, too, because he began to lower his head at me. I stuck the butt of my spear into the ground and aimed the point at him like a pike against a mounted knight. Which wasn't going to work. He wouldn't charge straight into it, he'd just knock it out of the way, but I wasn't sure what else to do. A moan rolled out from the brush to my left. Not a human moan, but unmistakably the sound of suffering. And there was only one suffering being in that direction. The elk paused, turning to the new sound, and I turned with him. Anu Nim Klaas was rolling out of the bushes where he'd fallen, hands on his chest, blood welling between his fingers from the deep cuts the elk's hooves had left there. He tried to stand, getting his feet beneath him and unfolding an emotion no human not trained in gymnastics could have imitated. Get out of there, I yelled at him, taking a step toward him. The elk was faster. Its antlers swiped sideways and struck him at the shoulder, knocking him sideways into the water. It was going to kill him. I don't remember thinking about it. I just lunged with the ivory blade and buried it just behind its front leg. The bull thrashed the spear right out of my hands, the haft slapping the side of my head and sending me reeling, stars filling my vision. If I could have formed a coherent thought in that moment, it would probably have been something about how idiotic it was for me to survive firefights with Venezuelans, Russians, and Tavinians, only to get killed by a deer on steroids. I tried to shake my head clear, expecting to see the bull advancing on me, ready to get revenge by ripping my guts out. But the animal was a good deal more sensible than any of us, and he was trying to run. If he runs, we don't get the Skrith vote. Why that was my primary concern at the moment, I'll never know. But at least I wasn't the only one. Quinn darted in with admirable speed for a guy who had a twisted ankle, and jammed his spear into the right side of the bull's chest. The animal didn't make a sound. That was the oddest part. He'd been bugling up a storm before, snorting and pawing at the ground, but once the spears had gone in, he was mute. Blood frothed from the elk's mouth, bubbling out of his lungs, and I knew he was done for. I pushed myself up, warm mud squishing between my fingers. The elk was sitting, legs folded beneath it, as if he was resting, but his neck was limp, his head propped up on his antlers. I felt a tremendous sadness, and then a tremendous pain in my head. Shit, I moaned, putting a hand to my head, feeling wetness, but not sure if it was blood or just the mud. I stumbled over to Anu Nim Klaas. He was propped up on an elbow, coughing, looking pretty bad with blood streaming down his chest and his right bicep. Quinn plopped down in the mud, hands going to his ankle, face screwed up with pain, and I had an idea he hadn't just sprained it. And me? I could barely see straight, and every attempt to think wound up with my pulse beating in my temples. I pulled my comm unit out of my pocket, my fingers so wet and muddy I nearly dropped it. Hey, it's me, I said, blowing off communications protocol because I didn't think the enemy elk army could crack our comms. Anybody listening? Yeah, I got you, Andy. It was Julie. I wanted to smile, but it hurt my face. You guys okay? Well... We're doing better than the elk, I told her, but not by much. You want to send someone out to pick us up? Because Anu probably has some broken ribs. Quinn busted his ankle, and a fucking elk somehow managed to brain me with my own spear. And if the Skrith are counting on us to haul this big-ass carcass out of here, then I'm going to leave it for the coyotes. Chapter 11 Could I... Get a medal? For killing an elk? I wondered. The words gasped as I tried to get my breathing back under control. Julie raised her head from my chest and eyed me askance, sweat beating on her forehead. That? That's what you're thinking about now? No, I wasn't thinking about it just now, 
I insisted, shaking my head, hands going to her back, rubbing gently as if I was trying to massage away a hurt. Just afterwards, for a second. No, that didn't sound good either. I leaned up and kissed her hard, then tried again. I mean, I was kind of lost in a haze, carried beyond consciousness by the rapture of our experience together, and disconnected bits of thought began to bounce off each other in my state of wonder and ecstasy, and that, unfortunately, was the one that came out. Oh, my God, she moaned, resting her cheek against my shoulder and shaking with silent laughter. It's a damn good thing you don't write romance novels, or you'd have starved to death. Are you saying I'm not romantic? I demanded, feigning outrage. Then, hey, wait a second, are you saying you read romance novels? Hey, now, she exclaimed, sitting up and hunting for the light switch. It was easy to find, because the portable lamp had come down with us on the shuttle. The Scrith didn't use them, their night vision being superior to ours. I squinted against the sudden glare. I never said I read romance novels, she raised a hand as if in testimony in court. I may have read a couple in my life, but I don't read them. I laughed, glad I could do it without pain, thanks to the ship's chief medical officer who treated my blow to the head. Quinn, and especially Anu, had spent a lot more time in the medical clinic than I had. I am so never letting this go, I promised her. When we're a hundred years old, and I shrugged. Not gray, I guess. Looking exactly like we do now, when we're a hundred years old and have like ten kids, I will still hold this over your head. Ten kids? She repeated, horror written across her face. Jesus Christ, Andy, it's a vagina, not a clown car. Hey, I reasoned. I'm exaggerating a little, but this is a brave new world, hon. So you get the itch to have a kid every ten years or so. Well, that's a hundred years to get to ten, and the oldest will be ninety before the tenth is born. It's going to really put a twist in the nuclear family. Don't we have to be a family before we're a nuclear family? She said archly. Or a thermonuclear family, or whatever you want to call it. I don't remember ever saying I wanted to have more kids, and I certainly don't think I would have forgotten if you'd ever asked me to marry you. I stopped for a moment, disengaging my mouth and letting my eyes do the work. She was propped up on one arm, the golden light from the lamp doing wonderful things for her bare skin, and I smiled with appreciation. Would you? I asked finally. Would I what? She shot back, a suspicious cant to her eyebrow. I scooted across the moss-filled animal skin mattress, which was more comfortable than I'd given it credit for, and took her in my arms, pulling her against me. Her flesh radiated the heat we generated, even in the slight chill from the stone walls of the bedchamber. I kissed her, and her arms went around my neck giving the whole business some serious attention for a few seconds before she pulled away, gently but firmly, and looked me in the eye. Would I what? Would you marry me? The words came so easy, as if they weren't pushing against years of pain and anger and bad memories. What was the old saying? Remarriage is the triumph of hope over experience. Julie smiled crookedly. Are you really asking? Or is this one of those games where if I say yes, you say okay, good to know? because I'm your superior officer and in a unique position to do you great bodily harm. I held her at arm's length, my hands on her shoulders, and looked into her eyes. Julie Nieves, I said, sober as a judge. Will you marry me? Something scratched at the door. That was kind of an inexact way to describe it, since the room didn't have a door, per se, just a long, narrow hall to the corridor leading outside, sound and light dampened by a series of curtains. But something was scratching out there, past the last curtain, so muted I almost couldn't hear it. What the hell is that? I let go of Julie, reaching into the pile of clothes beside the bed, seeking the rough plastic of my Glock. So it sounds like my old cock a spaniel, when she wanted to go outside and pee. I shared a look with her, threw off the covers, and retrieved my shorts from the pile. I yanked them on quickly while Julie found her clothes. The floor was ice cold under my bare feet and I resisted the urge to put on my socks, not willing to give up in traction what I gained in insulation. Is someone there? I asked, gun hanging at my side. I seek your leave to enter the room, a voice said in badly accented English. The words gave the impression the speaker had memorized the sounds without knowing the intonation, but he'd made the effort to learn the words, which said something. I shrugged at Julie. She held out a hand, and I gave her the Glock, letting her hold it beneath the covers, exchanging it for my comm unit and earbud. I'd need them for the translator. 
Come in, I said. The scrith who pushed past the curtains could have been any of them, except for the body fur shaved away from his chest. The skin there was pink and new, and spoke of time spent in a Helta Tech medical lab. It was Anu Nim Kloss. I tensed, suspicious of why he would show up in my room. Maybe he was a sore loser and wanted to make me share in the misery of his broken ribs. And hey, I could understand that. I had broken ribs more than once, and it sucked big time. But I really wish he could have waited until morning, and not when I just asked my girlfriend to marry me. Anonim Kloss, I said, trying my best to be diplomatic, or as diplomatic as I was capable of at this time of night. What can I do for you? He stared at me from under bushy eyebrows, his yellow eyes inhuman and unreadable, his breath rasping and smelling of meat. The elk, probably. They'd cooked it after we'd brought it back and put it out for all to sample in some sort of ritual. It was the first time I'd eaten elk steak, and it had been delicious, perhaps the more so since I'd brought it down with my own hands. Well, Quinn and I had brought it down. I am unaccustomed to being beholden to anyone, particularly not an alien, the scrith said. But you saved my life at risk to your own when you had no reason to do so. That wasn't strictly true. I had a very good reason. The fact that he had promised to vote our way in the conference if I won the blood hunt. If he died, his replacement wouldn't have felt any obligation to keep that promise. But I didn't tell him that, because I might not be a good diplomat, but I'm not an idiot either. I didn't really think about it, I admitted to him. There wasn't time. And yet, you did the right thing, when there was no time to consider it, he insisted which is something of which I would not have thought your kind capable of. I am in your debt, Andy Clanton, and I do not know how I can pay it back. My duty, I chose my words carefully so as not to spoil his newfound appreciation for humans, is to ensure my planet is accepted into your alliance. If you help me to fulfill my duty, I would consider your debt to be discharged. And yet, I would not, he said and I puzzled over it, wondering if the translator was on the fritz. To vote for your inclusion was the terms of my challenge, and I would honor them no matter my feelings toward you. To do less would dishonor my people. The translator added a slight emphasis that might have been a reproof, though I wasn't sure of it and wasn't sure how accurate the translator's choices for tonal shifts were in the first place. What I owe you must be paid back in kind and I swear to you that I will find a way to do just that. He lowered his head and inclined it toward me, and I wasn't sure how to react. In this scrith social ritual, the translator said helpfully, its synthesized voice annoyingly cheerful, you are expected to nuzzle the supplicant's cheek in acceptance of their submission. Not doing so would be to reject them and require they depart from your presence. Fuck. I rolled my eyes, but took a step closer and leaned in to the scrith's left cheek. You'd better be right about this, you glorified virtual assistant. I clenched my jaw and hoped Julie could shoot the werewolf-looking fuck if the computer had it wrong, and I was insulting his family or something instead of accepting his submission. But he simply leaned closer, and his fur rubbed the bare skin of my face. It was surprisingly soft, but I still wished I had a beard, because it would have provided insulation against the awkward contact. When I felt like I'd done it for long enough, I pulled back and offered him a hand. This is the human way, I explained, for friends to greet one another. His hand extended hesitantly, his rough, clawed fingers wrapping around mine with what felt like enough strength to crush my hand. I gripped his firmly and shook just slightly before letting go. It seemed as if only then he noticed Julie on the bed. Are you mates? he asked. I did not know. My jaw stuck halfway open, afraid to try to answer that, but Julie rescued me. We are, she confirmed, with the hint of a smile. You are both fortunate, then, he said. My own mate passed away ten years ago, and I've been unable to allow myself to find another. May you have beautiful and healthy children, and may you die well. The polite reply, the translator informed me, is to wish that he dies well also. I did, though I felt like an extra in a Conan movie saying it, and the scrith departed, the curtain swaying with his passage. 
I don't know if I just got a new best friend or a pet, I confessed. I hope it's a friend, because we're going to need all we can get. She pulled the Glock out from under the covers and set it down on top of our folded clothes, then patted the mattress. Come back to bed. We have to get up in like six hours. I stifled a yawn and did as I was told, not bothering to strip off my T-shirt again, just crawling under the covers with Julie and slipping an arm around her. She felt incredibly warm after the night chill of the stone floor, and she wrapped her arms around me, putting her head against my shoulder. Yes, by the way, she said softly into my ear. Yes, what? I asked, already feeling groggy. She smacked the side of my head and I yelped. Hey, I protested. I might have had a concussion. Yes, she clarified. I will marry you. You're an overgrown twelve-year-old, but I can't help it. You're the only man I've dated in the last ten years who I didn't want to kill after three months. And that has to be a sign from God, or something. Her expression grew serious. I love you. And if we live two or three hundred years and can still stand being around each other, then I'll still love you then. And the ten kids? I asked her, kissing the end of her nose playfully. Let's start with one, she said, in a while, once this all settles down. Oh, sweetheart. I sighed, letting my head rest back against the pillow. We should live so long. Chapter 12 What? I insisted. The fuck? You knew what they looked like, Julie reminded me, keeping her voice as low as mine so the translators wouldn't pick up our words and broadcast them for all the aliens to hear. You saw the videos and the pictures, just like the rest of us. I did. But Jesus Christ, Julie, they're octopus. Octopuses. Octopi. The Vironians weren't that big a deal. They were descended from genetically modified lizards of some sort, maybe crocodiles, but I was betting on Nile monitors. Their faces were on the flat side, their skin thick and scaly, but they were still humanoid. Two arms, two legs, stereoscopic vision, a mouth in about the right place, even if it was wider and longer than I was comfortable with and had more teeth. Well, there was also the issue with clothes. The Vironians didn't really wear any. I guess I can understand why, considering how thick and tough their skin was. And apparently they could withdraw their genitalia into pouches inside their bodies, so that wasn't a worry. But it still made the hackles on the back of my neck rise, seeing nothing at all down there like a Ken doll. They at least wore insulated cloaks, and I got the idea that it was because the Skrith kept things too cold for their liking. They weren't very talkative either, at least not to us, passing by Garcia's greeting with barely a nod, though Junpa assured me it wasn't personal. That, he had insisted, is how they are with everyone, even each other. Garcia had accepted the explanation with the equanimity he showed in every situation, allowing the Vironian delegation to pass into the conference room. I'd figured the Skrith would hold it in the same place where we'd had our awkward state dinner the first night, but apparently this place wasn't hurting for big halls to hold meetings in. This one reminded me of the UN General Assembly, except, of course, what happened here would be meaningful, something that occurred maybe once a generation in the United Nations. Since the Skrith seemed to use any public event as an excuse to eat, the meeting tables were doubled as snack trays, with shredded meat, fruits, and tubers in their centers. I wondered if the tables were a concession to the other races present, since the Skrith had seemed perfectly content to eat sitting on the floor. I wish to hell I was at one of the tables eating pulled pork with Oliveira and Danny Brooks, or even patrolling the outer perimeter in my armor like Pops and the Delta team. I don't know why the hell Garcia insisted on bringing me along for the meet-and-greet portion of this show, and my stomach grumbled from the lack of a real breakfast. Then the Chamblisi entered the hall and drove all thoughts of food out of my head, except maybe an irreverent comparison to calamari. I'd known the Chamblisi were the end product of the elders screwing around with the genes of an octopus or squid but it was one thing to see video of a giant shambling mass of tentacles, and quite another to have one march right up and say hello. The Chamblisi were not humanoid. Oh, they were around the same height, the sixteen individuals who shuffled into the chamber averaging about five feet tall. They couldn't weigh much more than two or three hundred pounds at the outside, depending on how solid their insides were beneath that ick. 
They did have two eyes, and the elders had, probably for reasons of practicality, relocated the mouth from beneath the arms around to the front of their face. But that had been as far as they'd been willing to go, apparently. They were land-dwelling beings, at least amphibians, so half of their tentacles had been bulked up with muscle and given pads instead of suckers, while the upper pairs of arms were more lithe, less muscular, with cilia-like manipulators on the ends, constantly squirming and waving like tube worms at a thermal vent on the ocean floor. They must have had some sort of skeleton because they couldn't have walked on land very well without one, but I couldn't tell where it was. They wore no clothes, not even the cloaks the Vironians used to stay warm. Their only adornment, a sort of harness around their upper arms that served as the equivalent of a purse or belt, to carry pouches full of whatever a walking, talking octopus needed. Greetings, representatives of Earth. The translator's simulated voice was a surprisingly boisterous and cheerful representation of what I heard as a series of buzzes as if someone's cell phone had been left on vibrate and set on a cheap plastic table, then assailed by a stalkery ex-boyfriend. Oh, and their skin color changed, which might have been part of it. I am the one who dwells in blissful silence and contemplates the universe, and I share with you the warm welcome of the Shamblisi Harmonious Accord into our Commonwealth of States. I am Roberto Garcia, the State Department official replied, after a split-second hesitation, probably to decide whether he should offer a hand in greeting. An appointed representative of the government of the United States of America on Earth. And I thank you and the Shamblisi Harmonious Accord for your warm acceptance. I had been curious how the translator would handle a language that was predicated on a change of skin color. But some programmer had been extra crafty the day they'd worked on this design. Garcia held up his phone as he spoke, and changing colors blinked on the screen with the buzzing translation. It might have been awkward if someone had sent him a text right then. They could have started an interstellar incident. One who dwells in blissful silence and contemplates the universe didn't introduce any of his her, its, co-workers, which I suppose was a time-saver, if their names were anywhere near as pretentious. I speak on behalf of the Harmonious Accord when I assure you, Roberto Garcia, that we, Shamblisi, fervently hope that things are as our allies, the Helta, say, and that you humans of Earth are not as aggressive and warlike as the Tivinians, Despite your physical similarities... We wouldn't be much fucking good to you if we weren't, I murmured, covering the audio pickup of my translator, having learned from my mistake with the script. Garcia didn't hear me or he would have given me a dirty look, but Julie did, and she dug an elbow into my ribs. The Helta also thank you for your attendance, Junpa told the Shamblisi ambassador, inclining his head slightly to the big purple squiggly pile of goo. The Harmonious Accord has honored us by sending someone of such senior station as yourself. This is a momentous occasion, the one who dwells in blissful silence and contemplates the universe replied, his pale purple turning bright pink at the compliment. They wanted someone who could make so fateful a decision with their utmost confidence. And I am sure you will make the correct one. Junpa said, taking a step back to allow the delegation to pass. They moved with surprising grace for creatures taken out of the ocean just a few tens of thousands of years ago, and I watched them with wide eyes, unable to turn away even after they found their cluster of tables, and a few of them settled into seats that couldn't have been adequate for their anatomy. Not the head octopus, though. He roamed around, speaking to one delegate and then the next, giving them his utter and complete attention with a sincerity Garcia only wished he could fake. Do we have to say that name every single time we talk to... I stumbled over the pronoun. Them? The one who dwells in blissful silence and contemplates the universe? Is there, like, a symbol for that? Like, the artist formerly known as Prince? God, you're old, Andy, Julie said, shaking her head. I glared at her. We're the same age. You know that, right? Yes, she admitted. But I try not to make it so obvious. We're trying to get Earth admitted into an interstellar alliance, Garcia said, arcing an eyebrow at me. 
will call any of these fine representatives whatever they like. The Shamblisi don't really use personal names. Junpa actually answered the question. What she gave us is an honorific awarded to her by her government. Those are only bestowed on Shamblisi who perform a key service to their people. If they don't use names, I said, then how do they know who anybody is? They emit a subsonic hum constantly. It's not a conscious thing. It's part of their respiratory process, which is, by the way, quite complicated. No two are alike, so they simply know who everyone is without having to speak. Like a biological version of an IFF transponder, I mused. Interesting. That's great for people talking face to face, Julie protested. But what about paperwork? Junpa looked at her blankly, not understanding, and I stepped in. Like records, I explained. Official documents, government files for their employees, that kind of thing. Ah, yes. Well, that is a human thing, I suppose. The Helta keep records, but we are not so... What is the word? Anal about it, as you humans? The Skrith have songs commemorating their lives, added to as they grow older, describing their accomplishments. The Vironians simply remember, and when asked how, express disbelief that we can't remember every detail. As for the Shamblisi, their own language has no word or color for deception. They do not have the concept. They understand it now because of the Skrith, and I am ashamed to say my own people. But their physiology makes deception all but impossible. None of them would lie about who they are or what they've done. Not capable of lying, I mused, with a pointed look at Roberto Garcia. Sounds like it might put diplomats and politicians out of business. They can't lie to each other, Garcia corrected me, his smile cynical. That doesn't mean they can't lie to us. I snorted a humorless laugh and scanned the crowd automatically with what was becoming an instinct after a year and change as head of security. All the delegations had filtered into the great hall, shadows shifting over them in the soft and wandering light of crystal chandeliers, swaying in the light wind admitted by the upper windows. Slivers of shadow would fall across a cluster of bipedal shapes, and I could almost believe they were humans until the flickering light revealed them for an instant as ursine or canine or saurian. No one wanted to be the first to settle in at their table, I thought. Maybe there was some pecking order, some diplomatic game I hadn't been read in on, and it was impolite to be the first ambassador to sit down. With so many individuals from so many races dancing in diplomatic waltz, it was hard to keep track of my own people. They tried to stay at the far side of the room, as unobtrusive as someone wearing 400 pounds of powered armor could be. They weren't the only security here, though. No one had made mention of it, and no one was wearing any sort of uniform, but I developed a sense for this sort of thing. Every delegation had at least one individual who seemed extra watchful, not socializing, hypervigilant. That's not to say they were good at their jobs. I don't think any of the Alliance members had a clue of what real security was. And if their worst-case scenario came true and we were bad guys, they all would have been dead before they could lift a finger to stop us. But it's the thought that counts. Stop planning how to kill our allies, Julie whispered in my ear, and heat flushed in my cheeks. She really did know me too well. It's time, Garcia said, tapping a finger on his watch. The Skrith should be calling everyone to order in a couple minutes. We should get to our table. Maybe I should just circulate, I suggested. You know, keep an eye on things. That's what your guys in the armor are for, he reminded me. And God only knows how you got the Skrith to agree to have them in the room armed. He and Anunim Klaas are best buddies now, Julie confided. It's some heat big wolf man mojo that involved, for some reason, coming into our room in the middle of the night to let us know how sorry he was. Garcia raised an eyebrow and I flushed again. Okay, so everybody knew about me and Julie, but maybe Garcia wasn't part of everybody yet, and I was old-fashioned enough that I didn't want to announce the fact we were sleeping together to every State Department official who came along. Though I suppose, once we got married, most people would assume. Good to know. Garcia said, though I wasn't sure which revelation he was speaking of. Come on, June Pa's up first, and I don't want to miss the show. Humans and Helta were perhaps too much alike. 
Either that, or people like Delia Strawbridge and Roberto Garcia had been a bad influence on our old friend, because good God could he talk. After a preamble of greetings and honorifics nearly twenty minutes long, he started. We have called our allies, our friends, together this day for an historic occasion. It has been well over two centuries since we welcomed another race into our alliance. I blinked back awake after having nearly gone comatose for the first part of the speech. This sounded important. Junpa was on a raised platform four meters above the center of the hall. It looked more than anything else like a ziggurat, a step pyramid, and watching the Helta climb to the top had reminded me of a bighorn sheep traversing a rocky cliffside. If the hall had been perfectly flat, it would have made looking up at him a literal pain in the neck, but it was a gentle concave instead. At the point where the tables began, watching Junpa speak required only a slight lifting of the head. I understand that many of you may have trepidations, considering the disastrous events following our attempt to aid the Tavinians, but in our youth and ignorance we took on too much. Their culture was not ready for the technological gifts we bestowed on them, and we have all paid a price for our arrogance, none more so than the Helta. I would venture to say that we have learned our lesson from this failure. Junpa was delivering the speech in his own language, and thankfully each of the member races was having it translated at their own table. I worried at first that he'd have to rig up the whole flashing colors thing on the platform for the benefit of the Chamblisi, and I'd wind up having a seizure from the constant barrage of multicolored lights. The humans of Earth may appear similar to the Tavinians, but their history has gone down a different path. Many of you have seen this already. I have heard it said that the fact they are not a unified planet, that they have fought wars against each other, is a negative thing that proves them more violent. But I say to you, the reason for the fanaticism and utter ruthlessness of the Tavinians is because they are unified, and they have been for centuries. They are unified in conviction of the truth of their cause, of the supremacy of their religious and philosophical beliefs, because there has been no one to challenge it. They resort to war so easily, because the only wars between them were with primitive weapons that could, at their worst, destroy a village. When we gave them access to weapons which could devastate cities and even whole planets, they didn't hesitate because they had no experience of the horrors of modern warfare. It was a good speech, at least to my ear, and I had a suspicion Garcia had helped him to write it, which bothered me a little. Yeah, it sounded good to us and to the Helta, who, despite their differences from us, were the race most like us in the Alliance. But of the others, the Skrith we could count on, but the Vivronians and the Shamblisi weren't mammalian life. Or at least they hadn't been a few tens of thousands of years ago, no matter what the elders had done to them. Would this convince them, or would the logic be beyond their grasp? The people of Earth, particularly the Americans with whom we have dealt since the beginning, have had their struggles within their own borders and against other nations on their world. They have faced the utter devastation of modern warfare, and have chosen to prevent unrestrained war from ever happening again. Without aid from us, they were making advances to explore and populate their own star system, spending great amounts of their limited resources on the desire to learn. Would any of us have been able to do such a thing without the benefit of fusion reactors and the hyperdrive? Would any of us have even tried? Eyes turned our way, and I couldn't read them any more than I could have understood the thoughts of a lizard or an octopus, but their attention made me uncomfortable. I was being regarded not as an individual, but as a representative of my whole species, and I was acutely aware that I was not a good sample. We took a risk, Junpa went on. Perhaps a foolish one, but there is a saying among the humans of Earth. Desperate times call for desperate measures. We were pressed on all sides by the Tavinians forced out of one system after another, our shipyard seized, our people enslaved. Our entire society was in danger of being overrun, and make no mistake, yours would have followed. We have, so far, taken the brunt of the Tavinians' wrath, but they are a thorough people, 
and would not leave your worlds unconquered. And then we met the humans, the Americans. The very day we encountered them, they were sending a ship to their world's moon, and some of the members of that crew are with us here, General Michael Oliveira, Colonel Julie Nieves, and Major Andy Clanton, three humans I am proud to call my friends. We weren't asked to stand, thank God, but a sort of spotlight settled on each of us as our names were said. I wasn't 100% sure where it was coming from because I didn't see the light source, but a halo of light surrounded us, however it was done. At least no one cheered. We were followed into the system by a Tavinian cruiser. One-on-one, -on -one, held to ships such as my truth seeker have never been able to defeat the Tavinians. The Americans took control of our ship and destroyed the Tavinians. And then they returned control of the ship to us and invited us to visit their world, what we have come to call the Source. For it is the Source of all of us, of all life in the galaxy. And yet, it is also the home of a burgeoning population. Some of them do not appreciate its natural beauty and pollute it with their primitive power production and industrial wastes. But they try. Many try to stop this, to put limits in place. But when people would starve otherwise, how can a caring individual abide by such limits? So we have helped them. We gave them the knowledge they needed to perfect fusion energy, something they might have had on their own very soon anyway. We helped them to develop clean methods of production, help them to get their raw materials from their moon and asteroids instead of digging them out of the crust of their world. We did this for them, but we also did it for the Source, to preserve it as best we can, so that all may come to appreciate it as we have. I don't know where the holographic projector was, but the image that sprang to life above Jumpa's head was at least five meters across. It showed Earth from orbit, the classic shot I'd first seen as a kid in school, then dove into the atmosphere, buzzing over New York City quickly enough that it made the place seem actually pretty. It skipped about with editorial license, no Cleveland or Detroit, just going straight from the Big Apple to San Francisco and Seattle to Paris and Rome, Tokyo and Hong Kong, before getting to what the hell to knew would be popular. They started with Yellowstone and Grand Teton, which had been my suggestion. The towering mountains, the rivers, the forests, wolves and elk and bison and pronghorns in the Lamar Valley, grizzlies and black bear and flocks of geese. Then to Yosemite and the waterfalls, up to the Canadian Rockies, to Glacier and Banff, Vancouver Island, to Alaska. Alaska took a good five minutes, and I almost forgot where I was. So enthralled was I by the incredible beauty of the place. From there, the Helta drone traveled to Africa, the Serengeti, to the forests of China, the jungles of India, the Pantanal in Peru and Argentina, skipping over the cities because he told them about pollution, but we didn't really want to give them a down and dirty look at it. I scanned the audience, and every eye seemed to be fixed on the images, like churchgoers staring at the evidence of a miracle. This is what we sought to save. And as well, the Americans have also saved us. They had one ship, a ship they stole from the Tavinians and refitted with our help. Just one cruiser. And with just one ship, they have helped to free Helta systems and turned back a Tavinian fleet sent to conquer Helta Prime. And they have asked for nothing of ours in return other than our continued help to improve their planet, to make life better for those who had not enough, and not the luxuries you and I take for granted. They understand what the Tavinians do not, because our enemy lacks the perspective, the insight. The Americans realize they do not need to conquer our worlds. They realize that just being able to travel the stars gives them unlimited energy and resources for all, enough that none will want. Their only goal has been to keep our systems and theirs safe from the ravages of the Tavinians, and in this they have kept their word. I owe them my life and the lives of my people, and I would ask 
that you grant them the respect and consideration they have earned in these last few months. Garcia shot me a smile as Junpa slowly descended the staircase. I think that went great, he gloated. He's quite the speaker, Oliveira agreed, nodding with the appreciation only a Space Force general could have for long-winded oratory. Colonel Brooks snorted softly, covering her smile with a hand, but I still caught it. The Vironian ambassador passed Junpa on the way up and barely acknowledged his presence. I knew the Vironians were supposed to be aloof and laconic, but I was getting the impression that the other races were not really that fond of the Helta. The bipedal Saurian could have been any one of the Vironians we'd met, the males anyway. The males had a multicolored crest on the crown of their heads, which the females lacked, and there was sexual dimorphism as well. But between males, well, maybe if I hung out with them for a year or two, I would have been able to tell the difference between them. The Vironian stood at the center of the pedestal, hands hanging at his sides, eyes flickering back and forth. I expected his tongue to start darting out from between his lips, but apparently that was one habit elder genetic engineering had left behind. We disagree, he said without waiting to be introduced. Damn, Garcia hissed. He should have known, I thought. It was never that easy. Chapter 13 We Vironians are not known for our public speaking, the ambassador continued, and I thought there might have been irony in the translation. And I will keep my remarks short and to the point. Our brothers, the Helta, assure us that they have learned from their previous mistakes that these new allies of theirs, these humans of Earth, are not like the Tavinians, that they are not as greedy, not as grasping, and I do not doubt their word. Those lizard eyes speared me with an accusatory glare. Now, he swept a clawed hand around expansively, yet we do not make decisions for only now. In this body, we make decisions that will affect all our species for a thousand years. These Americans may not be of the same mind as the Tavinians, but they share their ephemerality. Their planetary society is evolving, as Junpa himself said. Who is to say what they will evolve into? Who is to say that they will not decide, in ten years or a hundred, that they should be the ones to lead our alliance? That we should be their servants and do their bidding? How would we oppose them if they are, as Junpa has said, so superior to us? and even the Tavinians in the ways of war. He made a gesture the translator explained to me was one of equivocation. I do not say yet that I reject their bid to join the Alliance, but I do say that I remain to be convinced. And with that, he descended the spiral staircase. Something felt off to me, something I couldn't put a name to, until Garcia leaned over and informed me what it was. Strange not to hear applause after a politician gets through making a speech. I nodded. The crowd wasn't the clapping sort. I wondered if the scrith were given to howling if a speech excited them. I was about to find out because Anu Nim Klaas was making his way up to take his turn. He stood silent at the center of the platform for a long moment, then raised one hand over his head, fingers curled into claws. I am Anu Nim Klaas of the Quarter Moon Clan, he cried, and I will be damned if the scrith in the hall didn't howl for him. The sound was haunting, raising the hairs on my arms, reminding me of the one time I had heard wolves howl in the wild. When the noise died down, Anu Nim Klaas let his hand fall, let his chin lower to his chest, his eyes, yellow and piercing, scanned the audience. I, too, once felt a Shah San, the ambassador from the Vironians. Interesting. The Saurian hadn't given his name when he spoke. I considered the Helta foolish for trusting a race so like our enemies. 
It is true that the Tavinians have struck the Helta more than the rest of us, but the Skrith are a close second, and we lack both the cruisers and the experience of our Helta brothers. The damage the enemy has done to us has been incalculable. He snorted, a sound my old dog might have made when something upset him. When they arrived here, they seemed to me to be arrogant and careless and I allowed the differences I should have expected from an unknown people who have had little contact with others outside their planet to anger me. I challenged this one. He inclined his head toward me. Andy Clanton, the one who protects their people to a blood hunt. You all know what this means. I expected him to fare as well as any of you might have. The translator relayed the derision in his words, but I might have been able to figure it out without help. Not only did he meet the challenge and beat me to the kill, he saved my life, at risk to his own, when he could have easily let me die, and he did not consider this anything of note. It was just his way. Now, I cannot say that all of the humans are like Andy. It may be that he is among the best of them, and their worst are even more dangerous than the Tavinians. Yeah, that might be exactly right, I agreed silently, remembering Chernabog. I cannot see into all of their hearts. I can only say to you that Andy Clanton is my friend, and I will not question his honor. They didn't howl for him at the end, which I hoped was a cultural thing and not a show of disapproval for his speech. Garcia clapped me on the shoulder, beaming. Great job, he told me. We've got two. We just need one more. Danny Brooks leaned in, frowning. Has no one ever warned you about the dangers of premature celebration, Secretary Garcia? The Chamblisi were up last, and I watched with a sort of horrified fascination as their delegate climbed the steps, seeming to ooze up them with legs that didn't walk so much as they undulated. I almost didn't notice Junpa edging around the tables to drop into a seat between Oliveira and Garcia. This will tell the tale, he informed us, indicating the octopus with the long-ass name that I could not at the moment remember. The Vironians are waiting until they see how the others go, as they always do. They are loath to make a unilateral decision. If the Chamblisi approve of you, so will the Vironians, with the weight of three to one against them. Great, I murmured. I leaned back so my mouth was even with Julie's ear and whispered even softer. The fate of humanity rests in the tentacles of a fucking talking octopus. Hey now, she replied just as quietly, a smile tugging at the corners of her mouth. Given the last few presidents we had, this might be an improvement. What? I asked, smiling not necessarily at her joke, but just because I was so damned happy to be around her. You're not a fan of Crenshaw? Ah, he's all right she allowed, shrugging. He's Navy, so I can't say too much bad about him, even if he was a SEAL. I guess if the choices were writing a book or going into politics, he chose... She laughed. Well, he chose both, but he's done okay. He's handled all this a lot better than those morons in the house. It worries me a little, I admitted, eyeing Garcia. He was having a quiet conversation with Junpa, but I didn't want him to overhear us. I mean, Crenshaw is a good man and he's done the right thing for the most part with the Helta. But if we were worried about the executive having too much power before, I shook my head. I mean, hell, he got the whole world involved in someone else's interstellar war, for God's sake. When we're spread through multiple star systems dealing with all these different races and their politics, how much power do you think the president of the U.S. is going to have? I think, Julie told me, that there's going to have to be a lot of pressure probably is already, and thank God we're not there for it, for some sort of vote to be held by all the nations on Earth to elect a leader who can deal with the aliens, something like a prime minister. That ain't gonna happen, I told her, not even a shred of doubt in the statement. We control the only starships in the world, all the alien weapons technology, the defense satellites, shit. Not even the Speaker of the House would be willing to turn over that kind of power to the French or the Germans, much less the Russians or the Chinese. I know. Her expression was bleak. That's what worries me. The one who stares at goats, or whatever the damned thing's name was, finally reached the top. His arms were writhing with constant motion, his beak-like mouth opening and closing, and my skin crawled. 
He was, I was certain, a very nice fellow, and I was just being speciesist. But it was hard to get over the whole business where he was an octopus. I dwell in blissful silence, the Chamblisi declared, reminding me of his name, and contemplate the universe. Some of you think this is merely my designation, something given to me so that you may know me from my fellows. It is not. It is the description of my purpose, the service I provide to my people. Hell of a job if you can get it, Julie said, just a bit too loud. Garcia shushed her. I examine things, the Chamblisi continued. I examine the universe and our place in it. I find perspective. I wonder, as I hear the words of our brothers and sisters, whether they might also benefit from the gift of perspective. In the long view, the perspective of the cosmos would tell us that our current troubles are less significant than the pulse of a variable star, less permanent than a comet headed toward its primary. We argue and fret and fight and die over control of star systems and of individuals when all of our striving is but an eye-blink. Even our creators, the elders, are only a fraction of the history of the existence of the universe. And given this long view, this understanding of how little our individual losses and lives matter, the greatest sin would seem to be impatience, haste. We are making haste to this judgment. We are impatient to say whether or not the humans of Earth should be included in our number. Our allies, the Vironians, have said that the people who call themselves Americans may, someday, turn out to be even worse than the Tavinians, and that may be. Our allies, the Helta, have said that the humans will someday be the best of us. Everything we aspire to and have not yet attained, and that may be, too. What will decide this is time, and I propose we must let more time pass. I would not call the people of Earth our enemies, would not shut them out of our dealings, but I feel the passage of time must decide whether they should be an equal partner in our alliance. There is an expression in English, Junpa said, sotto voce, that I have found deeply eloquent and unmatched in any other language in its brevity. Shit. Not what you were hoping for? Danny Brooks asked him. She seemed fairly equanimous about the whole thing. Me? I had that feeling like when the Raiders were winning by two with 30 seconds left, and they let the other team march down to the 30-yard line. Will they vote now? Garcia asked the Helta, ignoring Brooks's question. There will be a break for the meal, Junpa said. He was speaking English, so the translator didn't try to tell me his mood or his tone, but I didn't need to. He was as solemn as a Baptist preacher delivering the eulogy at an atheist's funeral. A meal, I objected, waving at the food on our table. What the hell's this, then? A snack, he informed me. The Skrith are very serious about food, as I'm sure you have discovered. And I respect that. I admitted, but goddamn, I don't know if I can eat anymore. I'd been picking at the shredded pork and something very close to sourdough bread all afternoon, and if I ate another bite, they'd have to roll me out of the hall. What are we going to do if the vote goes against us? Oliveira asked. He seemed out of place. I'd seen him in space battles, seen him negotiating with aliens and politicians and alien politicians, and he'd never looked this lost before. I mean, what are the options? If the Alliance votes against your entry, Junpa said, they will likely call for the removal of all Helta advisors, ships, and equipment from your star system. They're not getting the Jambo, Oliveira declared. We fought for it, and it's ours. The other hyperdrive ships, too. We took those, in battle. And you may be far enough along to finish the remaining ships, Junpa conceded. But there will be no more. Not from us. Those four will be all you will have unless the Chamblisi change their mind. It's not the end of the world, Julie mused. I mean, we have the fusion reactors, and I think we can make more of those. 
We have the shuttles to get stuff to orbit cheap, and I know we can make more of those, so we can still get resources from the asteroid belt and the moon, and we'll still have the orbital defense platforms. What we won't have, Garcia countered grimly, is membership in the Alliance. And believe me when I tell you that is the only thing holding our coalition together on Earth. If it turns out we're on our own, it's going to turn into every nation for themselves, trying to grab as much of the technology pie as they can. I stared at him in disbelief. He was getting dangerously close to letting the cat out of the bag right in front of Junpa. I wondered if I should let him, but Olivera had noticed it too. Secretary Garcia, he said, a warning edge to his tone. I'm sure we'll be able to settle our internal differences peacefully. Huh? Garcia started. Oh. Yes, of course. He shot an apologetic look at Junpa. Sorry. Didn't mean to feel sorry for myself. Danger of the job. Junpa, I said, impatience roiling in my gut. Unless it was indigestion. Look, you guys are clearly the muscle of the Alliance. I mean, you supplied them all with the hyperdrive to begin with. Wherever you got it. But that was a question for another day. Why do you have to just bend over and take whatever they vote for? Couldn't you just tell them you're going to maintain a relationship with Earth, and if they don't like it, they can go back to living in mud huts, or whatever they did before you showed up with all the goodies? We could, on a practical level, Junpa admitted. But I only say that to you this easily because of all the experience I have with your way of thinking. The truth is, the vast majority of Helton, even the ones who like and admire you Earth humans, would never even consider it. Our society is very bound by tradition, as you may remember from your last visit there. I eyed the Scrith servers bringing a massive platter of steaks to each of the tables, including the Helta one, despite their vegetarianism. What about the Scrith? I wondered. They don't seem so hidebound. Perhaps. Yet they are also one of the least technologically advanced of the Alliance races and often refuse to accept our idea of improvement because they prefer to be closer to nature. They might indeed risk expulsion by maintaining trade with you, but once the other worlds of the Alliance cut them off, it would likely be you providing technology to them, and not the other way around. The Chamblisi are the only other members of the Alliance with their own shipyards, and they share their output with the Vironians, which is why their votes will be in lockstep. I grunted, unsatisfied. After everything we'd done for the Helta, they still wouldn't go against the lizard men and octopus people. Still, Julie was right. Four starships were better than no starships. We could still colonize that habitable planet out at Alpha Centauri with four starships if we converted one of them into a cargo vessel. Maybe we could keep the coalition together by promising Germany and France and the UK their own continents or something. Hell, they'd probably be happier if we didn't have a commitment to fight the Tavinians anymore. The problem, of course, would be whether the Tavinians decided they still wanted to fight us. That was where all this could fall apart. We'd weaken them, but they weren't out of the game by any means. And if they managed to take down the Helta, I would say the odds were even as to whether they'd go after the Shamblisi next or come straight for Earth. And without us, the Tavinians would take down the Helta. Junpa had learned a lot about military tactics from us, but he was one commander. My eyes were wandering as I thought, and settled on one of the Space Force technicians. Oliveira had brought down a team to install our own satellite connections to the Jambo, not trusting local communications methods after our unpleasant experience on Helta Prime. Not that we thought the Skrith would do that to us, but fool me once, as the saying goes, shame on you. Fool me twice, I punch you in the face. That's how I learned it, anyway. I didn't recognize this particular technician, which wasn't unusual. I knew a lot of the shipboard personnel, but the roster changed from one mission to another as the military rotated crews through to get trained. This guy was tall, though, which I thought I would have remembered, like six foot four, with hair just barely regulation and startlingly blonde. His combat utilities were neat and sharp-edged, like only the utility uniform of a troop who will never wear them in ground combat can be. And yet, there was something about him that bothered me. He was walking along the far wall toward the main exit, glancing back as he went, as if he were waiting for something to happen, though that alone wouldn't have caught my attention. There was something about his stance, about his gait. 
American military personnel, even Space Force pukes, walk a certain way when they're in uniform, especially when they think officers and senior NCOs may be watching. Hell, Americans in general had a gait that was different than a Russian's, that was different than a Venezuelan's, and right on down the line. It was probably nothing, but I was the head of security, and being suspicious about stuff that was probably nothing was my job. I scrolled through a menu on my comm unit and touched my earpiece. Hey, Pops, you reading me? Five by five, fearless leader. What's up? You see that Zoomy heading for the main exit? I picked Pops out near the perimeter of the hall, facing straight toward my table. On your right? He turned, scanning across the far wall. Yeah, I got him. What's up? Maybe nothing, but he looks funky to me. Detail a couple guys to check him out, would you? Copy that. Give me a sec. Something wrong? Oliveira asked me, frowning at the one side of the exchange he'd heard. I don't know, I told him. I got a weird feeling is all. It's probably just me being paranoid. Preacher and Ringo moved off their assigned positions at the outer wall of the room to cut off the technician. I stood and started in that direction, not running, not giving any indication anything was wrong. But with each step, the urgency inside me grew. I wanted to tell myself it was an illusion, the sort of feeling I would get when I was a little kid and went to the bathroom in the middle of the night and ran back to my room after I turned the bathroom light off because the monsters would get me if I stayed in the dark hallway too long. In my world, the monsters were real, and I ran toward them. The tall, blonde technician very deliberately did not look at Preacher or Ringo, tipping me off more than if he'd actually stared at them, because if two guys in powered exoskeletons were marching toward me, I'd have been looking at them and wondering what the hell they were doing. He could only keep that up for just so long before the panic set in. It always did, no matter how well-trained someone was. They could act cool as ice as long as there was a chance of getting away with it, but once the trap was sprung, they ran. He ran. Preacher and Ringo took off after him, their swollen armor seeming in slow motion at first, as if they had to move the armor with their natural muscles instead of the servo motors, but gathering speed with each step. They'd catch him, and if they didn't... External patrol, I snapped into my throat, Mike. We have a tango and a Space Force technician's combat utilities heading out the front entrance. Secure him alive if possible, but do not let him get away. I didn't run after them. I should have. My conscience was nagging at me, telling me it was my duty, but the same instinct that had made me suspicious of the man in the first place froze me in my tracks between the Helta delegation's table and the Chamblisi. He'd been looking back this way. I'd seen his eyes going somewhere near these tables. Ms. Universe, which was as close as I was going to get to the name of the Chamblisi ambassador, undulated from her seat and regarded me with bug eyes, which could have been anything from curiosity to annoyance to sexual frustration for all I knew. What is occurring here, Andy Clanton? she asked, saying my name as if it were some sort of title. Is this a normal procedure for your people? I debated telling her some bullshit about a medical emergency, but we were trying to convince these people that we were worth having as allies, so I went with the truth instead. I believe, I told her, that we may have a Tavinian spy among us, Ambassador. My people are pursuing him, but I suspect he may have already committed sabotage. There are Tavinians among us. The Vironians, for all that they were close-mouthed, could be quite vocal when they wanted to be, and apparently had good hearing, since their ambassador had been a good thirty feet away when I made the pronouncement to Ms. Universe. How would they get here? Disguised as one of us, I admitted though I'm still not sure why. I think I'm sure, boss, Pop said, clomping up beside me, faceless and intimidating with his visor down. He leveled a finger at the Helta table. The suit's chemical sniffer is picking up traces of high explosives. Shit. I motioned for the Helta delegates to move. Junpa was already up, having been at our table, but he took a few steps closer when he saw me. I took a knee and ducked under the marble tabletop, scanning from the base upward, and stopping when I saw the lump of plastic explosives stuck at the juncture of the single metal support and the slight concave of the table. I couldn't see a detonator, but a single spike antenna stuck out of the thing, and if no one had caught the saboteur yet, out, I yelled, scrambling to my feet, hoping my translator would reach enough of them. Everyone out of this fucking room! They were moving way too slow, but at least they were listening. 
flowing away from the table like flood waters receding. And so was I, but I was too damn slow as well, because I had to wait for them. Pops grabbed me and pushed me in front of him, saying something about how I wasn't a private and I wasn't expendable. And then the world exploded. Chapter 14 Ow! I forced my eyes open and squinted at the blinding glare of whatever spotlight was shining in my face, my vision swimming in a sea of afterimages. I tried to sit up, but a hand on my chest kept me down, and I thought it had to be a suit of Svalin armor pushing against me because I couldn't budge it. Then my vision cleared, and I saw it was Julie. Don't get up, she insisted. You have a concussion, and you're bleeding all over the damn place. Medics are on the way. Corman. I insisted, the response groggy but automatic. No, it ain't fucking Corman, Pop said from somewhere above me. For one thing, these guys are army, not navy. And for another, even the navy doesn't call them Corman anymore because half of them are women. I turned my head toward his voice since my girlfriend wouldn't let me sit up. And that turned out to be a huge mistake because, as was previously mentioned, I had a concussion. Ow, I repeated. Pops' armor looked as if he'd had the camel paint sandblasted off of it, and I suddenly realized he'd put himself between me and the explosion. Thanks, I told him, my voice a dry rasp. Casualties? No dead. At least we don't think, which is something of a miracle. That wasn't Pops. It was Oliveira, and suddenly he was crouched down beside Julie. His dress uniform had seen better days, and I wondered if the blood staining his sleeve had come from me. There was something wet on the left side of my face, and I imagined I'd taken some shrapnel to the scalp. Scalp wounds bled like crazy. A haze passed across the general's face, and I wondered if the smoke was from the bomb or if my vision was graying out. We're still doing a count, but we think there were only about a half a dozen wounded, he winced. Unfortunately, Junpa is one of them, as people are taking him to the Scrith Medical Center. You'll be going there, too. Julie assured me. We just wanted our people to take a look at you first. There was a quiver in her voice, something no one else would have picked up on, the only indication she'd been scared. Don't worry, I told her. If you want to get rid of me, you'll have to divorce me. Quinn and the rangers got the runner, Pop said. You want him taken back to the ship? No, Oliveira answered the question for me. Mansoor is coming down here but I want to know how the hell he got here, because he sure didn't come with us. He's got a ship, I told them. I felt a little better, and I gently pushed Julie's hand away and sat up. Shit. I got a concussion, and I already know that. It's the only way. Junpa said it. This place isn't big on high tech. He probably snuck a lander down from a shuttle, got dropped here by one of their cruisers. They knew about this conference. How would they... Oliveira began but then shut his mouth. Oh, yeah, I confirmed. Oh. I could see now, and yes, it had been the smoke of the explosion. It was still floating across the room, obscuring the crystal chandeliers, drifting slowly toward the upper windows. The hall was deserted except for us and a few scrith searching through the wreckage. One of them might have been Anunim Kloss, but if he was there, he was too busy helping clear away overturned tables making sure they hadn't missed any victims to come talk to me. Where the Helta table had been was a charred, splintered hole in the sheet stone flooring. I blinked. How did that table not turn into a giant fucking frag grenade? I wondered. That should have killed a lot of people. That's what I thought, too, Pop said. But whatever the things are made of is pretty damn tough. He pointed across the hall. The bowl section flew off in one piece and landed about fifty feet that away in three pieces. Thank God for Scrith artisanal furniture, I mumbled. An army medic rushed toward me, carrying a musset bag loaded with a lot more high-tech goodies than Corman had carried in my day. And the first thing the fresh-faced kid did was still to pull out a piece of cloth and wipe the blood off my head. Just hold still, sir, the kid said, digging through his bag of tricks. I gotta check you for a concussion. I'll save you some time and confirm I have one, I told him. Hurry and patch me up, son. I offered Julie an apologetic tilt of my head. The Scrith Hospital is going to have to wait. I need to talk to our boy, the Tavinian.
Okay, I admit it. I let my girlfriend bully me into going to the hospital first, but only because Oliveira insisted on waiting for Mansoor's shuttle to land before we questioned the prisoner. That took over an hour, and in that time, the Skrith did something to me, under the supervision of the Helta, that made my headache go away. Maybe Patel could have told me what it was if he'd been there, but no one had thought to bring him along on this trip, and I'm fairly sure that Army Medic wouldn't have known. The Skrith doctors had a lot of patience and hadn't been talkative, leaving me in the isolated chamber with some sort of slimy goop still smeared on my head when they were done. I figured that meant I was good to go, and wiped my temples with my sleeve before I wandered out to try to find Junpa. He was laid out on what looked like a cross between a hospital gurney and an alien torture device, and he was naked, which would have been awkward if he wasn't also covered in fur. The blue-black hair on his lower legs was matted with blood, but the wounds that had produced it were already closing, and he didn't seem to be in pain. Junpa, I said, putting a hand over his. The Skrith doctor glared at me, but didn't say anything, going about her business, tapping something into a control screen beside his bed. Are you all right? I shall be, he said to me, his eyes unfocused, his voice faint. He turned his head to look at me, but the rest of his body moved not at all. Thank you for discovering the device when you did, Andy Clanton. Our whole delegation would have been killed, if not for you. I should have spotted it sooner, I said, bitter now that I could think clearly again without my head splitting open. Everything's fucked now. He made a noise which was the Helta equivalent of laughter. Everything was, as you say, already fucked, Andy. We do not have the votes. He let his head sag back into the cushion on the mattress. I had so hoped they would see the wisdom in adding your people to our alliance. I glanced around, making sure none of my people were within earshot. Oliveira had gone to meet the shuttle, and the Skrith made Julie wait outside. Brooks was sweeping the rest of the facility for any more infiltrators, and cross-checking every single member of our party to make sure they were who they said they were. I hadn't seen Garcia since before the bombing, but I assumed he was trying to politic his way through this. I looked around saw a pitcher of cut crystal on a stand beside the bed, filled with water. I pulled out my comm unit and dropped it into the liquid, then leaned close to Junpa. Maybe they're right, I said, as softly as I could, and still be understood by someone whose first language hadn't even originated on Earth. His eyes sought mine, puzzled. There's something I was ordered not to tell you, but I have a feeling your boys in the Alliance are going to hang us out to dry, and you're going to have to make a choice. You, not the Helta. You're going to think you owe us, and you're going to want to help us out even if your people don't. But I'm your friend, and I'm not going to let you do that without knowing the truth. He didn't say anything, just stared and waited. You know about Earth. You know we're not united. That America has rivalries and enemies. I told you about the Russians and the Chinese. You did. What have they done, Andy Clanton? We were keeping the Tavinian prisoner at the orbital construction base where we were building the hyperdrive ships. The Chinese and Russians infiltrated and took the prisoner and one of the ships. I explained it to him as succinctly as I could. He seemed to be numb, and I wasn't sure if it was the shock of my story or the pain medication he'd been given. That's how they knew of this conference. He was quick on the uptake, drugs or not. Junpa was always smarter than the average bear. How they knew to send their assassin. Yeah, it was our fault. I rubbed my fingertips against my temples. My head hurt again. If anyone had gotten killed, it would have been on us. I wanted to tell you the minute it happened. So did General Oliveira. Hell, even Garcia wanted to. Well, he said so anyway. With political appointees, you never know if they're just telling you what you want to hear. But we had orders not to do it because everyone thought the conference was too important to take a chance. I shrugged. I'm probably committing treason doing this. I don't know. I did know, and I was committing treason. Maybe I'd been a civilian too long to ever really go back to thinking like a military officer. Junpa closed his eyes, his chest rising and falling regularly. I thought he'd passed out, given into the drowsy stupor of the painkillers, that he would drift off, not remember anything I told him, and I'd be off the hook. But they fluttered open again and focused on me with such sharpness I knew he'd understood. Thank you for telling me the truth, Andy Clanton, he said. Thank you for being my friend. His eyes closed again, and this time he was out.
I retrieved my comm unit from the pitcher and shook the water off. The thing still worked. Amazing. I was old enough to remember when they'd been built in China, when it was like everything had been made there. That seemed like forever ago. One of the Scrith medics glared at me like he wanted to tear my throat out, and I took the hint. One crisis at a time. Chapter 15 Good to see you again, Major Clanton, Justin Mansour said, the corner of his mouth turning up. The feeling was not mutual. He nodded toward the Tavinians strapped to the examination table between us and the Helta medics hovering over him. Seems like old times. Mansour looked out of place here, still dressed for the street life in Caracas, his Hawaiian shirt loud and obnoxious, his jeans worn and faded. Only the boots gave him away. They were too expensive for the Venezuelans. The latest in hiking wear, made with materials from one of the new orbital factories. Why the hell did they bring you along on this mission? It's a good thing they did, isn't it? How would you have handled squeezing the truth out of this fellow without me around? I think we did just fine with the last Tavinian prisoner without your help, Mr. Mansour. Captain Lopez ground out, glaring at the CIA field officer from beneath dark bushy brows. Lopez was OSI, Air Force Office of Strategic Intelligence, and while I liked him, I would quite honestly rather have seen Army MI along, because what the hell experience did the OSI have in field operations? But yeah, he'd done all right with the last enemy we'd captured. I'd give him that. I was sent along for the sake of versatility, Captain Lopez, Mansour replied, not seeming to take offense at anything, ever. Someone gave me an order to come along in case I was needed, and here I am, in like Flynn with a great big grin. He tapped one of the helt on the shoulder, and the female bared her teeth at the uninvited touch. Is he ready? The drug has been administered, she said. It should take effect in a few minutes. The Tavinian looked uncomfortably like one of our own, still wearing combat utilities, his hair cut short, face clean-shaven. I wondered how hard it had been for him to consent to shaving it off. We hadn't come across any male Tavinian soldiers who hadn't had at least some semblance of a mustache. He was gagged, mostly because he wouldn't stop spitting on everyone, and metal straps held him down to the table, including one across his forehead. Tavinians were, I'd been told, notorious for headbutting. His blue eyes seemed out of focus, and I reached out and yanked down the gag, one hand cocked to punch him if he tried to bite me. He didn't. He was drooling, just a little. I nodded to Lopez. You go first, I told him. The language will sound more natural to him coming from you instead of the translator. What's your name? Lopez asked in Tavinian, which was very similar, we'd found, to modern Lithuanian. I heard it in English a second later via my earbud and the translation program in my comm unit. Vitosorix, he said, mumbling. I wasn't sure if it was a name or an insult until the translator repeated it more clearly and didn't give it an English equivalent, which clued me in. Son of Brito Martus. Ask him how he got here, Mansour said. Lopez's cheek twitched, and I thought he was trying to control an impulse to tell the CIA officer that he didn't need help. How did you come to be on this world, Vitusorix? he asked instead. It was my duty. The man wasn't looking at me or Lopez, or anything in particular, but scowled nonetheless. It was not the fate I would have chosen. A warrior dreams of dying in open, honest battle. But to kill the enemy by stealth is honored as well. Mansour rolled his eyes, making a get-on-with-it gesture at Lopez. How were you able to infiltrate this world? The OSI officer clarified. What method did you use to get here? A ship, Vitu Sorek said, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. How else? Oh, sweet Jesus, I muttered, covering my comm unit so I wouldn't try to translate that. I looked at the Helta. Is it the drugs, or is this guy just a huge moron? The medic didn't answer, which was just as well. How were you able to land undetected, Lopez said, as if he were speaking to a child, and pretend to be one of the crew of the American ship? We emerged from hyperspace in line with their star, he explained, and it seemed as if he was very pleased with their ingenuity. It was a nice change, I thought. 
dealing with an alien whose expressions and body language weren't outside the realm of our experience. It wouldn't have worked for the Helta, weak as they are, with their observation platforms. Even the Shamblisi have telescopes and satellites. But these Skrif, the damned dogs, they are primitive beasts. We knew it would work. I was launched toward the planet in a stealth pod, covered in foam rubber to avoid detection by their sensors. A parachute brought me the rest of the way down. What about the uniform? Mansoor wanted to know. The language. How did he know the conference was here and when it would be held? I was dolorously certain I knew the answer to all of those questions, but I remained silent and let Lopez ask them. The Earth people who came to us, the Tavinian admitted. I didn't know how much the drug loosened his tongue and how much he just wanted to brag. Getting a Tavinian to talk didn't seem much of a problem. Getting them to shut up was the hard part. They revealed all of the secrets they knew, held nothing back. Mansoor's head snapped around to the Helta medics. They need to get out of here, he said. The chamber was as close as the Skrith came to a cell, bare, windowless stone, and I was willing to bet the Skrith didn't go in for bugs, but... The cat's out of the bag now, Mansoor, I told him. They know. And of these two, I nodded at the medics. Don't speak enough English to understand. When they play the recordings of what the prisoner said to Junpa, he'll be able to figure it out. Plus, I added, if he goes into respiratory distress or something from the drug, it might help to have medics around. Mansoor didn't seem happy with that, but he nodded. All right, he conceded. Go on. I very carefully didn't sigh with relief, but it was a near thing. I might be off the hook. Now there was a plausible reason for Junpa to know about the Chinese besides me telling him. How many of you are there? Lopez went on. On this mission. How many landed with you? No one landed with me. This was my mission alone. Then how were you to escape? There was to be no escape, the Tavinian said, and I noted pride in the set of his face. I was to blend in as long as I could and cause as much damage as possible before I was discovered and killed. And there were no others, Lopez asked again, sounding skeptical. I was, too. If they could sneak one guy onto the planet, why not put down a dozen? Twenty. Only a few could learn enough of their language in time, Vitusorix explained. Their language, he'd said. Did he really not comprehend who we were? He seemed more out of it than Vercingetorix, the other Tavinian prisoner. We could not conceal many. There would be nowhere for them to hide unless we could pass for the enemy, the Americans. And we didn't know how many you would land, how many we could pass off as your people. Which made sense, but I still didn't believe it. And that was your entire plan? Lopez pressed him. To assassinate the Helta delegation and disrupt the conference? That was only one part of it. Again, he seemed damn proud of it, less an admission than a boast. Divide and conquer. Once we had split the alliance from the Americans, once we had made sure they were completely alone, both here and on the source, the planet they call Earth, we could move in for the final assault. Shit, Mansoor said. You lost most of your fleet at Helta Prime. I said, ignoring what I'd said earlier, letting my translator do the work. How would you be able to take Earth? The Americans have one starship. All we have to do is destroy it, and they're helpless. Their own enemies on the source will take care of the rest for us, and they will bow the knee to us in return for our help in defeating their enemies. We will have the source, as the elders intended, from the beginning. Even now, our forces wait at Alpha Centauri, prepared to strike. Mansoor met my eyes, and despite our differences, we shared the same stricken look. And when he spoke, it was for both of us. We have to get back. This is most disturbing, the one who goes chasing waterfalls said. Okay, I wasn't even trying anymore.
For an octopus, I told Julie, he has a gift for understatement. She didn't try to shush me. Even Garcia slumped in his chair, hopelessness written across his salesman's face, which was sad, like a puppy who's tried to get everyone in the house to play with him and been rejected. He'd been working the Shamblisi for hours, almost from the time the bomb went off. From what I'd overheard, they'd been less than receptive. There wasn't a trace left of the explosion. Even the table had been replaced. The trust, however, hadn't been quite as easy to restore. We'd interrogated the Tavinian for five hours, which had been four hours more than we needed. The health to drugs were very effective, and the Tavinians weren't big on keeping secrets anyway. Spies were nearly unheard of in their culture, though they were big on assassins. The Tavinian had copped to the whole thing. He didn't know the whole story, but he knew about the Chinese, knew the date and location of the conference had come from them. We hadn't shared that part with the Shamblisi, though I wasn't sure if it would have made any difference to their decision. They'd taken the stage first when the conference reconvened. It was late, much later than these things usually ran, but even the Vironians had allowed that these were emergency circumstances. I thank our new friends, the Americans, for detecting the enemy saboteur, Octopussy began with his usual charm. Were it not for their prompt action, many of us could have died, and we owe them a debt. I thought he might actually change his mind, but either the translators weren't good at representing equivocation, or he was just an expert at couching bad news in soft-serve words. I would that we could pay this debt by giving them membership in the Alliance, but such is not in our power. The enemy was able to infiltrate this conference because of their biological similarities to the humans of Earth. If we were to have regular dealings with Earth, the Tavinians could slip their assassins into our midst at will. We can't take the chance that such a thing might happen again. I would call for an immediate vote. I glanced at Garcia but he wasn't even looking at the Shamblisi. I tried Oliveira. Is anybody going to say anything? I asked him. Are we just going to sit here and take this? Garcia might not have been watching, but he was apparently listening because he answered. I've been saying something for hours, he told me, bitterness dripping off his words. There's nothing else to say. You mind if I try then? I was screaming inside my head, like some weird parasite had trapped me inside my own brain and was controlling my actions. If there was anything I didn't want to do more than getting endodontic work done on my teeth, it was public speaking. And public speaking in front of a room full of aliens didn't even bear consideration. But I was also desperate, and this was way too much like giving up without a fight. Go for it, Garcia said, dismissing both me and my chances with a wave. You can't make it any worse. Oh, don't go and underestimate my man like that, Julie said. The situation hasn't been invented that Andy couldn't make worse by opening his mouth. I rolled my eyes. She wasn't, I reminded myself, taking this any more lightly than I was. But snarkiness was her primary defense mechanism when everything was going to hell. Oliveira ignored her. Whatever you have to say, say it now. Ambassador, I said, coming to my feet. There had been some sort of procedural argument going on between the Vironians and the Skrith, and I'd interrupted it, but I didn't apologize. Will we be allowed to speak in front of the conference? I asked, not waiting to be recognized. I'd like to make our case before the vote is called. The Shamblisi looked down at me with a face so unreadable it might as well not even be a face. You may speak, he said, if one of the other delegations will agree to cede their time to you. The Skrith will give their time to the humans, Anu Nim Klaas said immediately. So let it be noted. The Chamblisi descended, and I had to wait until he was all the way down before I approached the steps. I mean, it was what the other speakers had done, but even if it wasn't, I didn't intend to try to squeeze past him and get knocked right off the stairs. You sure you want to do this? Julie asked me, her eyes serious. Oh, what the hell? I shook my head. Just one more check off the bucket list. Get shot into space on board a rocket. Meet aliens, go to another star system, meet the love of my life, speak in front of a multi-species galactic federation. The octopod ambassador cleared the steps and I began to climb them.
It took longer than I thought it would. I'd been impatient with all the different speakers taking their sweet time getting up to the platform, but it was quite a haul, and by the time I reached the top, I was wishing I'd worn my Svalin. And wishing there was a fucking guardrail. It was high up here, and I felt like one false step would end with me on the ground, with everyone debating if it had been the embarrassment or the broken neck that had killed me. I shot a look at Junpa, but he wouldn't meet my eyes. Ambassadors of the Worlds of the Alliance, I said, and felt a bit of a shock when I heard my words amplified through the hall. I didn't see any microphone, and I wondered how they pulled that trick off. I'm Major Clanton of the United States Marine Corps. I serve as the chief security officer on the ship we call the James Bowie, and it is my responsibility to prevent such attacks as we experienced earlier today. The failure to detect the Tavinian before he had a chance to plant the explosives was mine and mine alone. We were complacent, believing there was no way the enemy could insert their agents onto your worlds. Now we know better, and I will not make such a mistake in the future. We will verify every Earth human with biometrics prior to any contact with races of the Alliance. We will have strict accountability, and I swear to you on my honor that I will not allow this to occur again. That was the easy part, throwing myself on the grenade. I wasn't even shining them on. I'd fucked up, and even if no one else blamed me, I knew better. Chief of Security either meant something or it didn't. If I didn't want it to be a joke, I should have been prepared for days like today. The next part, though... We have interrogated the prisoner, I told them. We used a special cocktail of drugs the Helta developed to get the truth out of him. This attempted assassination was intended to do exactly what it did, disrupt this conference and turn you against us. The Tavinians don't fear you. They know you can't defeat them. They don't fear the Helta. They fear us. They know down in the deepest parts of their soul that we can beat them because we've done it every time we face them. So, the first part of their plan was driving a wedge of mistrust between us. And mission accomplished, I suppose. The second part of their plan is to conquer us, to seize our world, what we call Earth and you refer to as the Source. They've made common cause with elements there who are our rivals. I couldn't see Oliveira and Garcia well from up here, but I could imagine their frowns at my admission of what had to already have gotten out. The Helta weren't much better at keeping their mouths shut than the Tavinians. Their forces are in place already, and however the vote goes tonight, we'll be flying back to face them. They know they don't need to overwhelm our defenses. We have but one operational warship. All they need to do is destroy it, and Earth is theirs. I paused, trying to think how I was going to say this without it sounding like a threat. Fuck it. Ain't no way. Just say it. You're worried about what we humans might do if you continue to assist us in developing our technology to your level. I'm telling you right here tonight, what you should be worrying about is what happens if you don't. America isn't perfect, and neither are our allies. We make mistakes, we elect the wrong people, we lie to each other when the truth would serve better. We allow our self-interest to blind us to what is right. And yet, I see all these same failings in you. For all your advancements, you haven't perfected yourselves, and you won't. Because to live and grow is to make mistakes and overcome them. But if you abandon us now, there will be no chance to overcome our mistakes or yours. Because while I disagree with the goals and methods of our rivals back on Earth, I also respect their intelligence, their inventiveness. If those traits are paired with the ruthless determination of the Tavinians, together they will roll over you like the tide. Because the Chinese and the Russians may not be able to manufacture hyperdrives any more than the Tavinians can, but they can steal them just as surely. And they have the tens of thousands of years of experience and tactics and strategies learned in our wars to put in service of your enemies. They will think up new ways to use your drives and your weapons, ones you've never dreamed of. They'll lay waste to your worlds to eliminate the threat of your existence, and when they're through, there will be no alliance. There will be none of you left other than the ones they keep for slaves. Where the hell was this coming from? I hadn't written anything down, hadn't given so much as a minute's thought to making the speech, but it flowed out of me as if I'd rehearsed it in a mirror for a week. It isn't often that we can know in advance that a moment is the moment, 
the time when we can decide our future, when the paths are so clearly delineated. I am a student of Earth history, and there were very few times in our past when the men and women who were part of a historic event knew what they did that day would change the future. This is one of those moments, and I wonder if you understand the weight of your decision. I shrugged, though I didn't know how well it would translate. You may think this is a threat, but it's not. We'll be just as dead as you. I, and everyone with me here today, will go down fighting before we let the Divinians control our world. The war will be over for us, and I can't think of a better way to go out. It's you who will face the consequences, you and your people, you and your worlds, you and your way of life. It'll be gone, and this galaxy will be Tavinian. I tilted my head. For a while. Because as fierce and relentless as the Tavinians are, the people of my world are smarter and more cunning, and it will only be a matter of time before the Russians or the Chinese have the Tavinians working for them. Either way, there won't be any room for you. I swept a hand across them as if brushing them out of reality. Maybe we'll go bad on you, and maybe we won't. But you have my word that if we are part of your alliance, as long as I'm alive, I'll do everything I can to help you, to make sure you grow beside us. It's the only guarantee I can make 100%, with no caveats. Not my government, not the military, me. I frowned, sought out Junpa, and he finally met my eyes. I give you my word as a Marine, which means more to me than any of the ways I identify myself, more than any other oath I could give. I leave unkeepable promises to politicians. There was more I could have said, but I would have been repeating myself, and that was something else I left to politicians. Thank you, Anunim Kloss, I said to the Skrith ambassador, for allowing me to have my say. And then I headed down the stairs, down to where Julie waited for me with a gentle squeeze of my arm and a kiss on the cheek. Though whether it was pride at what I said or consolation because it wouldn't do any good, I wasn't sure. No one replaced me on the platform. There was nothing left to say. Chapter 16 is this alcoholic? I asked, staring into a bowl of something as red as blood. I was hoping it was alcoholic and not actual blood. With the scrith, you couldn't be sure. I think so, Garcia said, taking an experimental sip and making a face. Not good alcohol, but probably alcohol. He looked like he needed it. The vote had been called shortly after I'd come back down the stairs, and each delegation had retired to private rooms to discuss things amongst themselves before casting their votes via an electronic system. That had been nearly two hours ago, and I was about to fall asleep waiting for them. I thought about whether I should try it. I hadn't drunk anything alcoholic in a long time. I hadn't known for sure whether I was an alcoholic, but didn't want to take the chance, and I'd quit cold turkey. But shit... This was some sort of alien blood liquor. I sipped from the bowl, wishing the scrith used cups. I felt like I was drinking the last of the milk from the cereal when I was a kid, if the milk had been a wine cooler. I made a face at the taste, but kept sipping because what the hell else was I going to do? I don't think my dad waited this long to find out the results of the 2000 presidential election. Don't like computer voting, Garcia said, taking another drink. Too easy to hack. I'm fairly sure they'd know if their votes were hacked, Olivera said, perhaps too tired or maybe too testy to have a sense of humor about much of anything. You did your best, Clanton, Garcia went on, as if he hadn't heard the general. It wasn't a bad speech. He thumped his chest with a fist. From the heart. I like that. We need to get going, Julie fretted, checking her comm unit for the umpteenth time and the third time in the last twenty minutes. God knows how long we have before the Tavinians arrive or what the hell is going on at home. I already have Colonel Brooks loading the Rangers up on Shuttle 2, I told her. Pops and the team are going to accompany us back to the port after the vote. We can't leave before the vote's announced, Garcia told her. What difference does it make if we know they'll be voting against us, she demanded. An edge in her voice I knew she was already regretting. I squeezed her hand, and she sighed. Sorry, Mr. Secretary. Yeah. We know it'll go against us, he admitted, but in my job you have to take the long view. Maybe someone will change their mind tomorrow, or maybe five years from now. 
If we head back to face everything the Divinians have left with just the Jambo, I said, I don't think we have a long view. Maybe not, but that's you guys' game. This is mine. A door scraped open across the hall, and the delegations filed back into the room. No one spoke until they were all in place at their tables. Not to us, but not to each other, which I assumed was some sort of ritual thing. When every member was seated, Anu Nim Klaas walked to the base of the stairs, but didn't ascend them. He made the announcement for the benefit of all, but his eyes were fixed on me. The motion to allow the humans of the Earth Coalition into our alliance has been voted upon. The Helta and we, the Skrith, voted yes. The Shamblisi and the Vironians have voted no. Passage requires the vote of three of the four members of the alliance. Therefore, the motion is defeated. Anunim Klaas put his hand out to me in a gesture I didn't recognize, and the translator informed me it was one of grief. If it were up to me alone, Andy Clanton, I would assemble every ship and every warrior we have to accompany you back to your home system and fight alongside you. But a decision of such gravity would have to be made by the Skrith Senior Council, and convening them will take days. I am distraught at the lack of fidelity to our friendship that I have shown you. He raked his claws across his bare chest where his vest parted, hard enough to draw lines of blood. He threw back his head and howled mournfully, and the other scrith at his table joined in, the otherworldly sound echoing through the chamber. I know you would help if you could, brother, I told him. I wish I could say it was because his demonstration had moved me, but mostly it was all I could think of to keep him from slashing himself again. Who knew werewolves were cutters? I can help. Junpa said, giving the Shamblisi the Helta equivalent of the stink eye. I can't bring the full might of the Helta with me, for like Anunim Klaas, I would need to return home and seek the approval of the Prime Facilitator. But I have the Truth Seeker, and all aboard her, and I pledge them to the defense of your system, as you came to the defense of ours. The one who shall not be named because I couldn't remember it rose from her seat and waggled her tentacles so wildly at Junpa that my translator didn't even try to interpret the motion. This is a violation of the spirit of the Alliance. I could barely hear the translation in my earbud over the Shamblisi's screech, and her colors were pulsing from deep purple to black, which I assumed was not good. For the Helta to aid these creatures in defiance of our vote is to declare that our membership holds no value for you. To the Helta, your membership and your opinion hold great value, Junpa countered, eyeing the octopod with bared teeth. To me, they mean nothing. I am the master of my ship, and I shall do with her as I see fit. If my people wish to punish me for this, well... To quote my friends, the Americans, they'll need a long fucking ladder. The Shamblisi's response was a squeal my comm unit couldn't translate. Thank you, I told Junpa, offering him my hand. He was, I understood, even if the other races didn't, volunteering to die beside us. It would have been an incredible gesture for a human, but I knew for the Helta it was even more meaningful since fighting against hopeless odds was a foreign concept to them. Of course, he said, his grip firm in mine, and he attempted a human smile. What are friends for? It felt good to be back on the Jambo. On her bridge, leaning against the railing behind Oliveira's command station and watching the Skrith homeworld shrink behind us on the main screen, I could almost make myself forget what a disaster the whole trip had been. It seemed surreal, a fever dream. I hadn't gone elk hunting with a spear or become blood brothers with a wolf man. That didn't happen in real life. I'm standing on the bridge of a starship about to jump into hyperspace. That doesn't happen in real life either. I stifled a yawn, exhaustion dragging at me. Once we jumped, I was going to grab some sleep no matter how dire the situation. I wasn't going to be making sound decisions unless I closed my eyes for a couple of hours. I didn't count getting blown up and losing consciousness as sleep. Incoming transmission from the Helta, General, the communications officer announced almost before she could settle into her seat. Boot it up, 
Oliveira ordered her with clear annoyance, slipping his tablet back into the holder affixed to his armrest. The Helta delegation had lifted off shortly after us, and their ship had to be breaking orbit by now. I wasn't surprised they were calling already, since we hadn't had time to discuss anything before we left the planet. Michael Oliveira, Junpa said, his face occupying a third of the screen, an image of the monolithic mass of the truth seeker beside it. I do not mean to sound churlish, but I feel compelled to ask. Do we have a strategy beyond rushing headlong back to your system and hoping for the best? I snorted a laugh, trying to conceal it behind a cough with questionable success. Captain Junpa, Oliveira replied, slitting his eyes at me. I think Major Clanton has been a bad influence on you. Andy Clanton told me more than once that he is a smart-ass reprobate whom I should not emulate, Junpa agreed, which would have been hurtful if it hadn't been true. But I am sorely lacking in human role models who trust me enough not to lie to me. Ouch. Junpa might have forgiven us, but he clearly wasn't ready to forget. Oliveira's face twitched as if the Helta had slapped him, but he didn't rise to the bait. The Tavinians, he said, his voice tightly controlled, may be staging at some point along the route to Earth. My plan is to pop out in each system and check for enemy activity. He threw a hand up in frustration. I know it's going to slow us down getting back, but as you say, we need something better than charging in headlong. I'm betting they'll use Alpha Centauri. We know they have an observation post in the system, so it would make sense. We might be able to catch them with their pants down. Surprise is a force multiplier. Force multiplier, Junpa repeated. This is one of those words that my translator does not recognize, and I have yet to learn the meaning of. It means, I supplied, that surprise can make up for the fact we're going to be badly outnumbered. And if you're wrong, Junpa asked, if we are too late and they're already in your solar system... I have accepted the idea that I and my crew may face death in this venture, but I would prefer to be able to tell them it isn't a certain thing, and it would be a boon to my own peace of mind if I knew we weren't throwing our lives away on a hunch. We'll come out of hyperspace in the outer system and reconnoiter. There's no point in strategizing with no intelligence, but we have one advantage— their alliance with the Chinese and the Russians means they won't just carpet-bomb the planet. They're going to be waiting for us, and if we can figure out where they are, we can try to split them up and pick them off. Oliveira sounded a lot like the coach of my high school football team when we faced the defending state champs in the first round of the playoffs. They beat us by four touchdowns. Very well. I assume you wish to scout the Alpha Centauri system with identical stealth. Yeah. What that Tavinian assassin said about coming out in line with the star seems like a good idea. If the enemy is there, I have to assume they're going to be near the habitable, because that's where they left their spy satellite. We'll affect the hyperdimensional translation about two light seconds from the habitable, right in line with Alpha Centauri A, which should disguise our gamma signature. Then we're going to try something our research and development teams have been working on. I'm going to send you the specs before we jump, so you can adjust your dry field accordingly. Adjust it for what? Oliveira smiled, clearly pleased with himself. We figured out a way to adjust the dry field to distort the thermal and spectroscopic output from the ship. It can't make us invisible, obviously, because there's no way to stop the thermal output, but it sure as hell can spread it out, hopefully enough to keep them from detecting us. And when did you intend on sharing this discovery with us? The question took Oliveira aback. He was used to Junpa acting like the little brother in their relationship, I supposed. It hasn't been used yet, he said, as close as I'd seen him to dithering. We only started testing it a couple months ago. They just gave us the specs before we left for the conference. I hadn't heard about it either, and I wondered if it would make Junpa feel any better if I told him that, but I decided for once to keep my mouth shut. I suppose better late than never. As you say, send us your coordinates for the planned entrance into the Alpha Centauri system. We will meet you there. The screen went dark, and I saw more than one of the bridge crew looking back and forth from the screen to Oliveira, their eyes wide. He's pissed, Julie said, never one to mince words. You think? Oliveira snapped. 
His glare bored into me like the lasers the Helta used to drill into asteroids. Major Clanton, he said, pushing up from his chair. A word in private, if you would. I cringed a little and followed him off the bridge, glancing at Julie. She mouthed good luck at me, which made me feel so much better. Oliveira's long, deliberate strides tried very hard to leave me behind, but I managed to keep up with a shuffling half-run until he stopped so abruptly that I nearly collided with him. He pushed open a hatch and gestured inside. It was a storage closet, dimly lit and packed with cleaning supplies, because you just can't have a military ship without enlisted troops constantly cleaning it. There was barely enough room for both of us to squeeze in. He shut the hatch and rounded on me, his dark eyes reflecting the dim light. You told him, you stupid motherfucker, didn't you? Don't bother to deny it. Okay, I acceded. I won't deny it, which wasn't exactly the same thing as admitting it, but I didn't think he cared. They would have found out anyway. They did. That doesn't fucking matter. He punctuated each word with his finger, jabbing into my chest, and something hot flared up with each poke. I had to remind myself he was a general. Then I had to remind myself again. We had orders from the fucking president. Do you understand what that fucking means, Clanton? I understand a lot of things, sir, I growled at him, leaning forward. I was a subordinate, but I was about to get very insubordinate. I understand that without Junpa, we'd be stuck in our fucking system, helpless. I understand that he's taken one chance after another for us, defied his ruler, his prime facilitator, to do it. Hell, we fucking killed one of his prime facilitators. My fucking fiancé shot her. And how the hell do we repay him? We lie to him. We keep things from him, things he needs to know. We're fucking lucky he doesn't haul off and leave our asses here. Your fiancé, he repeated, clearly surprised. When the hell did that happen? I blinked at the abrupt change of gears. The night after the blood hunt. Well, congratulations, he said, offering me a hand. I took it apprehensively, but he didn't pull me into a left hook, just shook my hand. Then he sighed and tilted his head to the side, cracking his neck. I should fucking throw you in the brig, he said. But fuck it, it's water under the bridge, and we're probably all going to be dead in a few days anyway, but goddammit, Andy, this is just the kind of shit I was worried about when we brought you into this shit. You gotta decide, are you in the military or are you a civilian? And what the fuck are you smiling at? I couldn't help it. Y you said brig. That's a Navy thing. It's going to be the Space Navy eventually. You might as well just give up. God give me strength, he said, yanking the hatch open and stalking back up the passageway. I was still grinning. He said brig. Chapter 17 Is it working? I wondered. Oliveira squinted, the muscles of his jaw clenching, which I'd learned was an effort not to roll his eyes. I'm sure you'll be among the first to know. Three days in hyperspace had at least offered me a chance to get some sleep. It had also offered us all a chance to worry, and it felt like everyone had taken advantage of the time to do as much of that as they could. By the time we jumped out into Alpha Centauri, I think I'd gone over every possible scenario a dozen times with Pops and the team, and coordinated every single possibility with Colonel Brooks and the shuttle flight crews. Which was one of the reasons I was wearing full Svalin armor and carrying a KE gun on the bridge when we made the jump, despite no indication we were going to launch a dismounted operation. Oliveira had been right about one thing. There were Tavinian ships staging at Alpha Centauri. The sensors picked them up almost immediately after we jumped, which meant if this dry field trick didn't work, they were going to see us pretty damn quick, too. The truth seeker just translated, the tactical officer announced. Davis didn't seem as keyed up as the rest of us. Maybe that was just because I didn't know him as well and couldn't read it. Or maybe he was just more chill because he had his finger on the trigger of our biggest gun and knew at least that he wouldn't die without shooting back. She's implementing the dry field modification. Good. At least we could see if it worked when she did it. I had this irrational fear that we were really just sitting here in full view of the enemy with our dicks hanging out, even though I'm sure our ship's sensitivity officer would have considered the idea sexually regressive and patriarchal. Davis sighed almost imperceptibly, but it was the first indication he was worried. Yeah, it's working. 
I can tell she's there, but I know what I'm looking for. If the enemy looks this way, she's going to look like maybe a gas cloud or gravitational distortion. He shrugged. As long as they don't get too close. Okay, Captain Davis, Oliveira said. Tell me what we're dealing with here. How many of them are there? Davis manipulated something at his control station, and the sensor display replaced the optical view of the third world out from Alpha Centauri A. It looked like we'd just zoomed into the world, but I knew from having it patiently explained to me by Julie that it was actually a computer simulation based on data from the sensors. Not radar or lidar this time, not when we were trying to remain undetected as long as possible. We were using passive sensors, thermal, spectroscopic, and gravimetric, which was something no human had even known existed before the Helta came along. It was very handy when dealing with enemy starships because the drive fields emitted gravimetric energy. The ship's computer was a combination of the best quantum cores the Helta had to offer, and a GUI designed by the best software engineers in the private sector, thanks to Daniel Gatlin. And thank God for them, because dealing with a graphic user interface designed by government engineers wasn't worth considering. This one was sophisticated enough to take all the sensor information and turn it into an image we mere humans could understand. The red halos around the Tavinian cruisers were for our benefit, to show us they were tangos. But the image of the wedge-shaped silver megaliths were made for our consumption as well, a graphic representation of what was the gravimetric equivalent of a radar blip. Holy shit, I said half under my breath. I didn't think they had that many cruisers left. Oliveira said in dolorous agreement. There were a dozen of them, clustered in one of the Lagrangian points between Alpha-3 and her moon, riding the gravitational stability there as they prepared for the final assault, the one that would get us out of their hair forever. Can we take that many? I asked him. Just us and the truth seeker? Not at once, he admitted. But if we can pick off a few here... The expression on his face was as close to hopeless as I'd seen. Well... Hell, we have to try anyway. Communications, get me Captain Junpa. I was surprised they could still get a signal to him through the stealth effect of the drive field, but I guess that was something else the R&D crews had been working on. They're here, Junpa said without preamble as he appeared on the main screen. As you said, they might be. What is your intent, Michael Oliveira? I'm going to micro-jump right into the middle of them, Oliveira told him. Too close for them to mass fires on us without risking hitting their own ships. We'll have time to fire the impulse gun at one of them, which should be a short kill. Maybe fire the particle cannon at another before we jump back out. We're going to head sunward, that is, in the direction of Alpha Centauri A, with our micro jump out to keep their attention on us. Then you come in behind us and do the same. We can take out two of them, almost 100%, before they have a chance to react. A sound plan for two out of twelve. What about the other ten? Three days in hyperspace had not, apparently, taken the edge off of Junpa's peak, and I wondered if anything could. He was paying back the help we'd given his people, and to some extent, because of our personal relationship, but I had a sinking feeling he might never fully trust us again. We may not get them all here and now, Oliveira admitted. We can only do so many micro-jumps in a row and they know enough at this point to deploy in guard formations against them. I figure we get the two, force them to come after us. With the impulse guns, we might be able to take out two more before we're forced to jump to the edge of the system and regroup, but the goal is to attrit them as much as possible before they move into the solar system. Our static defenses there will give us some advantage, but not against a dozen ships. We have to winnow down those numbers. That is sensible. Junpa agreed, though I thought I detected some reluctance in the words. Lead us in, James Bowie. We will follow you. Junpa's face disappeared from the screen, and Oliveira sighed heavily, as if he'd been holding his breath. Out fucking standing, he said to no one in particular. Helm, micro jump in 120 seconds. He traced a line on the touchscreen at his command station, and a streak of red appeared in the center of the Tavinian formation. Right there or as close as you can get us. Tactical, as soon as we jump, you have helm control. Get me a kill and get it fast before they can react. The second we fire, I want another micro jump ten light seconds toward Alpha Centauri A. We clear on the concept, ladies and gentlemen? Aye, sir, Julian Davis said almost together, 
I tried not to laugh, but I couldn't help it. They were both former Navy, and I'd recruited them into my grassroots movement to turn the Space Force into the Space Navy and the Rangers into the Space Marines. I blame you for this, Clanton, Oliveira warned me, though he couldn't conceal the beginnings of a smile. He touched a control on his armrest, and when he spoke again, it was on the PA speakers and the earpieces of our comm units. Attention, all personnel. This is the commander. Secure for micro jump in 60 seconds. Strap in and prepare for zero gravity. Which we dearly hoped wouldn't happen, since that would mean either a total power failure or the drive field generator had exploded. But we couldn't ignore the possibility. We ready? Oliveira asked, scanning the bridge crew. Status. Coordinates are set, Julie confirmed, her fingers dancing over the controls. The jump out is calculated and pre-programmed. Ready to hand helm control over to tactical. Tactical is ready, Davis said. Capacitors are charged. Ready to take helm control at your go. Engineering is a go. Damage control is a go. Flight ops is a go. And it was my turn, despite the fact that I do nothing but sit on my hands the whole time. Security is a go. Jumping in ten, Julie said. But she didn't count it down the whole way. She had complained to me in private that counting down was an Air Force thing, and one of the main reasons she'd gone with Gatlin Aerospace instead of NASA. In five. And jumping now. Entering hyperspace for a micro jump wasn't the bad part. I'd figured that out after about the fifth time I'd done it. Entering was the same as usual. Well, if entering hyperspace could ever be said to be usual. What a world. Anyway, entering was the same. But jumping back out within a second had a sort of whiplash effect, both physically and mentally. It always hit me hard, but thank God Julian Davis weren't as badly affected, because our lives were in their hands. Uh, have helm control. Davis didn't have quite the eternally calm fighter pilot voice Julie did, but he gave it his best leftover Navy bridge crew enthusiasm. His voice was the first thing to penetrate the haze over my brain but the flares of light across my vision cleared quickly, and the image on the main view screen made me wish they hadn't. I knew the image was magnified, but it looked as if we'd emerged from hyperspace right in the middle of the Tavinian globular formation, and the cruiser directly ahead of us was so damned close that all I could see of it was a stretch of solid gleaming silver, the polished surface reflecting the glow of the primary star. I clenched my teeth in my asshole and wished to hell there was something I could grab onto. We were moving left to right across the face of the thing, and I just knew, more than I knew my own name and the love of my son, that we were about to take a half a dozen particle cannon or laser blasts right in the teeth. Firing! The ship rocked from the violent expulsion of a tungsten slug the size of a sports coupe from the electromagnetic launcher that was just the first stage of the weapon. Then, the drive field got a hold of the thing and accelerated it to a good fraction of the speed of light. Ideally, we should have tried to line it up with two of the ships and make the most of it, but we had scant seconds before they reacted to our presence and filled us full of holes. We took the shot we had, and were glad of it. We were close enough that the expanse of bare hulls seemed to disintegrate into a supernova of light and heat, which was close enough for government work to what actually happened. The cruisers were huge ships, but that much pure kinetic energy transferred into their hulls split them in two in an explosion of plasma as hot as the heart of a star. Splash one, Oliveira said, betraying his Air Force fighter pilot past. Fire and particle cannon, Davis added, almost as an afterthought. Control to helm. I couldn't even see what the particle cannon hit past the glowing nebula of what was left of the cruiser, and I didn't care that much, because I knew what was coming next, and it was going to suck. Initiating micro-jump, Julie said, just a hint of a regret in her voice, as if she was trying to apologize for the misery which she was about to cause us. Or maybe just me. I was egotistical enough to think she might be talking to just me. I tried to forgive her, but it wasn't easy after a grenade went off inside my sinus cavity. At least, that was how it felt. The psychic shrapnel seemed to slice through my inner ear, and I would have fallen to my knees if I hadn't locked the suit in place before we jumped. The sensation of toppling over without actually moving was uncanny, like the hypnic jerk from waking up from a half-sleep. The feel of a fall ended abruptly by the surface of the bed. And I'll be damned if Davis still didn't recover from it immediately, like the whole experience didn't bother him at all. 
We are ten light seconds out from Alpha 3, he announced, though that was really Julie's job. I could see the planet now. Before, it had been off our starboard shoulder, and I'd been too absorbed with the Tavinian ships to pay any attention to the view of it in the side screens. But it was half of a blue marble on the main viewer, the dark side of the sphere facing away from the twin stars, her moon invisible on the other side of her. We were about eight times as far away from her now as Earth was from the sun, and there was no way we could see the Tavinian ships with our optical telescopes, but the gravimetric sensors had longer range, with the added bonus of detecting waves that traveled around 15,000 times the speed of light. And the representation of their signal by the computer was nearly as real as the optical images we'd seen only moments before, right down to the expanding sphere of white light that had used to be a Tavinian cruiser. They were moving now, turning toward the direction we'd jumped, and I could sense their confusion, almost hear the arguments back and forth between ship captains trying to decide if they should jump or come after us with their dry fields. They haven't seen the truth, Seeker, Davis said, half a pronouncement and half a prayer. They hadn't, and when she appeared out of hyperspace just a few miles away from the ship closest in to Alpha 3, they didn't react until she'd fired. The discharge of the impulse gun would have been invisible on an optical feed, but the computer simulated with a solid red line connecting the Helta cruiser to the enemy ship, until that enemy ship ceased to exist. I tried to imagine what it was like for them, if the end was instantaneous or if they had time to realize what was happening before the wave of ionized gas turned them into burnt cinders. I hoped it was quick, because I wouldn't want to know. Splash two. Michael Oliveira sounded pleased with the outcome of his strategy, but all I could think was, get the hell out of there, Junpa. He wasn't stupid, was probably the best starship captain the Helta had, probably better than anything the Tavinians could muster up after his time training with us. But that didn't mean he couldn't fuck up, didn't mean the micro-jump couldn't have scrambled his helm officer's brain just enough to slow them down a second too long. A second is an eternity in a battle, if it's the wrong second. I breathed a sigh of relief at the warp corona, even before Davis made the announcement. They jumped, he said, and I restrained myself from responding, no shit, only with great difficulty. I'd expected them to reappear immediately, from the impression I'd had during our own micro-jumps of hardly any time at all passing between entrance and exit, but it took a count of ten before a second warp corona marked their exit. They hadn't come out right beside us as I thought they would, though I didn't recall that ever being discussed. Instead, they were a good distance off to our port. Well, at least to our port as represented in the image on the screen. God only knew what our real orientation was. The truth seeker is a light second out toward the orbit of Alpha 3, Davis clarified. What course, sir? Julie asked, her fingers hovering over the controls, as if she didn't want to stay in one place too long. I didn't blame her for that. I wasn't too comfortable just sitting here either. Wait one. Oliveira told her, peering intently at the tactical display, elbow resting on his knee, chin propped on a fist as if he were posing for a new Rodin sculpture entitled The Tactician. I want to see who they go after. Yeah, I was curious about that too, though my own interest wasn't as seemingly academic as Oliveira's. The ten remaining cruisers were still maneuvering into a spherical formation, noses outward, as if they expected another sneak attack out of hyperspace. It was a reasonable suspicion. They're not sure yet, Oliveira narrated. They know from the Chinese that we only have one operational cruiser, but they can't know the result of the Alliance conference yet. We've already shown we have at least one more ship than they thought, and they're spooked. Gonna take them a minute to decide there's only two of us. As if they were listening, the ships began moving again, aligning in what the infantry soldier in me wanted to call an echelon right formation all of them lined up on the cruiser to their left. All right, now we're cooking. Oliveira clapped his hands together, rubbing them with anticipation. Okay, Julie, if they come after us, they'll probably jump in all at once, but there's a chance they leave a couple cruisers back at Alpha 3, lay in a micro-jump to the Lagragian point. Davis, if there's any of them left there when we arrive, take the opportunity to put a round through them. Call that plan A. The other possibility is that they go after the Truth Seeker, and if that happens, we jump in and hit them from behind. Give the hell the time to jump out. Comms, get me Captain Junpa. Lieutenant Adams didn't have the opportunity to make the call because the Tavinians made theirs first, 
all ten ships vanishing in bursts of gamma radiation that the computer displayed as rings of light. Shit, they translated, Davis blurted. I knew the man was a captain, but I hadn't been aware he'd changed his last name to Obvious. Get ready, Oliveira said. He hadn't been talking to me, and I felt as useless as I always did during a space battle. What the hell was I even doing on the bridge? There, Davis said. They went for the Helta. I didn't think he sounded relieved, but I couldn't be sure. He was right, though. The Tavinian ships had gone for the Truth Seeker, though I didn't follow the logic in it. They could have split up and sent half their forces after each of us, but maybe their commodore or admiral or whoever was in charge of their little fleet thought it more prudent to use his superior numbers to dispose of one threat before moving on to the other. All right, Julie, take us in, Oliveira said, still sounding confident. He looked nowhere near as confident when the red lines began flashing across the main screens. It was something I'd only seen in emergency drills, something I hadn't expected to ever see in combat. But I knew exactly what it meant, and so did everyone else on the bridge. Julie's face was stricken when she turned to face Oliveira. The main drive field is down! Engineering! Oliveira snapped, fixing the representative bridge officer from that department with a glare. Status report! Lieutenant Cannon was a young man, fresh out of exhaustive training in the systems of our ship, which was why he was on the bridge instead of actually in the engineering department. All the bridge officer did was relay questions like that to the officers and NCOs who actually knew what was going on. I'm not getting anything on the trouble sheet, the young man said plaintively. Hold on, sir. He punched desperately at the controls on his console, and his screen lit up with a view of the engineering compartment. By all rights, Colonel Barnett should have answered the call. He was the chief of engineering and held multiple doctorates in physics of various sorts. Though I had been outraged when I found out that the ship's engineer was neither a chief petty officer nor Scottish. Instead, an unfamiliar face appeared on the small screen, long and rounded, what my father would have uncharitably called a horse face. He leered at the camera with something between disdain and hatred, then raised a handgun toward the video pickup. There was a flash of light, and the feed went dead. Oh, fuck me, Cannon breathed. Clanton, Oliveira said, his face white with shock. On it, I told him, turning and sprinting for the hatchway with every ounce of speed the Svalin had. Pops, I called into my throat mic. Get the whole team to engineering right the fuck now. We have an incursion. I didn't know how, didn't know when, but there were enemy on board this ship. Chapter 18 What are we doing, Julie? I asked, knowing I should be concentrating on the threat I could deal with, but still needing to have an idea of the estimated length of my life, given the number of enemy ships and our inability to move. Bulkheads flew by, their details blurring at 20 miles an hour, the occasional crew member scrambling to get out of the way of my exoskeleton, just a flash of wide eyes and open mouths. The general is on the comms with Junpa, she told me, her voice hushed. She was either trying not to be heard or trying not to distract Oliveira. He's letting the hell to know we have a problem. A pause. He told them they need to get out of the system. Go warn Earth. I didn't need her to tell me what Junpa's response was. I could hear it over the audio pickup of her comm unit. To hell with that, the cuddly little bear man captain said. As I have heard you say so many times, Michael Oliveira, you do your job and I'll do mine. Call me when you get your shit together. Sometimes I love that little guy. Let me know if we're about to die, I told Julie. Until then, love you. Love you too. Love you even more if you find a way to get us out of this. I was first at the engineering compartment because the bridge was closer than the hangar bay where the rangers and the Delta team had waited in their shuttles. And probably because I could run faster since there was only one of me weaving through the traffic instead of a dozen. Lucky me, I got to see the dead bodies first. I didn't know any of the three, not the way I knew the Delta team or even the Rangers, who I'd trained and could pick up out of a lineup. I might have seen these people in the ship's mess, though I couldn't have sworn to it, and the only way I could have put a name to any of them would have been to check the tape on the chest of their combat utility fatigues except I couldn't read them through all the blood. There were two men and a woman, all of them young, no older than their mid-twenties, judging by their ranks, and all of them shot multiple times in the chest. They hadn't been shot here in the corridor. 
I was no forensic scientist, but I could tell from the lack of blood spatter on the deck or the bulkheads that they'd been shot inside engineering, then dumped out the hatchway. Engineering had an emergency blast shield, a sheet of solid lead four inches thick that lowered out of the overhead to seal it off in case of a radiation leak. There'd been no leak, I was pretty sure of that. That was one drill everyone paid attention to and participated in no matter what department they were in, and there were too many redundant systems for even the most determined saboteur to disable. But somehow they'd gotten the blast doors shut and left us the three bodies on the outside as an advertisement of their intent. Bridge, I called via my comm unit. I have three KIA outside engineering and the blast shield has been secured. What's our situation? I expected Julie to answer, or maybe Lieutenant Cannon, if he'd managed to pull himself together. Instead, a General Oliveira's voice buzzed in my ear, less irate than I would have expected and more laden down with concern, which worried the hell out of me. The power feeds have been shut down, he told me, but sensors show they're intact, which makes sense since it would take high explosives or a team of engineers with the proper tools to physically damage the power trunks. If you can get inside... You can turn the power feeds from the reactor to the drive fields on, and we'll be back in business. But for God's sake, you'd better hurry. Junpa's taking on all ten ships by himself, and he's not micro-jumping because he doesn't want to leave us to their tender mercies. He has minutes before they turn him into radioactive dust. Great. No pressure. I could hear the Delta team pounding around the bend in the corridor before I could see them. I could see from the IFF transponder feed that Pops was in the lead and that there was a whole squad of rangers in tow as well, led by Colonel Brooks herself. I hadn't asked for them, but I suppose, like chicken soup, they couldn't hurt. Shit, Pop said when he saw the bodies. The rest of the team filtered up and down the corridor, taking a knee and setting up in defensive positions, even though we had no intelligence there was anything out here to defend against. The rangers came to a stop in the middle of the corridor, some of them scanning back and forth like they were wondering if they should be imitating Delta. Brooks pushed through the gaggle and motioned toward engineering. We have any sort of eyes and ears inside? She'd been looking at me, but I knew from the communications display in the corner of my helmet HUD that she'd included the bridge on the question. And again, Oliveira answered it. I wondered if he considered this important enough to handle it himself, or if he didn't want to watch the Helta sacrificing themselves to save his ass. Not currently, he told her, but this is what we have from just before they shot the cameras out. The footage was raw and unedited, starting abruptly with the micro-jump away from Alpha 3. There were ten people in the engineering crew, and they were all strapped into their jump seats, acceleration couches that folded down from the bulkhead for emergencies, which this was surely one. I saw their bodies jerk with involuntary muscle contractions for the micro-jump. The only one I recognized was Colonel Barnett, the chief engineer. He was lolling in his seat, hit harder than most by the whiplash of the multiple jumps so close together. No, I take that back. I recognize three of the others, too, the ones who recovered first, who unstrapped from their seats to try to take their stations. They were the ones lying at my feet in a pool of blood, the two men who entered the compartment only two or three seconds after the three engineering crew members stood up were moving swiftly with a purpose, and I didn't even have to see the guns in their hands to know they were armed. Armed men move a certain way, particularly when they mean to use those weapons. They were facing away from the cameras when they shot the crew members. I flinched with each impact of the bullets, as if I was just now finding out they died rather than seeing their lifeless bodies first. I'd seen... So many people die, people I knew, people I cared about, but this hit me just as hard. One of the two men hauled the bodies out, while the other kept the crew covered, kept them strapped into their seats. Both of the intruders were tall, broad-shouldered, and the one who dragged the bodies out didn't seem to have any problems with the weight. He was the one who turned back and shot the camera, the one I'd seen on the bridge. Do we know who they are? Oliveira asked, each question another drumbeat. How they got on board, if there are more of them? I wanted to snap something snarky about who he thought I was, ship security or something, but it wouldn't have been appropriate. Anyway, part of the answer had popped up on the display from the ship's personnel roster ten seconds ago and was waiting on a tiny portion of my heads-up display. I only have facial recognition data on one of them, I said, but he's not in the ship's personnel database. 
The system picked him out on the security feed recordings, and the first time it spotted him was in the hangar bay just before we left Earth orbit. Then they're not Divinians, he said, deflating with the realization. They didn't come in at the conference, I corrected him. I'm not jumping to any conclusions, but yeah, I'm thinking this is the Russians. FSB? No. FSB can be ruthless bastards, but they're generally not suicidal. These guys gotta know there's no way out of this for them. I'm thinking Chernobog. They're mercenaries by name, but they're all of them fanatical Russian nationalists. He didn't say anything for a moment, and when he did, it was to change the subject. Maybe because he found the current one too depressing to contemplate. They've engaged the emergency locks. We can override from here, but that door opens slow. Really slow, according to Lieutenant Cannon. Sir, Lieutenant Cannon broke in, and I wasn't sure which sir he was talking to, but I paid attention just in case. There's another way in. I patched the feed from my comm unit into the same network as Delta and the Ranger Squad. Go ahead, Cannon, I urged. I've got you on with everyone. You said there's another way in? Um, yes, sir. Lieutenant Cannon seemed cowed by the idea of talking to all the Strack Jack Delta and Rangers, though he hadn't been bothered by talking to me, the only genuine space marine in history. There's an emergency access crawlway that allows access to the reactor in case there's a radiation leak that seals off engineering. You can get to it down past the engineering compartment, and it'll take you through a radiation lock on the opposite bulkhead from the blast shield. I was moving as he talked, jogging down to the other side of the compartment, scanning the bulkhead until I found it. The hatch was alarmingly small, about a yard and a half on each side. The latch secured with some sort of coated lock and a big-ass skull and crossbones danger sticker, warning me that the reactor access tunnel should only be used by qualified personnel in thermal protection suits with an internal air supply. This looks a lot like they don't want us to be in here, Cannon. It'd be fatal for anyone without protection from the heat, he confirmed. But you guys got that armor, right? I rolled my eyes, then turned and looked back at Pops. We both had our visors up, and I could see his skepticism. It's gonna be an awful tight fit, he said. I mean, maybe. If I left the rifle and vest and ammo and shit behind and stripped off some of the shoulder armor? You aren't going, I told him. He started to open his mouth to argue, and I held up a hand. I'm not either. The words were hard to say. I was used to leading from the front, but the truth was, I had to be somewhere I could run this operation, not the point man inside a tunnel blind. Much as I want to, this is something both of us have ranked out of. I sighed and turned to the ranger squad. Quinn, you claustrophobic? Because I sure as hell was. The kid pushed up his visor, and I could see his eyes widening slightly at the thought of going into the hole. No, sir, he said and I knew he would have said the same thing even if he was because he was a ranger. He handed his rifle off to one of his squad and attached the quick releases on the sling, then began shrugging out of his load-bearing harness while another of the rangers disassembled the gimbal hookup that supported his rifle. Without the weapon and the ammo for it, he seemed to have shrunk by several inches, but he was still too broad across the shoulders. I stepped in because I'd helped design the damned armor and knew it better than any of them, stripping off the shoulder pauldrons and elbow pads, then turning him around to remove the grenade launcher from his backpack. Pops took it from me, and I spun the kid around one more time to make sure there was nothing else we could remove before turning him to face me. If you get stuck, I told him, don't try to push forward. Use the suit's muscle to scoot back to the last position where you weren't stuck and try again from another angle. Clear? Yes, sir, he said, sounding as if he was trying to make himself believe it. He gestured at the corporal who'd taken his harness. Grabbing the SIG 9mm out of the chest holster and checking its load, he pointed the barrel down with a practiced motion. He nodded to me. I'm ready. Shit, I'm not. As the head of security, I had a skeleton key access code that could open anything on the ship, which seemed like way too much responsibility and power to give a semi-successful science fiction writer, even one with the Medal of Honor. I tapped it into the keypad, and the light went from red to green, signaling that the magnetic lock had disengaged. I wedged the thick fingers of my suit's gloves under the latch and yanked it open. Heat poured out, even this far away from the reactor, and I swore, brushing my visor down so I could breathe. Switch to internal air supply. I warned Quinn, or your visor will fog up. Yes, sir. He eeled into the opening, 
or as close to Ealing as a grown man in a suit of powered armor could manage. I was sure he was going to get stuck before he even made it into the tunnel, but somehow he managed to squeeze through, and his legs disappeared inside. You all right? I asked him, bending down to check if he might be stuck right inside the entrance, but he was still edging forward. I can make it, he insisted. Let me know when you're in position, I radioed. I'm going to try to distract them. Pops was staring at me when I straightened and moved to the communications panel mounted in the bulkhead beside the blast shield. It was designed for emergencies, though I doubt they'd imagined one like this. Distract them how, he wondered. I opened my visor and touched the call button. I'm obviously not going to dazzle them with brilliance, I told him. So, I'll just have to baffle them with bullshit. Chapter 19 I didn't think they would answer, but I kept pressing the call button, knowing every time I did, a loud buzzer would sound inside the compartment. I figured enough of that would wear down anyone, Tavinian or Russian, and as it turned out, I was right. The screen lit up. It was Horseface. If you do not stop making that noise, he said, I am going to kill one of the hostages. He stepped out of the way of the camera on the comm panel, one he hadn't thought to destroy, revealing the other seven members of the engineering crew, still strapped into their chairs, except now their arms were tucked under the straps and they were tightened enough they couldn't move. Barnett was white as a sheet, face twisted into a grimace perhaps from rage or perhaps from terror. The others were arranged from one to the other, though one young woman, a tech sergeant, seemed to be hiding whatever she was feeling behind an emotionless mask as if she didn't want to give her captors the satisfaction of knowing they'd affected her at all. You're going to kill all of them, I reminded him, and all of us, and yourselves. The ship is driftwood. The Tavinians are going to blow us to atoms in a few minutes. Perhaps, he said, shrugging. Perhaps not. They would not mind capturing the ship intact, I think. Shut up, the other one said from across the room, and I finally got a look at him. He was taller than his compatriot, and skinnier too, his face angular and almost gaunt, and he didn't look amused. What difference does it make, Grigori? Horseface demanded. Do you think our cover is still good? Do you think they won't figure out we're not actually members of this crew? Fuck, I was right. You're both Chernobog, I said. How in the hell did you get aboard this ship? Getting on the ship was the play of a child, Horseface said, laughing sharply. Your security is a farce. The only hard part was gaining access to your base to sneak onto your cargo shuttle. I said shut up, Anatoly, Grigori snapped, moving forward as if he were going to switch the screen off himself. Or what? Anatoly demanded, stepping into his way. Do you think you can pull rank on me now? At the last, either we will die or the Tavinians will take us, and they may believe we are who we say we are or they may not, and perhaps we will die anyway. As long as we have revenge for what the Americans have done to us, what difference does it make? You're here because of Lermontov? I asked him. Because of the assault on your compound? Well, that is why I am here, Anatoly said, laughing humorously. The mission had already been planned, since before we helped the Chinese steal your ship. He shrugged. We did not think you would get it back so quickly. That was smooth work he admitted, but you could not be allowed to get away with your disrespect of the colonel. I'm the one who captured him, I said. It was a gamble. You might have hung up on me immediately outraged, but I had the feeling this guy wanted to talk. I'm Andy Clanton, Major Andrew Clanton, United States Marine Corps. Yes, I know who you are, Anatoly said sharply. I should have expected it would be you that they sent after him. You do their dirty work for them, you and your Delta Force. This time, there was amusement in his laugh. I would have thought after they pinned that metal on your chest, they would pull you off the battlefield and send you to talk to children in your schools or some such nonsense. He was good, not even a hint of an accent, though I could tell from his inflection he wasn't a native English speaker, or at least not someone who'd been born in the United States. Me? In a school? I chuckled. I'd wind up swearing and telling the kids stories about shooting people. But I'll tell you what. Anatoly. If you're looking for revenge for the colonel, I'm the one you want. Why don't you take me and let those engineering geeks go? I'll take off my armor, leave all my weapons behind. I didn't have much hope that Anatoly would go for it, but I was sure Pops would shit a brick. 
but it was the offer I had to make to keep this conversation going, to keep his interest and attention on me. You think I am an idiot or something? Anatoly scoffed. I open this door, your Rangers or Delta Force team rushes in and kills us. How about this? I asked, the gears in my brain grinding. You can open the door like two feet, maybe. I tried to do math in my head. Maybe half a meter or so, just enough for me to crawl through, not enough to let a suit of armor through. You get me in, get a gun on me to guard against anyone else coming through, and then let the others crawl out under the door. How's that sound? Why? Anatoly demanded, sounding almost offended by the offer. You said yourself we'd probably all die anyway. What difference does it make if they die in here with us or out there with your people? Because it's my job, I said. I found that when you're lying to someone, it's a damn good idea to include as much of the truth as possible. I do my job, no matter what else happens, even if it only keeps my crew alive one more second than they'd live anyway. I can respect that, Anatoly told me. He turned to Grigori. What do you think, sourpuss? Should we swap out these useless fucks for a Medal of Honor winner? I wouldn't mind the chance to put a bullet into his gut and watch him die slow. They think he's fucking with you, Grigori replied, arms folded across his chest, the picture of passive aggressiveness. He's wasting your time. We have a mission. We have accomplished our fucking mission. We gave up everything to accomplish this mission. What the fuck did you give up? Grigori asked, reverting to Russian. I'd learned a lot of Russian in the last year, but the translation program did the heavy lifting. You have no wife, no children, so your parents will miss you. Who the fuck cares? Everyone's parents miss them. They'll get your goddamned insurance. You might have children, you old goat. Anatoly shot back, also in Russian. But you've got no wife, unless you count all your ex-wives. Do you think your children will miss you? Hell, you've never visited them once the whole time I've known you. You spend every leave and all your money on hookers and blow. Fuck you, you sister-fucking son of a whore. I thought about letting them go at it, hoping they might kill each other and save us the trouble, but that would have also meant taking the chance they might shoot one of the hostages in the process. Excuse me, gentlemen, I interrupted, clearing my throat. But could we get back to the proposed exchange? I feel like I have a limited time to get this done. We got a deal or not? Fuck yes, Anatoly said, motioning with his pistol. It wasn't one of our SIGs, so I didn't have to add lack of security in the armory to my list of failings. It looked funky and futuristic, and I knew it was an integrally suppressed 9mm, though I couldn't remember the brand name off the top of my head. You get your ass in here. Nothing but the clothes on your back, and we'll let these bitches go. But be quick about it, because I do not believe you have that long before our new allies turn you into hot gas. I hit the mute button on the screen and began stripping off my armor. You're not seriously going to do this, are you? Brooks asked me. Her visor was up, and I could see her disbelief. They'll kill you and not give up a single one of the hostages, and there won't be a damn thing we can do to stop them. Yeah, that could happen, I admitted, handing my helmet off to Pops. I grabbed the earbud off my comm unit and stuck it in place, touching the control to call Quinn. You in position yet? I asked him. Nope. His reply was curt, lacking the usual respect he afforded officers, and I decided he had to be pretty stressed. And I don't know where I am, or how far I have to go, either. I haven't gotten stuck too bad, yet. How's the heat? Hot. Few minor burns on my hands and knees, but nothing serious, yet. Hard to breathe, even with the internal air supply. I'll let you know when I reach the end. He told me everything he could, so I stopped bothering him and concentrated on getting off my armor. No choice, I said to Brooks. He isn't in position yet, and if we try to open this door the whole way before he gets into position, the mercs will kill everyone sure as hell. This way, the door will be partially open already. I squinted at Pops, who'd been uncharacteristically silent. What? You're not going to try to talk me out of it? Andy, he told me, shaking his head. I learned from raising my kids that there's some times you can't say anything. You just gotta step back and let them fuck up all on their own and hope they don't get hurt too badly. You are not that much older than me, I reminded him, pulling off my ammo vest and handing it to one of the rangers whose name I didn't remember. Chronologically, no, 
he agreed. Emotionally, that's another story. You believe this guy? I asked Brooks. Just because he's been in the army for like 25 years and in CAG for the last 10 or whatever, he thinks he can talk back to a major. She opened her mouth to say something that I'm sure would have been emotionally supportive, but I held a finger up and touched a control on my comm unit. Bridge, I'm going to need you to do me a favor and get ready to override the blast shield and take it up the whole way the second you see the infiltrators start to raise it. I've been following this whole thing, Andy, Oliveira said. Are you fucking nuts? Jury's still out, sir. Can you detect when they raise the shield from up on the bridge, though? Yes, Andy. He sighed, sounding as if he'd given up. You best make it quick. The truth seeker has been taking a lot of hits. Aye, sir. I bit off, not allowing myself to snap back about how reminding me of how little time we had wasn't going to help one bit. Because one, he was a general, and I was not. And two, he had just as much stress on him as I did, and much less he could actually do about it. I stared at my Glock 17 in its chest holster and wondered if I should try to tuck it into the small of my back under my fatigue jacket, but decided against it. The first thing they'd do was frisk me, and I wasn't going to be doing any quick draw from Mexican carry while I was crawling under the door. I touched the control to unmute the speaker. Okay, I'm ready. I'm raising the shield, Anatoly said. Tell your people if I see more than one person coming under that door, I shoot them, and Grigori shoots the hostages. Make sure they know this because maybe they think they can overwhelm us, sacrifice the hostages to take control of this compartment. But we do not have to keep you out forever, just for long enough. And we have enough ammo to stack your bodies tall enough to block the door. Nobody's coming through but me, I assured him. Unless you go back on your word to let the hostages go. I kept hitting the point, but I didn't expect him to do it, and didn't give a shit, because they'd be dead right alongside us if we didn't get control of that room. Anatoly said nothing, but the blast shield began to rise with a chest-deep rumble. I wasn't sure if it was the vibration I felt in my stomach or the fear, because I was afraid, and I wasn't hesitant at all to admit it. I was afraid for myself, afraid for the hostages, afraid for the Helta, afraid for the crew, afraid for Julie, and afraid of fucking up, not necessarily in that order. You'd think by this point in my life I'd have gotten used to being scared, but it still twisted my guts. Every time the first time, like true love. Quinn, I said, my words covered by the motors, the grinding of the metal. I'm heading inside. I won't be able to talk to you, but if I say the word ptarmigan, that means I need you to come through. If you say the word what? He sounded very much like he'd been trying to squeeze through something impossibly small when he'd heard something so absolutely stupid he had to comment on it. Ptarmigan. It's like a chicken. Just listen for it. I didn't have time to explain. I wanted a word that wouldn't come up in conversation because the door was up about a foot, far enough that I needed to try to squeeze under it. I had to trust there'd be time to do something, that they'd let me live long enough. The deck was cold beneath my hands, and crawling under the blast shield reminded me of a scene from an old mummy movie where some bad guy was trying to escape from an ancient tomb that was sealing up for eternity. Except, in this case, the door was going up, and I wasn't heading for an eternity alone. And the mummies were Russian. Hands grabbed me before I was halfway through, yanking me up before I could see anything but the deck plating. The cold metal of a gun barrel pressed against my neck, and the stale breath of a habitual smoker was hot on the side of my face. Don't move, war hero. Keep your fucking hands to your sides, and don't move a fucking muscle. Anatoly patted me down, jerking at the edges of my clothing, reaching into my waistband. Whoa there, Hoss, I objected, as he worked his way to the front of my pants. Bad touch. I like you, but not in that sort of way. Can we just be friends? You think you're very funny, Anatoly growled. He smacked me in the back of the head with the barrel of his gun, not hard enough to concuss me, but enough to hurt. You won't think it is so funny when I put a round into your kneecaps. The colonel was a great man. You aren't worthy to kill someone like him. Something is wrong, Grigori pronounced from the control panel. He was stabbing at a button over and over. The door! It will not stop opening! This was the part where I was going to get killed. The only thing that kept me from dying immediately was that Anatoly, for all that he was a trained killer, Chernabog mercenary, had never been trained on how to properly secure a prisoner while holding a handgun. 
If he had, he would have known that it's never okay to jam your gun barrel into someone's back or neck. It might make you feel like a badass from an action movie, but all it really accomplishes is to give the person you're trying to subdue an index of where the gun is in relation to their body and give them a target. There is an art to deflecting a gun being held to your back, and I had thankfully learned it from the best. I stepped out to the left and spun on the ball of my foot, sweeping my left arm around, ducking my shoulder and locking Anatoly's gun arm at the elbow. Jambo had taught me the move on board the Truth Seeker after I'd been cornered by FSB agents in Oregon, and he'd made me practice it over and over. He'd also told me that it would probably get me shot, and I should only try it if it was a question of likely death or certain death, and I thought this qualified. My fingers were digging into Anatoly's triceps muscle and his wrist trying to control his hand. He yanked back against me, stepping back, but I sidestepped and kept him from throwing all the weight of his body against my hold. Ptarmigan! I screamed in his face like a battle cry, like the ki I'd learned to shout in Taekwondo as a kid to focus my energy. Ptarmigan, for fuck's sake! If Anatoly was curious about what I meant, he didn't bother to ask, his teeth clenched as if he would have bitten me if he could. He wanted to hit me with his off hand. I could tell by the way he kept shifting his weight, but I was shuffling across the deck, forcing him off balance with every step, and he couldn't get into a position to put any weight behind the punch. He tried anyway, and I ducked, my chin against my chest. His knuckles glanced off the crown of my head, which hurt a little, but probably hurt him more than it did me. Move, Anatoly! Grigori yelled, and he fired. The reports were suppressed, but suppressors aren't silencers, and shooting a suppressed firearm doesn't produce a quiet little snap like in the movies. Instead, it was the sound of a two-by-four smacking into a concrete floor, and it was loud enough that I flinched instinctively at the discharge, expecting the pain of a bullet tearing through my chest. I felt nothing, and I wasn't sure if it was because I hadn't been hit or because of the adrenaline coursing through my veins. I couldn't stop to look. I had to take Anatoly down now before Grigori got a clean shot at me. He wasn't a small man, and I had to thank God and the Helta for advanced medical tech, because there was no way I could have kept up with him if I was still feeling every one of my natural years, not with over four decades of repetitive use wear and tear on my shoulders and elbows and knees. Hell, I was in better shape now than I had been since I was twenty-five, and I could still barely keep control of that fucking gun. Anatoly's face was screwed up with rage and determination, lips peeled back over his teeth like the illustration of a war face in an online article. Then his face disappeared, and something hot and liquid and red sprayed into my face, blinding me, and I was sure I'd been shot in the head, but I didn't let go of Anatoly's arm, trying to make sure that if I died, that I still kept him from shooting anyone until the others got inside but he was sinking to the floor, and I dropped to a knee to stay with him. His arm had gone limp, his struggles ceasing, and I wiped an arm across my face, desperate to see. Anatoly was dead, his forehead a loose flap of skin, his skull shattered, and the bullet that had gone through his head must have just missed mine. Grigori was alive and firing his weapon at a pair of bulky figures in Svalin armor ducking beneath the half-open blast shield his slugs ricocheting off their armor and then the bulkhead before dying as spinning dreidels on the deck. And behind him, another armored soldier loomed, this one slightly less bulky, the excess stripped away from his suit, the surface covered with charred black patches, where he'd leaned against surfaces too hot to touch. Quinn fired his sig, and this report wasn't suppressed, wasn't drowned out by the adrenaline buzzing in my head. Pain speared through my ears and into my head from the discharge of the 9mm in the enclosed space of the engineering compartment, but it hurt Grigori even more. Three rounds punched into his back, and he stiffened and twisted, but didn't go down, propped up by his own frenzied determination and sheer inertia. He would have died in another few seconds, was practically dead on his feet, but the Delta troops coming through the door weren't taking any chances with the Russian mercenary. Half a dozen K.E. gun slugs, sintered metal, ignited to plasma at the muzzle, tore through Grigori, ripping him to smoking bloody shreds. He collapsed, finally, as if there wasn't enough of him left to hold him upright. 
and I let loose a breath I hadn't been aware I was holding and pried the gun out of Anatoly's dead fingers before I scrambled to my feet. Svalin suits were pounding into the compartment, swarming over the two dead Russians and the hostages. Everything was hazy, half shrouded by smoke from the gunfire, and it took me a few seconds to realize that some of the hostages had been shot. Fuck! The curse expelled itself like a piece of food caught in my throat, and I ran to Colonel Barnett, praying to a god I wasn't sure I believed in and definitely wasn't on speaking terms with that he was still alive. We had to get this fucking ship running, and he was the one man I knew could do it. He wasn't hurt. There was blood spattered across the shoulder of his fatigue jacket, but it wasn't his. The woman in the chair beside him, the one who'd kept her expression neutral, had been shot through the throat, and her blood decorated her seat, her uniform, and much of Barnett's. Two of the others had been hit as well, one of them a very young technician, second class. The Space Force equivalent of a corporal had a bullet through his left arm, and he was whimpering like a puppy. The other was older, a tech sergeant, and he was clearly dead. I yanked the quick release for Barnett's harness and pulled him to his feet. Colonel, I said, get the drives and weapon systems up now. What? He asked, blinking, wiping at the droplets of blood on his cheek. He couldn't pull his eyes away from the dying woman beside him. I gathered the slack of the sleeve over his left shoulder in my fist and shook him. Colonel, I snapped, and he finally met my gaze. The ship, get the fucking drives and weapons working, now! He nodded, stumbling over to the control panel, nearly tripping over the bodies of the two Russians. Get her to the medics, I told Pops. I thought it was Pops. It was someone in a suit of Svalin armor. Don't wait for them to get here. Carry her to the sick bay. I staggered, the strength going out of me so that I had to catch myself. A whirlwind of activity was happening all around me, and I couldn't follow any of it, couldn't focus. I touched a control on my comm unit. I had one more duty to discharge before I could fall apart. Bridge, engineering is secured. Colonel Barnett is working the problem. I clenched my jaw hard to keep bile inside my throat before I said the last. We have one KIA, two WIA, one critical, and headed to sick bay. Roger, security. Good job. I stared at the pool of blood where the woman had been. She was gone now. Pops had taken her away. The dead man was still there, most of the left side of his head gone. And Quinn was there, his visor up, eyes fixed on the bodies of the Russians on the floor, looking like a lost child. Yeah, I muttered, finding an acceleration couch and leaning on it, trying to keep from falling over. Good job. Chapter 20 I should have stayed in engineering, or gone to sick bay or gone somewhere I could have strapped in for battle stations, but I couldn't stay away from the bridge. I didn't even retrieve my armor, leaving it for Dog and Preacher to take back to the armory. When the alarm sounded for a micro-jump halfway there, I just put one hand against the bulkhead and took a wide, stable stance. The whiplash hit hard, but without the sharp pain of last time. Maybe I was too numb to fully feel it. The bridge was a cacophony of orders and status reports, and no one noticed my arrival, not even Julie, who was weaving complex magic spells with the haptic controls at her station, begging the old gods of hyperdimensional space for their blessing. I felt none of it, just watched the show on the main screens, as if the whole thing was just some new MMORPG Zack was playing on his virtual reality headset back home. It wasn't easy to translate into a narrative a dumbass marine like me could understand. The screen was split up into four or five different sections, trying to keep track of the movements of each of the enemy ships, the Truth Seeker, and us all at once. We were surrounded by a blue halo, a wedge-shaped silver dart on the screen, but so was the Truth Seeker, and it took me nearly a minute to figure out which was which. One of the blue ships was describing an arc around the outer edge of an enemy globular formation, just outside the range of their beam weapons, flashing yellow indicators beside it advertising battle damage, while the other was darting like a spear into the heart of the Tavinian cruisers. Fire an impulse gun, Davis announced, and I finally figured it out. We were the spear, the red line of our shot heading directly into the center of the cluster. It missed, the first time I'd ever seen that happen, because the ship it had been aimed at jumped into hyperspace a half-second before it reached the space they'd recently occupied. Shit, 
Davis blurted, then realized where he was and corrected himself. Sorry, sir. We have negative impact. Target performed a hyperdimensional translation and... Shit! I didn't blame him. The Tavinian ship had reappeared less than a thousand miles off our starboard bow. Yeah, yeah, I know, but that's what I'm going to call it. And was bearing down on us at full boost. I'd never seen one of the Tavinians attempt a micro-jump before. The bastards might have been primitive, but they were learning. I dropped into a spare acceleration couch and strapped in, knowing what was coming. Micro-jump, Oliveira said, still the cool-as-a-cucumber Air Force pilot, but beginning to fray around the edges. Take us ahead of the Truth Seeker. Jesus, I wheezed, unable to keep the exclamation inside as the ship slipped in and out of hyperspace. Julie glanced back, finally realizing I was back on the bridge, and her eyes spoke volumes she didn't have the time to say. We're a thousand clicks from the truth, Sika, she told Oliveira, duty claiming her attention. A few light seconds from the nearest enemy formation. Lieutenant Adams, Oliveira said and didn't have to finish. There was only one person he'd want to speak to out here. The communications officer nodded to him, and Junpa appeared on a section of the forward screens. I don't know why, but I expected him to be covered in soot, blood running from a cut on his forehead, the bridge on fire like in all those old science fiction TV shows, like on that stupid-ass show they'd made from my books. But of course, that wasn't how space battles worked, even with real force fields and energy beams. There was a shitload of armor and the high-tech equivalent of circuit breakers and all sorts of layers of protection between the hull and the bridge. And while the engineering compartment might get a dangerous overload of the power trunks, it wasn't a circa 1943 aircraft carrier. And the only way the bridge would take damage was if something penetrated far enough to put a hole through it, in which case the whole ship would be so much driftwood or if their energy fields were overloaded enough to cause a gravitational flux that damaged the superstructure of the ship, in which case the whole ship would be so much driftwood. But I repeat myself. The Helta captain didn't resemble a bad SF movie, but he didn't look happy. Our drive field has been attenuated by 50%, he said without so much as a, hey, how's it going? We've lost two of our power conduits, and if we take another solid hit, we may lose jump capability. We've disposed of our infiltrators. Oliveira said. They were Russians. Been on board since we left Earth. I raised an eyebrow. Oliveira hadn't had to tell him that. Clearly hadn't wanted to, but I thought he was trying to make up for not sharing our situation with him earlier. Thank you for keeping them off of us. He tapped a finger rhythmically on the armrest of his command chair, eyes hazed over in concentration. We're going to take one last pass at them. Fuck. I'd known what he was going to say because he wasn't the sort of commander who ran from a fight, but my stomach sank at the words. There were still ten enemy ships, and while they hadn't shown any great imagination at using their superior numbers to trap us so far, they weren't morons. They were scared of our impulse guns, that was clear, but if we gave them enough tries, they'd figure out a way to kill us. And I just knew he was going to let them try. I don't want you to take any more damage, so you're going to be the distraction and we'll do the shooting. Can you handle one more micro-jump? Junpa's face was pained and I knew he wanted to say no, but the Helta had given Oliveira a ration of shit about dishonesty, and lying now would have stained his little ursine soul. And the fact he was more worried about that than dying was one of the things I liked about him. We can, he confirmed, but only one. We'll need time for repairs after that. Right. I wasn't sure if Oliveira was assuring him he'd have time for those repairs, or simply acknowledging that, yes, the Helta did need repairs, though he wasn't going to guarantee he'd have the chance to perform them. When they come in after us, act like you're too badly damaged to jump. Kind of putter along at half speed back toward Alpha 3. It will not be much of an act. We'll jump out a light second, Oliveira went on as if the Helta hadn't spoken. Then hop right back in. When they start to close in on you, we'll put a round through one of them, hopefully. Then we'll both jump back out to Alpha 3. We will wait for your signal. Junpa's face was replaced by an external view of his ship. Status on the enemy? Oliveira asked Davis. He could have looked at the tactical display himself and knew enough to interpret it, unlike me. But even a cast-iron bastard like Oliveira got nervous enough to want to fill the silence with chatter. And sitting here waiting for someone to fire an energy beam at us sure as hell made me nervous. They're reorganizing, 
Davis reported, tracing a red line between the enemy ships, which were slowly maneuvering back into their loose, widely spaced spherical formation, thousands of miles between them. They're too far out to come at us on sublight drives. It'd take hours, and they don't strike me as that patient. Plus, they know we'd just jump out before they got into beam range, and they also know our impulse guns have a longer reach than their particle cannons or lasers. Why don't all their cruisers have particle cannons? I asked. A dozen pairs of eyes stared at me, some angry, some disbelieving, at least one pair fond. I mean, they steal all their ships from the Helta, I said, warmth flushing my face, though I don't know why I was embarrassed. If only Vera, a general, could talk to fill the empty silence, a mere major like me should have had an even better excuse. The Helta cruisers have particle cannons. Why don't the Tavinian cruisers all have them? Some of the ships they steal, Oliveira told me, sounding only mildly annoyed, aren't complete yet. Like the Jambo, when we took her from the shipyards. The Tavinians have a lot more lasers than they do particle cannons, so they stuff them into everything they have. He sighed, as if I were a toddler asking stupid questions, and he was indulging me. Go ahead, Captain Davis. In my opinion, sir... They're going to jump into our position in formation, or try to. Maybe converge their firing arcs on us so we can't maneuver out of them, probably from beyond technical maximum range. If they can fire enough shots at us even from extreme range, they could overwhelm our shields. They might even attenuate our drive field. Julie, get ready, Oliveira told her. Her eyes narrowed slightly, a sign of annoyance no one else would likely notice. The second they jump in on us take us to just the other side of their formation and point our nose at one of those pieces of shit long enough for Davis to shoot. Aye, sir. You better cut it out with that shit, Navy, he said, though I thought maybe he was smiling just a little. He glanced my way, and his earlier annoyance had transformed into something more thoughtful. You sure you're okay to be here, Andy? I wasn't hurt, I said, trying not to sound sullen. I wanted to, but I was trying not to. That's not what I mean. I knew what he meant. I'd rather be here, I told him. There's nothing for me to do down there but wait. I got the report from sickbay, he said. The words pitched low, though I'm sure everyone could hear them. Maybe it was more from respect than any attempt to keep the statement private. Technician Second Class Foster is going to be fine. Technical Sergeant Bridger. I didn't need to hear the rest. He said it anyway. She didn't make it. Lost too much blood. I tried to remember her face. I could picture the expression, the careful neutrality, but for some reason I couldn't put it all together into a face. She'd enlisted in the Space Force, had been motivated enough to go to NCO school, probably hadn't been a tech sergeant for that long given her age, and somehow she'd ended up on the Jambo, which meant she was likely one of the best around at her job. They didn't put people on this ship unless they were the best. She had her shit together enough not to give in to the fear, to defy the expectations of those Chernabog assholes. And right at the end, right when she'd been on the verge of coming through the whole experience unscathed, some bloodthirsty mercenary had shot her in the throat out of spite. She died in the arms of a stranger, bleeding out over Pops's armored chest. Oliveira looked as if he was waiting on me to say something. I didn't. They jumped! Davis announced, leaning into his control console like he needed the leverage to strike out at the enemy. Their emergence wasn't immediate, took longer than before, and I wondered how much time variance there could be and whether it was tactically significant. I counted automatically, unsure if it made any difference, but wanting to know how long it took them. I got to four, and the ten ships sprang into existence with a shower of gamma rays, a rainbow ring in the computer's fairy tale simulation. They were close, so close I could make out the details of the particle cannon turret on the nearest of them just before it fired on us. The jambo shuddered, not the impact of something solid, but close enough for me to forget I was in a starship and glance at the walls with suspicion. No. Oliveira's voice was steady, unhurried. Julie swiped a hand, and I threw up. I didn't think it was possible. I'd never had motion sickness in my life, not on a cruise in the med, not on helos or V-22s, not at airborne school in the back of a blacked-out transport plane flying nap of the earth trying 
to get us to puke, and not in hours and hours of freefall. I wasn't alone, though. Adams retched, and then Lieutenant Cannon, and I felt even worse that the two youngest officers on the bridge were the only others to decorate the deck. The deck plates were metal gridwork, and the gaps swallowed up the bile quickly, but the lingering stench made my stomach lurch again. I clamped my jaws shut, determined not to act like a damned army private, and the roaring in my ears subsided enough to catch the exchange between Oliveira, Julie, and Davis. So much of the battle was controlled by command, helm, and tactical that I wondered if they could have gotten away with reducing the bridge crew to maybe four or five and letting the other two officers double up engineering and damage control and communications with navigation. But despite the fact the whole thing was run by the Space Force, it was a ship, and Navy crews always had a lot of redundancy. With two light seconds toward Alpha 3's orbit, Julie reported. The truth seeker is keeping just ahead of their guns, Davis put in, but they'll be back in range in seconds. Ten, maybe twelve. You have the coordinates for the jump back? Oliveira asked Julie. She didn't look up from her console, just nodded. Are you going to upchuck all over the floor again, Clanton? Deck, I corrected him, gulping the word out. I shook my head, despite the roiling in my stomach. Nope, I'm good. Take us back, Julie. Warning klaxons blared, spreading the word to strap in. I hadn't noticed it before the last jump, but this time it was obnoxiously loud. It sounded like the speaker was right beside my ear, instead of out in the passageway, mocking me, promising to make me puke like a greenhorn again. I tensed and muttered curses through clenched teeth and did not lose what little was left in my stomach this time, though the price for my steadfastness was a wave of muscle cramps. Pain blinded me, and I came to the conclusion that there was a good goddamned reason that the Helta and the other allied races didn't do this kind of shit with their hyperdrives. Flashes of light blinded me to where we'd popped into existence this time. The buzzing in my ears kept me from hearing the exchange of order and status reports, and the haze of unreality lasted longer this time, the effect cumulative with the short interval hops. Firing! It was the first word I could make out, and I took it as a good sign. I squeezed my eyes shut and opened them again to the image of a Tavinian cruiser giving birth to a new short-lived star with its dying breath. We got him, Davis crowed, and a chorus of cheers erupted across the bridge. The cheers were as short-lived as the artificial star, drowned out by proximity warnings. Proximity meant something different in space than it did to ships or aircraft on Earth, measured in hundreds of miles rather than hundreds of yards, but the danger was just as real. Enemy ships were in firing range, and if we knew it, they sure as hell did. A wolf the size of a planet picked us up in its teeth and shook us like a femur, trying to crack his way down to the delicious marrow, and if I thought my head hurt before, now it was cracking at the seams of my skull. Multiple particle cannon hits, Davis strained the words out as if he were giving birth to them. Drive field, attenuation, 30%. Julie, Oliveira's order sounded more like a desperate plea. Get us out of their range. We're moving, she shot back, almost treading over his words. But it's going to take a couple minutes for the field to repropagate. Can we jump? The ship lurched, and the faint crackle of frying eggs and an ozone smell filled the air, just a faint hint of smoke entering the air filtration system somewhere. Not now we can't, Julie said, biting the words off and spitting them out. Dry field down to 30%. The truth seeker is jumping, Davis said. I tried to follow his words on the tactical readout and couldn't. The screen was full of enemy ships on all sides of us. I couldn't even find the spot where the Helta had been a moment before. Were there only nine of them? It sure as hell seemed like a lot more than nine. At least they'll get away, Oliveira said, sagging in his chair, the strength and starch gone out of him along with the hope of survival. Maybe they'll warn Washington. I might not have been able to pick out where the truth seeker had been before, but I could see her now. She coalesced into existence less than a hundred miles off our port side, a wall of silver metal in the view from the optical telescopes, her particle cannon flashing blue in the vacuum as matter and antimatter annihilated each other. She charged straight into the teeth of the enemy, taking the hits meant for us. 
They were visible even without the computer's help, distortions of the light twisting around the silver wedge of her, surrounded by halos of blue and then red and on into white. Julie, get us turned around, Oliveira said, leaning into the screen as if he could reach in and stop what was happening. Davis, our weapon's up. The impulse gun can't fire until the drive field is 100%, Davis told him. Particle cannons use the drive field too. All we got are point defense turrets and missiles, but neither one will touch the enemy cruisers through their shields. Is our fucking dry field back up yet? Oliveira exploded, slapping his palms on the armrests of his chair, drawing shocked stares from the bridge crew. Ten seconds, Julie replied, voice flat, as if she hadn't noticed her superior's outburst, had taken it as a standard question asked in the heat of combat. Ten seconds until we can maneuver and fire the particle cannon. Another ten until we can jump. A full minute until we have enough field strength to fire the impulse gun. Oliveira looked like he wanted to punch something, and part of me wanted to watch his reaction, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from the tactical display. The truth seeker was firing its particle cannon every couple of seconds, but the enemy was staying clear of her impulse gun, if she could even have fired it. Her field had to be shrinking with every hit she took, and I flinched at every flare of light from her shields, sharing the pain of the blows, wishing I could absorb some of the damage for them. Dry field is up, Julie announced, and the view on the screen shifted as the jambo spun on her axis. Executing 180-degree turn into the enemy course. Target the fuckers, Davis, Oliveira growled. Get us back into this fight! I was staring straight at the truth seeker when she imploded. I'd known it was possible. It was part of the lecture the Helta had given us from day one, that if the drive field absorbed enough energy quickly enough, it could implode and take the ship inside with it. She was there, surrounded by a halo of white light glowing like one of the archangels my father used to preach about from the pulpit, arms raised, eyes upturned, as if he was looking at their glory in the heavens. And then she was gone, leaving behind plumes of superheated gas shooting in every direction. And our only ally, my friend, Junpa, was gone along with her. Oh, God. I don't know who said it. I didn't say a word. I couldn't speak. Julie, Oliveira said, his voice a rasp like the words were dragging themselves over broken glass to leave his throat. Jump to hyperspace. Take us home. The enemy was closing in on us, would be in particle cannon range in seconds. They vanished, and the screen went black and took the universe with it. Chapter 21 I need a drink. I rubbed at my eyes with the heels of my hands, filling my vision with stars, and I didn't stop because I didn't want them to go away, didn't want to have to deal with reality when I opened them. You know, until I drank some of that scrith shit during the conference, I hadn't had any alcohol since my divorce. I stopped because I thought I was drinking to self-medicate, and I didn't want to find out the hard way that I was an alcoholic. But if you put a bottle of tequila in front of me right now, I think I'd down about half of it before I stopped. Julie pulled my hands away from my face, and when I opened my eyes, I only saw her looking at me. She leaned in and kissed me, ignoring the others in the small conference room. You babbling, Andy, she told me. And it's a dry ship. Oh, he ain't wrong, Pops commented. He was leaning his chair back against the bulkhead showing no deference at all to the various high-ranking officers in the compartment. I could absolutely kill a fifth of gin about now. I raised an eyebrow at him. Gin? Really? I'd expect that from Garcia, not you. Where the hell is Garcia, anyway? I'd half expected Mansoor to be here with the brain trust as well, but then again, he was an intelligence, and we didn't have any. In his compartment, Pop said. Not much politicking or negotiating to be done right now. He shrugged. I like gin. If we survive this, Danny Brooks promised, I will take all of you out to the best dive bar in Columbus, Georgia, and get you drunk on the cheapest booze they have. She looked haggard and drawn, and I thought the deaths of the engineering crew members had hit her as hard as it had hit me. But for now, we have less than 24 hours in hyperspace before we arrive back at Earth, and God knows how close on our heels the Tavinians are going to be. 
There are still nine of them, nine cruisers that we know of, not counting any fighter carriers they might have coming with. We have this ship, and maybe, if we're lucky, the Delia Strawbridge is ready to go back home. And that is fucking it. She spread her hands. What the hell are we going to do? I stared at Michael Oliveira. Hell, everyone was staring at Michael Oliveira. And he was staring at the conference table like the answers to all the questions of life were written there. I'd known the man for nearly two years, and I'd never seen him looking as lost as he did at that moment. What happens if we even win? Julie wondered. I looked at her, expecting despair from the words, but finding something else, perhaps disappointment. Junpa's gone, and the Helta probably won't risk their alliance to support us without him around. One disaster at a time, Colonel Nieves, Oliveira said. His first words since he'd called this meeting two hours ago, once we jumped to hyperspace. He raised his head and met my eyes. There was intense sadness there behind that dark gaze, a terrible sense of responsibility. It was my fault, he said. I got him killed. We should have just left, headed back to Earth. I didn't want to argue with him. I'd been having the same thoughts myself during the battle. But I also didn't want the commander of the only fucking ship we had feeling sorry for himself. Junpa was our friend, I told him. He saved our lives because we saved his. Because we saved his people. He owed us a debt, and he paid it. Let's just take the gift he gave us and honor it. The words seemed empty to me, just so much smoke. The sort of thing I'd have said to the platoon when I was a second lieutenant, just because I was supposed to, with no expectation that they'd buy it. Oliveira seemed to appreciate them, though. He nodded, tried to smile, though it didn't quite reach his eyes. They're not going to go after the planet, he said, his voice firmer. That's a guess. A hope, I suppose, that they won't double-cross their new allies, the Chinese and Russians. So, they'll come after us and our shipyards. If we get there soon enough, we can warn the shipyards, maybe get the other ships to jump out of the system to preserve them just in case. He tilted his head to the side and cocked an eyebrow. If they've even got the hyperdrives hooked up yet or the reactors fueled, that's going to have to wait until we get there. Even assuming we have the strawbridge, sir, Julie interjected, how do we fight nine of them? We'll have to take advantage of our greater experience micro-jumping, Oliveira declared. He held up a hand to forestall Julie's objection. Yes, I know. It's going to break down the superstructure of the ship and burn out our power conduits eventually, but what other choice do we have? He looked around at each of us. Seriously, if someone can come up with a better idea, tell me now. Everyone in this room has been here since the beginning, and I'd be a huge idiot if I didn't trust your judgment by now. I'm a ground pounder by profession, Brooks said, shrugging. I don't even get to joggle your elbow on the bridge like Andy here. But if you want to use my rangers for boarding actions, we're here for you. We'll do whatever you need. Skepticism crawled up the back of my throat like a tickle I had to cough to expel. I don't know if that'd work in this situation, I said, trying hard to keep my voice neutral and not sound dismissive. If we can knock out one of their ships to the point where we could board, it would probably be out of the fight for the duration anyway. They really like that globular formation. Julie mused, thumb tucked under her chin, forefinger tapping against her lips. Maybe we could try a drive field intersect. If we micro-jumped in, hit one of them just right, we could pinball it into another. Oliveira snorted dry amusement. And you were about to bust my balls for suggesting more micro-jumps. He rubbed at five o'clock shadow with his palm, the whiskers rasping against his skin. I'll consider it. Hell, at this point... I'll consider anything. We're all expendable in this. I know you know that on an intellectual level, but what I'm telling you, and only you in this room, because I do trust you, is that nine to two, or God forbid, nine to one odds, aren't survivable. I know what we're going to have to do will destroy this ship and kill everyone on her. Which is why I'm going to launch all shuttles when we arrive in system. Rangers, Delta, pilots, all non-essential personnel will be left in Earth orbit. Now hold on a second, I exploded, standing up. I'm not going anywhere. The hell with that, sir, Brooks said, her exclamation walking over mine, her palms on the table, weight over her feet in case she had to jump up and support me. We're here to fight. This isn't up for debate, 
Oliveira said, not raising his voice, not moving in his chair, no give at all in his tone. If we lose this battle, the U.S. and the coalition is going to need all the help they can get, and you are a valuable asset. I'm not going to let several hundred million dollars worth of Svalin armor and dozens of trained soldiers. He noticed my scowl and rolled his eyes. And one Marine go to waste getting blown up alongside the rest of us just so you can all feel better about yourselves. Grow up. You're all government property. It's part of the oath you all took to follow orders. And these are my orders. Is that clear? He glared at me, and I knew it was a warning. I'd better follow orders this time. Yes, sir, I said, falling back into my chair. I met Julie's eyes and we shared a look of utter hopelessness. She'd be staying on the ship, dying with it, while I abandoned her. Oliveira checked his watch. Brief your troops, do your preps, then get some sleep. You know that old saying about how the only easy day was yesterday? Well, today is that yesterday. Don't waste it. You should get some sleep, Julie told me, teasing at my chest hair. I glanced at the readout on my cabin's bulkhead display, a muted green glow in the darkness of the compartment. The time was meaningless in and of itself, just a number on a ship traveling between planets, a convenience for assigning shifts, but I knew the significance of this particular number. Twelve hours until we emerged from hyperspace, ten hours until we would all have to report to our duty stations, Julie to the bridge, me to one of the shuttles. Till I said goodbye to her forever. Do you think, I asked her, staring at the overhead, afraid to look at her, that I'm going to be able to sleep? She sighed, resting her forehead against mine. We always knew this might happen, she insisted. Either of us could have died a dozen times over these last couple years, and there's no saying we would have been together when it happened. I know. Her sweat matted hair was cool against my temple, her skin warm against my side. A sharp contrast to the chill of the air conditioning coming from the overhead vent. Just enough heat that I didn't feel the cold, didn't want to pull the covers over us. But this is different. This is a ticking clock. We all live with a ticking clock, she chuckled. Well, we used to anyway. Now the clock is ticking a lot slower for some of us. Her finger pressed insistently against my cheek, turning my eyes toward hers. This sucks, she admitted. But we're not kids. You and I have seen enough death to know we're not immortal, no matter what the hell the docs did to our telomeres. We're both fighting for something bigger than us. Her expression softened. Which reminds me, after, if there is an after, if we beat them and there's anything left, and if you make it, I want you to go see my daughter. I grunted, the words a punch to my floating ribs, imagining how that conversation would go. I'd met the girl once, and I didn't think she liked me. Okay, I said. I wasn't going to argue with her about it. I would have done anything she asked me. And if things don't work out, she went on, finally choking up, finally hitting something that broke through her tough, cool fighter pilot facade. And if it all goes to shit... If I can, I promised. If I have the opportunity, I will find her and make sure she's okay. I just hoped Paul had listened to my warning and gotten Zack out of Austin. We all knew what could happen in a big city when things got bad. We'd seen it before, seen the chaos, and I didn't even want to imagine Zack caught up in that. But if it goes to shit, I don't know I'll outlive you by all that long. I shouldn't have said it. I knew immediately, but the pain in my chest wanted to come out, and I couldn't keep it all pent up. I don't know that I want to. I thought she'd get angry at me for being fatalistic, but the look on her face was fond instead, mildly amused. You wanted to get married, she said, running a finger over my cheek, and spend a couple hundred years together and have ten kids, because you're a hopeless romantic. But sometimes even the heroes don't get a happy ending. Or don't you write those sorts of books? Shit, I denied. I don't even read that sort of books. Well, that's the difference between real life and your books. In real life, there are no happy endings. Every ending is sad because the only real ending for any of us is death. I frowned at her. It's a damn dark way to look at things, isn't it? No, it's not. She put a hand behind my neck and pulled me into a kiss. It stole my breath away, and when she let up, 
I was gasping for air and from the fire she'd stirred inside me. All it means, my love, is that you shouldn't be looking for a happy ending. You should enjoy every day like it's your last. Hold on to every second like it's the most incredible experience you'll ever have. Like it's the last memory anyone will ever have of you. In that case, I said, pulling her into my arms, crushing her against me. I definitely don't want to go to sleep. Chapter 22 Hyperdimensional translation in 60 seconds. Julie's voice was a distant buzz in my helmet earphones, like a whole world separated us rather than just the bulk of the jambo. I was watching the view from the bridge displays in my HUD, not bothering with the dimly lit interior of the shuttle. There was nothing to see inside the lander, nothing I wanted to see. Everything I wanted was on the bridge. It could be our last one together, I said, interrupting the by-the-book recitation of status reports on the bridge. Can't we just call it jumping out of hyperspace once? No, Julie snapped, the anger in her voice surprising me. Why not? She turned toward the video pickup, knowing where it was from previous conversations we'd had in this sort of situation. She was trying to keep her face angry, frowning, but the smile was working its way through against her will. Because hyperdimensional translation ain't like dusting crops, boy. I expected General Oliveira to chew us out, to insist we get serious, and that I stop interfering with his bridge crew. Instead, he laughed. He laughed long and hard, and the entire bridge crew joined him, even the ones who probably didn't even know what Julie was talking about. And I laughed, too, the smile on my face so broad it hurt. The joke was a gift. She was a gift. And every second I'd spent with her had been the greatest gift I could have been given. Thirty seconds, Julie said, once the laughter had died down and expressions had sobered. All personnel, Oliveira said. Strap in and secure for combat. I must have missed the announcements for ten and five, because the next thing I heard Julie say was, Translating now. Shift. It was the one word I had come up with to describe it. A shift in perspectives, as if we'd been facing one direction and were suddenly facing another. But the view on the screen told the real story, revealing the glorious blues and greens of Earth, so like her sister worlds among the stars, but also so distinctive and unmistakable. Coalition Space Command, Oliveira said after a signal from Adams that the connection was made. This is the USS James Bowie. Coalition Space Command. I barely kept back the snort of derision. Hyperspace was considered too campy to be used by the military, but they called themselves the damned Coalition Space Command. We read you, James Bowie. The reply came immediately. The voice young. Some lieutenant left on monitoring duty. Wait one. Connecting you to the White House. Uh-oh. The normal procedure would have been to link us to the Pentagon. Something was up. Sir? Adams said, with all the hesitance of a junior officer interrupting a general while he was waiting on a call from the White House. I'm picking up multiple emergency alert system broadcasts going out from Florida, Idaho, Virginia. She trailed off, her eyes going wide. Sir, they're talking about enemy troops on American soil. Multiple terrorist attacks, martial law. Thermal scans are registering explosions at the orbital defense platform, Davis added. He was trying to stay cool, professional, but he couldn't keep the plaintive tone out of his voice. There are at least ten, no, twelve spacecraft breaking high orbit, heading for translunar space. They're not ours. No transponder signals, different design, more primitive. Chinese, I guessed. Or Russians. Or both. Pops agreed. Not that it mattered when we were all connected via our comm units, but he was right beside me in the shuttle. The rest of the Delta team was on board, as well as Landry's Ranger platoon, while the rest of the Rangers and the crew Oliveira had deemed non-essential were spread throughout the rest of the birds. I think... His thoughts were interrupted by Tommy Caldwell, the President's National Security Advisor. He was a rough-hewn, jagged edge of a man at the best of times, and the bigger-than-life image of his face on the main screen revealed dark circles beneath his eyes, and new stress lines around his mouth, testimony of how bad things had been while we were gone. Oliveira, thank God you're back. I hope you have good news, because everything here has gone to shit. I have news, sir, but it's not particularly good. It's going to have to wait, then. 
Caldwell told him, hand slashing across the image. Things have come to a head here. The Russians and the Chinese are making their move. How, sir? Oliveira demanded, sounding almost outraged by the idea. With the security sensors and weapons technology the Helta gave us, how are we not wiping the floor with them? Because they weren't stupid enough to hit us in the face, Caldwell snapped. Not as if he was angry with Oliveira, but more like he was repeating his end of an argument he'd had more than once while we were gone. They smuggled troops and equipment in over the borders, brought them in cargo ships. And when they began hitting us two days ago, they were mixed into our population and rooting them out has been like trying to excise a tumor wrapped around your spinal cord. There have been extended firefights in Tampa, Virginia Beach, Boise, Seattle, and Portland, and we still don't know that we got them all. I didn't want to believe what he was saying, even though I'd seen it coming. The whole thing was coated with a gauzy haze of unreality, like a nightmare where I knew I was dreaming and still couldn't wake up. This is fucking nuts, Danny Brooks said, and I saw by the indicator in my HUD that she was talking to me privately from a shuttle dozens of yards away. Those are suicide attacks. They have to know they couldn't possibly live through that. They're desperate, I told her. We made them desperate. I've seen before what desperate people will do in Caracas. Are you saying this is our fault? She asked, her tone sharpening, the words an accusation. If we'd been in the same ship, she would have been glaring at me. No, ma'am, I said. I knew the attitude because I'd had it once, and I didn't take offense. It had taken me a while to realize that understanding the opposition wasn't the same thing as agreeing with them. There are some situations where there are winners and losers, and if you're not one, then you're the other. They were the losers, and even though we tried to cut them in for a sweet portion of the pie, they can't handle not being the ones in charge. It's called dominance hierarchy, and studies in animals have shown that more than food, more than health, more than even sex, all animals want power over others, and they'll do anything to get it. Caldwell was still talking, and I didn't know if I'd missed any of his report, but this seemed to be the important part. Just a few hours ago, they suckered all our high-altitude fighter wings with a drone strike launched on San Francisco from a submarine off the Pacific coast and they used the distraction to launch shuttles from Baikonur and Jokwan. We knew they'd been working on them, but we had no idea they were this close to launch. They have to be headed for the shipyards, and I need you to intercept them. Sir, we have bigger problems than the Russians and the Chinese. The Tavinians have cobbled together everything they have left after the Battle of Helta Prime, and they're throwing it at us. We came straight here from a skirmish at Alpha Centauri. The Truth Seeker was with us, but she's gone. Destroyed. Is the Delia Strawbridge ready for combat? Caldwell went pale, and I thought for a moment he was going to stumble backwards off the camera in a dead faint. But he rallied and snapped a quick series of orders to someone off camera. She is, he finally answered Oliveira's question. We cobbled together a skeleton crew from the personnel we had working on her in the yard, and they're boarding now, trying to get out ahead of the enemy shuttles. But we're not sure if she's going to be out of the chocks in time to intercept them. We need you to run interference to get in there and take out the shuttles so we can save the shipyard. Take us into high orbit, Colonel, Oliveira said to Julie, then turned back to Caldwell. What about the other two ships, sir? I know they aren't completely fitted out, but if they can fly, we need to get them out of there before the Divinians arrive. Honest to God, sir, if they can't fight, then we need to get them somewhere they can hide to preserve them from the enemy. Caldwell had muted his transmission to speak to whatever senior officer he had handy in his office to ask questions like that. Their drives are operational, he reported. One of them has a working particle cannon, but no impulse gun. The other doesn't even have that much, just point defense turrets. If it were possible for a man's face to turn grimmer, then I believe it would have. But we don't have crew up there for them yet, and we won't be able to send up any through the shit going on right now. A glint lit up his eye, a hopeful idea, finding purchase somewhere on the lava rock slopes of Mount Doom. But you could get the people to them, Michael. You have enough backup crew, right? Oliveira nodded, a frown etching more deeply into his face. Yes, sir, he said. I'll get backup crews in the shuttles and send them out immediately. Then we'll move to intercept the enemy shuttles. Good. Because if what you're saying is accurate, we need to clamp down on this situation now before the Tivinians arrive. Sir, Oliveira said. 
I know it's not my business or my command, but if the president has a bunker somewhere deep enough to protect against what's coming, I'd think about getting him to it. He's on his way, Caldwell assured him. Otherwise, he'd be talking to you now. Send me a status report when you're in position for an intercept. Caldwell touched a control below the level of the video pickup, and the screen went black. Oliveira touched a control on his chair. Auxiliary Control Room Crew Alpha, drop what you're doing and report to Shuttle 4 immediately. You're going to be running the bridge of one of the starships under construction at the L5 yards. Minimal crew, grab one of the engineering techs on the way. Crew Alpha, on the way. I assumed the voice was Colonel Tiger at the XO. He kept mostly with his backup crew and worked the shifts Oliveira was off, and I'd barely spoken to the man the few months he'd been on the ship. But I assumed he was competent, or the ship's commander wouldn't have kept him around. Shuttle 4 was one of the Ranger transports, its call sign technically Gunfighter 4, though I wasn't sure if anyone who didn't spend a lot of time riding the bird in combat would have known that. They had extra seats, and so did we, so I assumed the other crew would be heading our way. That's one, Oliveira said, as if to himself. Then he turned to Julie. Colonel Yeves, he said, you're going to be in charge of the second crew. Sir, she exclaimed, looking for once taken aback, you're going to need me on the bridge when the enemy ships get here. I need you exactly where I ordered you to go, Colonel. Grab the Bravo shift bridge crew and an engineering tech and get down to Shuttle 1. Her face contorted with indecision. I knew her, knew she wanted to argue with him. He knew it too, because he didn't give her the chance. Get moving, now, Colonel, he warned her an edge in his voice, before I call security to haul you down there in handcuffs. But then he smiled. Looks like you're getting that command whether you wanted it or not, Julie. She was, I judged, in agony, called away from the biggest fight in human history to captain the B-team. But she yanked the quick release on her restraints and stood, shoulders squared. Yes, sir, she said. Good luck, sir. It's been a pleasure serving with you, Colonel Nieves. She disappeared from the bridge cameras, heading, I knew, toward this shuttle, toward me. Maybe, I thought, we'd get the chance to die together after all. Couldn't you at least let me fly the shuttle? Julie asked, arms crossed over her chest, despite the boost, though I wasn't sure if her plaintive tone was put on or honest. She was in a space suit, as were all of the Space Force crew, and I couldn't see her face from this angle with the helmet in the way, but I could picture the pout. She hated to be on any ship she wasn't piloting. No, ma'am, Captain Lee said, with the good-natured rivalry of a former Air Force fighter pilot for a former Navy Airedale. You are a passenger on my bird, Colonel, and your time here is strictly temporary. I didn't know how they did it. We were boosting away from the Jambo at what I estimated was three or four gravities, but they both looked as if they could sing show tunes for all the effect it had on them. Are we... Going to make it to the station before the enemy? I asked, managing to squeeze the words out in a fairly normal tone at the cost of about twice the breath it normally took. I could still tie my helmet HUD into the shuttle's tactical readouts, could see the feeds from the external cameras, the LIDAR and radar, and what data we could still get from our satellite network, though much of that was down. Julia told me it had been taken out through the fairly low-tech expedient of scattering ball bearings in front of the satellites from Chinese and Russian kill vehicles they'd launched disguised as communications birds. I reckoned if we all lived through this that we were going to have to do something about using HELTA technology to harden the next generation against such methods. I would have laughed if two or three people hadn't been sitting on my chest. I'd actually had the thought we would all live through this. I wasn't usually that blindly optimistic. We hadn't all lived through any of this. Jambo had died on our very first mission, Delia Strawbridge, and a third of the Delta team had held to prime. Now Junpa was gone, and with every one of them, I'd felt like a piece of me had been sliced off and left behind. Satellites or no, I could still see the Chinese and Russian shuttles, boosting on their second stages now, out of high orbit and into translunar space. This would, I thought, be a historic moment for the Chinese and Russian space programs both. It was the farthest out either nation had sent a manned mission, and all it took to motivate them was the chance to rule the world. 
I could also see the Jambo heading for them, picking up speed as the drive field strengthened, repropagating after it had been shut down to let us launch. And the shipyards themselves were easy to make out, shining spider webs reflecting the sunlight. Radiators wasting heat into the vacuum lit up like signal flares. But I couldn't judge the distances, and certainly couldn't do the math to figure out intercept times. We wouldn't make it quite in time, Captain Lee informed me, very cheerful about the whole thing. But the Jambo will intercept them long before they reach the shipyards. He laughed, as if those fucking strap-on solid-fuel rockets could compete with the cruiser's drive field. I almost feel sorry for those dumb bastards. When the particle cannon turns them to ashes, they won't even know what hit them. Damn good thing we showed up when we did, Lopez added from the gunner's seat. If they'd gotten a toehold inside the station, that would have been a stone bitch for you guys getting them out. Gunfighter 1, this is Command. It was Adams on the Jambo, and I didn't think it was a good sign. Go ahead, Command, Captain Lee replied. Oliveira took over the transmission, and I knew this wasn't going to be good news. We have multiple hyperdimensional translations out past lunar orbit, Gunfighter. The enemy has arrived in our solar system. We're going to have to break off and meet them. I'm afraid you're on your own. Copy that, Command. Lee was still Captain Cool, at least on the outside, but my stomach was dropping. Guess I jinxed us, Lopez said. Sorry about that. They were here. I managed to turn my head against the force of the acceleration and caught Julie's eye. The words came of their own accord, no forethought, but they were apropos of both our current strategic situation as well as our personal one. I thought we'd have more time. Chapter 23 Ten more minutes, Lieutenant Lopez muttered. Ten more minutes and we could have taken them out with our shuttles before they docked. They hadn't tried to take any shots at us, if they'd had weapons at all, and we hadn't been in a position to shoot at them. We could have. Our coil guns had unlimited effective range in a vacuum, and the enemy shuttles didn't have the maneuverability to avoid them and still reach the shipyard. But we hadn't been trying to target them, leaving them to the jambo, and now, as Lopez kept reminding us, it was too late. The shipyard the Helta had helped us build were modeled after their own, and if I said it looked like the skeleton of a half a dozen skyscrapers laid side by side, welded together at the junctures and wrapped two-thirds of the way around three starships, with about half the gaps in the structure filled in with gleaming stretches of burnished bright alloy, I wouldn't have been doing it justice. Constructing the thing had taken almost as long as building the ships from the hyperdrives up, and the structures were large enough that we couldn't even see the docks where the enemy birds had put in from this side. Ten more seconds, Lee retorted, and the bears would have beat the dolphins in the championship last year, and I wouldn't have to listen to my cousin in Miami constantly talking shit whenever I visit. Stop whining. Free fall so soon after heavy boost did nasty things to my stomach, but it didn't last long. The thing about Helta is they don't like free fall any better than I did, and they did away with it whenever they could. And since they had artificial gravity technology, they could do away with it anywhere they could squeeze in a fusion reactor and the guts of a drive field generator. Not in something as small as a shuttle, but an installation as big as a shipyard, definitely. When we sat down on the moonward landing pad, that was my own personal term for it since it was the side of the station that permanently faced the moon rather than Earth, we had to hit the belly jets against a sudden tug of standard gravity. Standard gravity for us, which the Helta considered slightly on the heavy side. And as my teeth clacked together with the impact of the landing gear, I couldn't help but agree with them. We're down. Lee announced, redundant but still SOP, because until he'd made the call, the shuttle was his. Now that we were down, it was mine. Prepare for hard vacuum, I said, leaping up from my seat, knowing time was short and the Chinese and Russian troops already had a head start on us. Pops, hit the ramp in ten seconds. Ship's crew, stay behind us. Use us for cover and do not attempt to engage on your own. We are expendable, you are not which would make Julie mad and most of the Space Force crew very relieved. If they get into those ships before us, Pops told me on a private channel, hand hovering over the control for the ramp, you know how it's going to be. Yes, I do, I said, eyeing the Rangers mostly out of old habit. 
I'd always trusted the Delta team to know their job, but the Rangers had been an unknown quantity at first. By now, I knew that at least this platoon was squared away. Even Landry had gotten better since his baptism by fire in his first Purple Heart, though everyone else insisted on calling it the Purple Foot. And there's no point on dwelling on it, right? No, I suppose not. He slapped the ramp control. Hard vacuum warning! A klaxon, and our helmets told the same story, but even over it, I could hear the beginnings of the air rushing out of the gap in the belly ramp of the shuttle. Both faded quickly, and we were flooded with silence. The absolute darkness of sunless space creeping into the interior of the shuttle, battling for supremacy with the interior lights, the blackness attenuating the glare. Pops ducked under the ramp before it was halfway open, jumping out two meters up and landing with an eerie lack of sound from the impact. Preacher and Ringo followed. Dog held the others up, waiting until the ramp was all the way down, while the first three out checked security. Nothing out here, Pops reported. We're clear to the airlock. It galled me not to be out there with them, not to be the first out the door. If it had just been us, just the Delta team and me, I might have done it. They were savvy enough to make allowances for their crazy Marine commander. But with Landry's platoon and the Space Force crew along, I had to actually act like a senior officer and try to keep all the ants running in the same direction. I waited for him to shivvy his soldiers down the ramp, then clomped down next to him, waving for the Space Force crew to follow. The Rangers formed a perimeter on the bare metal landing pad watching the surrounding structures for any threats, despite the fact there was no way in hell the enemy could have reached this area from the opposite side of the dry dock yet. I didn't complain. It was good practice to do the right thing, even when you knew it wasn't necessary, and it gave them something to do. They were army, and worse than that, rangers. And if there was anything you didn't want, it was a bunch of bored army rangers with guns and explosives wandering around aimlessly. The Delta team was pulling security around the airlock, Pops standing by the controls, waiting on my okay. I counted the Space Force crew twice, making sure all of them had made it off the ramp, and no one was running back on board because they'd forgot their issued tablet. Because if there was anything worse than board rangers, it was Space Force crews trying to do anything tactical. Gunfighter 1, I called up to Lee. We're clear. The ramp was closing before the last syllable escaped my throat. Copy that, sir, Lee drawled. We're going to go strafe the shit out of those docked shuttles and make sure there's nothing left of them for the gomers to ride home after you chase them out. Shuttle One's belly jets were nearly invisible in the vacuum, just a glow near the exhaust vents lifting her off the pad, even as the next aerospacecraft touched down less than 50 yards behind her. That would be Brooks, with two more platoons of rangers and the second Space Force crew. The third was a glowing dot just slightly bigger than the surrounding stars, carrying the last two platoons, or Brooks's people, and the only heavy weapons we'd brought along on this mission. Normally, the Delta team would have a couple of the plasma guns, but this was our dry dock and our ships, and we really wanted to avoid burning pieces of them to cinders. Status on the strawbridge, Gunfighter One? I asked while Lee was still in range. She's free of the dry dock he told me, and making a course to support the Jambo. I killed my mic before I let myself sigh in relief. At least they'd made it out. Nine to two odds sucked, but not as badly as nine to one. Colonel Brooks, I called, picking out her IFF signature from the other Svalin suits loping toward us with stiff-legged strides. I'm going to take Lieutenant Landry's platoon with my team and Colonel Nieves's crew to ship Alpha which was the code name we'd given to the ship with the functioning particle cannon. You take Colonel Tigert and the others to Bravo, and leave the weapons platoon up here to guard our approaches in case any of the enemy shuttles make it past ours. And yes, Danny Brooks was a lieutenant colonel and I was a major, but my position on the ship was superior to hers, and I thought she trusted me enough not to question my tactical decision. Copy that, she said, and I didn't detect any sign of her nose being out of joint. That means you go right once we hit the main tunnel and we'll go left. Affirmative. The Alpha ship was toward the center of the shipyard, while Bravo was back to what was referred to in the plans as the North Pole of the structure, though what the hell that was supposed to mean in the context of a space station at the L5 Lagrangian point between the Earth and the Moon, I wasn't sure. 
It probably meant as much as me referring to the port bow of the Jambo. I checked behind us and saw the last shuttle touching down, the ramp opening to disgorge the last two platoons. Open the lock, Pops, I ordered, moving up beside him. The Delta team was stacked at the door, and I was grateful for the artificial gravity, because there was nothing quite as awkward as a bunch of Svalin suits trying to perform a tactical entry using magnetic anchors, and I had seen that before in training. Pops thumped the control, a pressure plate rather than a touchscreen because of the vacuum, and the outer door of the airlock opened immediately. No cracking or computer penetration needed because it was our own security. The lock was set in what had looked from overhead like a pimple in the silvery surface of the dry dock's outer skin, but close up was a maintenance workshop of some kind. What's this thing for, anyway? Quinn asked. Checking the IFF, I spotted him at the edge of the perimeter out to my left, down on one knee. It's for us to get in without having to fight our way in through the main docking locks on the other side of the station, I told him. Substituting dry humor for an actual answer, most of my attention on the rangers checking the interior of the lock. It's for performing exterior maintenance on this side of the station's surface, Julie told him, her laugh a burst of static in my headphones. Don't let Major Pain in the ass here fool you. He had no idea. Honey, I chided her. Not in front of the children. Room for a full squad in here, Pop said, half in and half out of the lock. I could take the team through, make sure the other side's clear and radio you. Negative, I told him. We don't have time for that. Then what do we have time for? He asked, his helmet cocking to his side in tandem with his head. I hadn't discussed this part with him because there hadn't been time, and because I hadn't thought of it. But I knew the way these systems worked because I'd studied them. Continuing education as assigned by General Oliveira for officer development. He'd been concerned I was promoted too early. I wanted to make sure I fully grasped the systems I'd be working with. At the time, I'd considered it mostly a pain in the ass, but leaning over the control panel, I appreciated the knowledge. Everything has a back door. I explained, happy that, for once, I could tell Pops something he didn't already know. Everything has an emergency override. The Helta thought we were nuts for including them, that there'd never be any reason for opening the airlock and disabling the emergency section seals, but we humans know there's always a reason for crazy shit like that. It took three separate passwords, then an extra one, because I couldn't show my eyes for a retinal scan, but finally... After warning me several times that what I was doing was contraindicated by safety recommendations, the panel flashed yellow and then red. If we'd been in microgravity, I would have warned the Delta team inside the lock to move out and stand aside. But against the 1G pull of the gravity plates, even the blast of air rushing out of the open airlock door couldn't knock over the heavy Svalin armor. I heard it at the first, the rush of air, giving the sound something to conduct through but the whooshing noise faded along with the blast of debris. Nothing big made it all the way out to the lock, just scattered bits of paper, cardboard and plastic, carried in a haze of dust. Before the last of the air had flushed out, the team was inside. I held my breath, as if I could hear gunshots or shouted warnings, my hindbrain unused to the idea of a hard vacuum mated with standard gravity but there was nothing other than sharp, brief commands and reports from the team as they pushed further into the base. I tried to follow them on the schematic projected in my HUD, but it wasn't a topographic map, and one room looked much like another in the blueprint. Are we worried, Julie asked me, about whether the Space Force crew and the Helta engineers were suited up? They should be, I said, not sounding too convincing. I'd thought about it on the flight over, wondered if there was any way to warn them without warning the enemy, but there wasn't, and I didn't have the luxury of agonizing over the decision. If the crew was going by the book, they would have suited up the minute the enemy shuttles were detected. If they weren't, I'd probably killed them. Clear. To the first junction, Pops told me. Landry, I said, I'm taking the crew in. You're behind me. I didn't know the other bridge officers Julie had brought along. They worked the off shift, or backed up the main crew, and I didn't make a habit of hanging out on the bridge when Julie and Oliveira weren't there. But they followed her lead, and she followed mine. I kept my KE rifle at high port, out of training and habit, 
not expecting any opposition because Pops wouldn't have missed a bunch of Russian mercenaries waiting for us. The corridors were broad and tall, the opposite of what I expected on a space station, but when you can pull power from fusion reactors and mineral resources from the moon and asteroids, you don't have to worry about conserving space, heat, or oxygen. There was enough room for the Delta team to set up on all four corners of the junction, staggered on either side of the corridor, and still leave space for the Space Force crew and me to get by. I held them up right at Dog's position at the front of the group and waved Landry forward. Take point, I told him, still trying to read the map. The next junction is a hundred meters that direction. I indicated our right with a slash of my left hand. When we reach it, pull security, and the Delta team will leapfrog your platoon. I'm taking the other crew north, Brooks told me, her people moving up, displacing Landry's platoon as it moved to the front. Good luck, Gandy. See you on the other side, Colonel, I told her. And then they were gone, disappearing down the hallway in utter silence. I waited until I was sure every one of them was through the lock, then I closed it behind us and set the air to recirculate. Why? I wasn't sure. Maybe a guilty conscience and the idea that I'd trapped our own people in a pressurized compartment. Or maybe it was the unnatural silence. Mostly, I think it was because air meant options, and I liked having options. You coming, boss? Pops asked me, standing at the center of the junction, impatience obvious in his stance. We don't want to keep the Chinese Space Force waiting. I wanted to tell him not to wait for me, but I knew it was useless. Pops had this weird idea that it was his job to keep me alive. I could hear my footsteps. It was a little thing, but it meant the air had returned. I hadn't noticed the sound of it chugging back through the vents, but the echoing clomps of our footsteps told me the station's air tanks had replenished the atmosphere. It was the only thing that had changed, the only obvious measure of the time we'd been moving through the endless hallways of the huge facility. The cruisers were huge ships, hundreds of yards long, and the Delia Strawbridge had been between our airlock and Alpha, which meant we had more than a mile to hike, and the enemy would be there long before we were. The base had a security platoon, but they were just Space Force security forces, with M-37 carbines, not rangers in Svalen armor. I didn't have much confidence in their ability to hold off Chernobog, even in their cut-rate Russian-powered exoskeletons. Security halt, Pop said, and a drum solo's worth of pounding metal feet slowed to a halt. Rangers and Delta Force spread out to either side, and I fought an instinct to go to the front. That was something that I had never gotten used to, being able to talk normally and use the radio even in combat. The laser line of sight was secure against the enemy picking it up, and if the helmets weren't soundproof, well, the thunder of our footsteps was better advertising than some muffled voices. Final junction up here, sir, Pops told me. Taking a knee beside Julie, I tapped into Pops's helmet camera and saw what he saw. The map showed our position, and even if it hadn't, I'd been staring at it in overlay long enough to know. We were in the main corridor, on what was nominally the west side of the base, a convenient way of referring to the section of skeletal metal scaffolding that stretched over the port side of Alpha. The section we were traveling through was narrow, compared to the open scaffolding, just wide enough for storage bays of construction equipment, food, spare parts, spacesuits, and half of the crew quarters. The crew compartments and storage bays were all sealed, closed automatically when the lock opened, and I just had to hope the workers had been smart enough to stay inside and keep their heads down. A lot of them were civilians, hired by Gatlin Aerospace, and if I hadn't actually met quite a few of them, I would have thought they'd be running for cover at the first sign of trouble. The problem was, a lot of them were ex-military and tended to run toward trouble, and you wouldn't know anything about that. We were at the final intersection now, the one we'd have to take east to get to the service airlock for Alpha. There were none on the west side. The only way onto the ship from over here would have been to jam everyone into the construction pods and try to fly over to one of the emergency airlocks on the hull. And I'd thought about that, but again, it would have wasted too much time. Pops stared east from the intersection, and I stared with him. The walls were gray and sterile, the hallway deserted. It seemed arrow straight, but I knew that was an optical illusion. It curved gently but inexorably over the spine of Alpha, and when we topped the hump in that curve, the enemy would see us coming. 
Landry, your people are back on point. Move out. You sure about that, sir? Pops asked me. The channel was private, but even then the question was cautious and couched. Pops wanted his team out front, and normally so would I. The rangers were up again, stampeding forward, champing at the bit like untamed horses. Yeah, I told him. I'm going to need you and the team on board that ship to clear it. My reply was as vague as his question, but his quiet grunt told me he'd understood the implication. Whoever went first was going to take the brunt of the enemy attack and the brunt of the casualties. I'm moving up with the Delta team, I announced on the general net, to let Landry and Pops know where I would be when the bullets started to fly. Andy, Julie said, putting a hand on my arm. I didn't feel it through the armor, but I saw it and turned back to her. She motioned toward my chest. Give me a pistol. I blinked at her, wondering why she would ask that, then realized neither she nor the rest of the crew had been given the opportunity to draw sidearms. There hadn't been enough time. Most of the Space Force types, I would have figured they were better off unarmed, since they'd probably never heard a shot fired in anger. But Julie... I pulled the Glock from its holster and passed it to her, then grabbed the spare magazine from the pouch beneath it and handed that over as well. You're going to take the ship and run, right? I asked her. You know me well enough to want to marry me, Andy, she said, tucking the spare magazine in an external pocket and checking the load of the pistol. What do you think? I wanted to argue with her, but that was a losing battle, and I already had one losing battle to fight. Love you. I told her instead, follow me in. Chapter 24 The rangers had charged straight into hell, as rangers always do. I arrived twenty seconds after, an eternity in a battle, loping into a haze of smoke and expecting to take a machine gun round with every step. But the battle at this end of the corridor had ended, passed on toward the service locks, leaving only the dead behind. They were Chernabog. Their armor was thick, their suits superior to anything we could have put out two years ago, but bulky and primitive compared to the Svalon, easy to spot. It would have protected them against the M37s of the Space Force security guards, but it was nearly useless against the KE rifles. Tungsten darts had ripped chunks out of the chest plates, peeled away helmets, left nothing but fragile flesh once the illusion of invulnerability was stripped away. I remembered reading a paper about the Soviet Army during the early 1980s, the height of the Cold War. They'd issued body armor to their normal frontline troops, but when the Mujahideen in Afghanistan had gotten a hold of it and passed it along to the CIA, we discovered it was just cotton. The Soviets hadn't been able to afford Kevlar. This wasn't quite as bad as that, but the results were the same. I counted four of them. A fire team, then. A bit less than our regular infantry fire team, but the suits were expensive. We'd shrunk our squads, and they'd done the same. They'd probably been left near the junction as an observation post, to watch for threats. And the rangers had plowed through them like they weren't there. The ranger platoon was over the curve, out of line of sight, and I'd lost them on IFF. But the sounds of the firefight crackled in my headphones, amplified by my helmet's audio pickups. The sound of one side of the firefight, anyway, because the hum-snap-crack of our KE guns was lost against the staccato drumbeat of heavy machine guns. Their reports echoed back to us around the curve in the station, distorted and tinny but instantly recognizable. 12.7 millimeter cords, the same thing the Chernabog had been using the last time we'd faced them. A deep-throated thunder. And then... Something else, something like a gong the size of a shuttle being rung by the round from a coil gun, an explosion, another. Mines? I gasped to Pops, only a few feet in front of me. The walls blurred on either side of us, our pace outstripping an Olympic sprinter. Recoilless rifles, he said, the words clinical, as if they didn't mean death for our own people, for rangers we knew by name, who we'd trained with for over a year. The haze was getting thick, rolling down the broad corridor ahead of us with the echoes of detonations, promising death and destruction, and I was at the point where I just wanted to get there and get it over with. And then I got there. The service lock for the ship was huge, nearly thirty yards across, meant for hauling in cargo and heavy equipment using powered loading jacks, and I'd expected the enemy to have pushed through already, to run right over the Space Force security force 
I'd underestimated the Zumi bastards. They hadn't had too long, maybe a couple hours since they found out the enemy shuttles were heading their way, but they hadn't wasted the time. They'd closed the cargo lock doors for Alpha, of course. They'd have been morons if they hadn't. But those doors were tucked into a niche just below the hangar bay, not thickly armored like the rest of the ship, because they had to open. And a few pounds of high explosive would have torn through without making the ship unusable. But the security force troops had hauled a couple dozen heavy metal cargo containers across the entrance corridor end to end, like barricades on Omaha Beach on D-Day. And those ornery little fuckers were still there. Human heat signatures glowed on IR, back behind the cargo containers, along with the oblong shapes of crew-served weapons, although they weren't firing right now. They were, perhaps, the only people not firing. The rangers had no cover, nowhere to hide, so they hadn't tried. They'd charged into the Chernobog forces, and I could see the bodies they'd left behind. The armor peeled away from them where the warheads had detonated, just too much for the high-tech armor supported by the high-tech exoskeleton. I didn't have time to read their IFF signatures, didn't have time to mourn them, just a half second to note the number. Four dead. Four dead in seconds, nearly 200 yards away from the Russian positions. And the Russians did have positions, because after all the nice things I'd thought about the security forces, they'd gone and left the cargo jacks they'd used to move the containers out on the other side of the damned barrier. I guess I couldn't really blame them, since they had to move the containers in from the loading bay outside the ship, and once the barriers were in place, there'd be no way to get the last of the loading jacks inside. But damn it. Someone should have run them down the corridor or something, because the Russians were using them for cover. And if the Chernobog machine guns and recoilless rifles couldn't penetrate the thick, heavy cargo containers, probably filled with iron ore fillings for the fabricators, then the security force guns couldn't penetrate their own robotic cargo loaders either. And neither could our KE guns. The cargo jacks were basically remotely controlled forklifts the size of a front loader slash backhoe, tons of metal rolling atop the sort of caster-style wheels the Helta favored, and not even a tungsten dart traveling at nine or 10,000 feet per second could cut all the way through them. And I'd arrived just in time to see Lieutenant Landry fuck up royally. It was like a still-life painting, the ranger platoon in a wedge formation charging across the empty space between us and the cargo jacks, tracer rounds streaking an angry red through their ranks, a pair of recoilless rifles discharging with flares of pale yellow, their warheads frozen in mid-flight, and I wanted to scream at the man to break off. But the frozen second was an illusion, and reality caught up with it in a double explosion of warheads striking home. The weapons were SGM-50s, magazine-fed recoilless rifles, the replacement for the old SPG-9 that had been around since the 1960s, fielded for the first time in Venezuela. They'd mounted them on technicals there, Toyota pickup trucks, and drove them up behind our strikers before they fired. I'd lost a whole fire team to the things, and I hated them with a fiery passion before I ever heard of Chernobog. Three rangers went down pieces of them tumbling away, charred metal and flesh, and God only knew where one ended and the other began, and I finally got the words out. Rangers, get behind cover! But Landry couldn't hear them, because he was one of those charred bodies on the expanse of metal floor. He traveled with us to worlds light years away, but he died within sight of home. Someone took charge, though, because the whole formation curved to their right, heading for the cargo containers and shelter from the rain of enemy warheads. They weren't going to make it, though. There was too much open space to cover, too much time under fire. Unless someone laid down suppressive fire. Shit. Julie, I said, take your crew and head for the cargo containers. Don't fucking stop. Get on that ship and get her out of here. We'll take care of these guys. Pops, bring the team and follow me. I hadn't slowed up and neither had Pops, but half the team had stayed back with Julie and the crew, and now they broke off and came after us. We headed left, around the curve of the wall of the docking bays where the enemy shuttles had landed, away from the cargo doors. The Russians might not even have seen us as focused as they were on the Rangers and the Space Force positions, but I wanted them to notice us. So I raised my KE rifle to my shoulder and gave them a subtle reminder we were there. They were hunkered down to avoid fire from the front right, but there was a whole squad of them sheltered behind the closest of the cargo jacks, 
who were wide open on the left rear. Recoil seemed to slow my sprint with each touch of the trigger, but each of my hypervelocity rounds took a Russian mercenary down with it, three of them dying with as many shots, the gimbal mount and the computer tracking doing for our armor what a much larger and more cumbersome version had first managed decades ago for the M1 tank. I wish I was a good enough marksman to make three headshots in a row on the run, but I had to give the suit's targeting system the credit. Two more went down to Pops, before the rest bolted from cover, trying to get to one of the other jacks, one with more shelter from this angle. The Space Force crews didn't have Svalins, but they did have KE rifles. Big crew-served weapons fired from a tripod with a power pack hooked into a wheeled dolly the A-gunner had to drag along, looking for all the world like an old World War I Lewis gun. They were heavy and awkward to transport, but they did a lot more than the M37 carbines could. What was left of the Chernabog squad didn't live to regret they'd broken cover which left the Delta team in the uncomfortable position of being the center of attention. I'd wanted it, wanted to draw their fire, but I also didn't want to die. We didn't have time to follow the Rangers to cover, and wouldn't have even if we did, because I was trying to keep the Russians focused on us until Julie got behind those cargo containers. We couldn't turn around, or we'd be exposed to enemy fire the whole way and wouldn't be able to shoot back. The only way left was left. Back into the corridor where Chernobog had come from toward their shuttles. And if we were heading back toward their shuttles, they'd have to pay attention. I didn't bother giving an order. The team knew to follow me. I just began backing into the corridor, firing off round after round from the hip, not hitting any of the Russian mercenaries, but keeping them looking my way. Recoilless rifle warheads streaked past me, barely visible, until they hit the wall twenty or thirty yards farther down, the concussions rocking me even through the armor. Fragments of metal pinging off my armor. Something large and going very fast smacked right off the side of my helmet, and I glanced over my shoulder, making sure I wasn't backing into an enemy position. I was, but it wasn't armed Chernabog mercenaries waiting for me back by the row of shuttle docking collars. It was a cluster of smaller figures in Chinese-made spacesuits. I'd seen them on the news and in propaganda videos they'd put out, with their distinctive red highlights and the yellow stars on the left breast. I couldn't see the faces through their polarized visors, but the rifles they were firing at us were hard to miss. Type 95 automatic rifles, bull pups with the magazine behind the pistol grip. They were distinctive and used by only one country, the People's Republic of China. The Chinese were the pilots, the Chernabog mercenaries, the muscle. The 5.8mm slug smacked into my armor with petulant whines and little other effect, and I decided I didn't want to waste KE rifle rounds on the Chinese flight crew. The grenade launcher unfolded off my back like the wing of some giant insect, and I barely took the time to aim, just sending a burst of three frag rounds into the middle of eight space-suited figures. The detonations were muted thumps small puffs of black smoke that reminded me of the pop of a firecracker in our cul-de-sac on July 4th when I was a kid, but the Chinese flight crew seemed quite impressed, and they stopped trying to kill us and concentrated on trying not to bleed out. The bastards might keep us from getting the Alpha ship, but they wouldn't be taking it anywhere. I had my grenade launcher out, so I figured I might as well shoot it a little more, particularly since I couldn't get a clean shot at the mercenaries from back in the docking corridor. A flick of my finger switched the load from fragmentation to armor piercing and the targeting to proximity overhead burst. I waited until I felt the solid clunk of the new rounds sliding into the chamber before I fired. The cargo jacks were a solid line across this side of their position, but there was movement through the gaps, just shadows of armored figures, enough for me to aim. I fired off half a dozen rounds and was startled when a few dozen more streaked out from beside me. I'd been so involved with my own part of the battle, I hadn't even noticed the rest of the team filtering in beside me, taking up positions on either side of the corridor. The first ones in, Dog, Ringo, and Preacher, had set themselves on watch down toward the shuttle airlocks, but the others had followed my lead and peppered the enemy positions with grenade fire. The grenades detonated in a chain fire, 
as if the blast from one had caused sympathetic explosions in the others, and streams of incandescent plasma rained down on the Chernobog positions, sintered metal ignited into flaming gas by the explosive core. They were brand new tech, barely tested, much less battle-proven, and I had no idea whether they could penetrate the Chernobog armor, but they would at least keep their heads down. I pushed out toward the entrance of the corridor, emboldened by the covering fire, and saw what was left of the ranger platoon reaching cover behind the cargo containers. The gaps left by the Space Force security troops were small, barely enough for a single ranger to squeeze through at a time, and some of them didn't bother to wait, using the enhanced musculature of their exoskeletal legs to leap onto the containers, grabbing handholds and skittering over the top like cockroaches fleeing the light. Julie and the Space Force crew were right behind them, running as fast as they could in pressure suits, an awkward, waddling stomp. I fired another volley from my grenade launcher to try to cover them, convinced the Russian mercenaries were going to risk exposing themselves to our fire to try to take out the crew. White smoke curled toward the ventilation ducts and DNA spirals as metal burned, obscuring my view, but through the thermal filters, red hot fallen armor came out from the cover of the cargo containers to escort the Space Force crew in. One of the rangers was Quinn, the other his squad leader McAfee, or so the IFF told me, and I would have to take its word since they all looked alike in armor. When the last of the bridge crew disappeared behind the cargo containers, I vowed to buy Quinn a drink when this was all over, assuming he was old enough to drink. I moved my shoulder against the left-hand wall and took a knee out of instinct, a feeling that we'd reached a tipping point. We'd kept Chernabog pinned down for almost a minute, and they had to know their whole operation was falling apart. They weren't going to sit there with their heads down, not when they still had ammo left to burn and lives left to waste. The only question was whether they'd make a run toward our positions behind them, try to get back to their shuttles, or if they'd make one final push for the ship. As if some ancient trickster god were reading my mind, the shuttles from the Jambo chose that exact moment to make a firing run on the docked enemy birds. I'd known they'd be coming for them eventually, and honestly, I wondered what was taking them so long. Now I knew they'd just been fucking with me, waiting for the exact wrong time to launch those damned missiles. The explosions were out in the soundless vacuum, but the enemy shuttles were connected to the corridor by the airlocks. The metal conducted the sound and the vibration, the burning atmosphere blowing out of the ships and through the locks with the force of the explosions. There were ten airlocks on this side of the dry dock, and four of them had been occupied. I hadn't been able to tell before, but now it was easy to count the four white-hot jets of fire flashing through the locks, blowing the doors out of their frames, ripping the docking umbilicals away in a hail of metal fragments. I should, I realized, have left the whole fucking place in a vacuum and not been so damned smart. The heat washed over me, reminiscent of stepping off the ramp of a transport plane in Kuwait on a midsummer afternoon, not quite a burn, not through the armor, but a crackling of the sweat on my skin vaporizing, robbing me of the next few breaths I took. The concussion would have knocked me down had I been standing, would have killed me outright if I hadn't been wearing the Svalin suit, but the most dangerous thing it did was distract me. Vacuum warnings were ringing in my ears, lights flashing at the corners of my HUD, and debris was tumbling out of the gaps in the wall where the airlocks had been. If I hadn't screwed with the emergency seals earlier, the compartment would have been cut off from the rest of the station, and the outflow of air would have ceased in seconds. When I had hit the controls to refill the atmosphere, I had neglected to undo my little admin trick with the seals. The whole station was emptying out of those four holes and taking everything not nailed down with it, everything that was left after the first time. The Russians had to be as surprised as we were, but I had to give whoever was leading them the credit he was due. They used the opportunity charging into the teeth of the defense, counting on the explosions to distract the rangers as it had us. Recoilless rifles fired in the eerie silence, just a slight flare from the ignition of their propellant's onboard oxidizer betraying their discharge, the explosion of their warheads vibrating through the floor like a door slamming. They punched through the outer skin of the cargo containers, but didn't penetrate far the gout of burning metal from their detonation only a couple yards into the payload. But it didn't have to. 
All it had to do was keep the rangers' heads down, keep the Space Force defenders behind cover long enough for the Chernobog mercenaries to get across that hundred yards of open space. I needed to move, needed to get my K.E. gun into action, but it seemed like I was moving through mud, like time had slowed down just for me while everyone else ran at full speed. Julie, I transmitted, get on that fucking ship, now! The words seemed to throw time back into gear, and I was back on my feet, the M900 at my shoulder. Julie might have answered, but I couldn't hear her voice over the blood pounding in my ears and the vibration of the K.E. rifle discharging, its stock smacking against my shoulder. Hell, she might have been on the ship already, and I would have no way of knowing. The spacesuits didn't have IFF transponders like the Svalins, and the last I'd seen of her was thirty seconds ago, maybe more when she disappeared from sight behind the cover. The Russians were making a suicidal push because it was the only thing left to them, determined to make it past the Rangers, past the Space Force troops, and onto the ship, to use it for shelter if they couldn't steal it outright. And I had to make sure they got the suicide part without getting the ship. I didn't even think about leading from the rear this time, didn't consider how nuts it was for me to be walking point. Beyond the threat to Julie, which would have been enough, this was the last stand. We all knew it, had known it, days ago. This was fourth down in the final seconds of the championship game, and if the quarterback had to run the ball into the 300-pound defensive lineman, then he would. Chernobog mercenaries fell to tungsten darts, some mine, some from the Delta team, and a squad or two of them turned on us at the back of the company-sized gaggle, machine guns, firing. Something smacked into my chest and drove the wind out of me, and I ignored it and pushed forward. Andy! It was Julie, and I decided she hadn't answered me earlier because this one came through loud and clear. I'm on the bridge. Should I wait for you and the rangers to board? Negative. Launch now. Get the hell out of here! As much as I wanted to be with her, to face the end with her, there was no way we could get on board the ship without letting Chernobog in after us, and the attempt would just get more of us killed. I cut down two more of them and took another round to the gut for my trouble, the impact like being hit with a baseball bat. All it would take was one of those machine gun rounds hitting me in the helmet, and I'd be dead. My air seals, broken. But there was no safety in turning back, no safety to be had in any direction, so I might as well go down swinging. The first line of mercenaries hit the cargo containers, swarming over them. Two, three of them stiffening and falling backwards, cut down at the last second but more made it over while the Delta boys and I were tied up with the rear guard. Ten of the Russians fell, twelve, fourteen, and three of our own IFF signals went dark. Preacher was gone, never more to bore us all with the glories of CrossFit and a low-carb diet. Vander Hayden, who hadn't been around long enough to earn a nickname, though we'd called him Van anyway because no one wanted to say that mouthful every time. And Pepper, who hadn't been on the team much longer than Van, but they'd given him a nickname anyway because he was a Thai American and none of us could pronounce his real name without butchering it. I hadn't had time to get to know them as well as the original team, but they were the best of the best. No one made Delta without being the cream of the crop of Rangers or Special Forces, and no one got assigned to this unit without being the best Delta had to offer, and almost as important, being able to get along with others, which meant they were all good people the kind you enjoyed working with. And if we gave Preacher shit for being such an enthusiast, it was because that was the only annoying trait he had that stuck out. They were all family men, all with a wife and kids back home. And if by some miracle I lived through this and there was anything to go home to, I would be the one who had to visit each of those wives and tell them personally what had happened to their husband. Some safety flicked off inside my head, some barrier that kept me on this side of crazy, and I waded into the middle of the enemy. Machine gun rounds thumped against my chest and shoulders at nearly point-blank range, and warning lights flashed, telling me I was coming dangerously close to a loss of structural integrity. Stupid computer. I was way beyond any sort of structural integrity. I held the M900 out in front of me like a pistol, firing through the helmet of one mercenary soldier and into the chest of another, grabbing the dead Russian by the jagged rim of his shattered helmet and throwing him and his cut-rate copy of a powered exoskeleton ten feet through the air. 
He impacted crossways at thigh level of a pair of Chernobog soldiers who were trying to back away from our charge, like he was throwing a body block, and both of them went tumbling backwards, crashing to the ground. They made not a sound, and my brain rebelled at the unnatural silence, so I shot them. I had the vague sense of more Russians going down around me, of a hail of tungsten slugs passing on either side of me, and the tiny portion of my brain still devoted to rational thought wondered if the rest of the team was actively covering for me, if they knew I'd gone bug nuts and had just resigned themselves to backing me up. Too close for the rifle, I lashed out with my left forearm, sweeping away the barrel of a cord machine gun, then stamping down into a knee. The mechanical joint gave way, and the flesh-and-blood version failed an instant later, bending the leg backward. I swung the butt of the M900 just the way I'd been taught in bayonet training, smashing through a helmet visor and not knowing whether it had been enough to kill the man inside or if the vacuum would do the job. And if I had no bayonet to slash forward for the follow-through, it was the thought that counted, and I could still hear my drill sergeant bellowing, the Marines shouting back the chorus as if their lives depended on it, as if it was some Lutheran prayer. What are the two types of bayonet fighters? The quick and the dead. What makes the grass grow? Blood. Blood makes the grass grow. Marines make the blood flow. Someone was screaming into my earphones, and I was about to tell them to shut up and get off the net when I realized it was me. I skidded to a halt, and I was 50 yards past where I had been, right at the edge of the barrier, and Chernobog troops were laid out all around me. Some had been shot. Others had arms or legs bent the wrong directions, their visors broken, their eyes bloodshot from the sudden pressure difference. But the only enemy left was on the other side of that barrier. I didn't have IFF signals for the Space Force security troops, didn't know how many of them were dying on the other side of the cargo containers, but the Rangers would be engaging next, taking on the Russian body armor at point-blank range, and there was no way we were going to get to them in time to help. I was so wrapped up in the moment I hadn't given any thought to what would happen when the ship launched. I'd been on the shuttle enough that I was used to the hammer-blow vibration of the steering thrusters when the aerospacecraft maneuvered in microgravity. The maneuvering thrusters on the cruisers were each the size of the main drive on a shuttle, and when they fired, the superstructure of the station rang like a handbell, and I fell flat on my ass and skidded across the floor. One of the cargo containers was tossed out as well pulling the veil back over the battle behind the barrier. At first, I was terrified that everyone was dead. But then I saw armored figures rolling to their feet and realized they'd simply been knocked down. Some of them. Some didn't try to get up. A lot of theirs and some of ours. I could tell the bad guys easy enough. They were the ones wearing armor but lacking an IFF signal. There weren't that many left alive after the suicidal climb over the top. Seven or eight, only a squad. But three had those damned recoilless rifles. My M900 was trapped under me, and I pushed away from the floor with my offhand, trying to free it. But the Chernobog soldiers fell back to the floor, hypervelocity darts cutting them down halfway to their feet. I twisted around and saw Pops and Ringo firing from behind me, Quinn and a couple of rangers from his fire team shooting from the other side. The Chernobog squad was down and the rangers were still shooting. Cease fire! Cease fire! Pops yelled it before I had the chance, but Quinn and the others listened. I thought. I couldn't hear the discharge of the guns, but the bodies stopped jerking from the impacts. We're clear, I said, the words coming automatically as I checked the sensors by instinct. We're clear. Casualty report. The words were automatic, a remnant of another life. I could see the dead on my IFF, the monitors and their suits reporting the lack of vital signs. The three Delta and... Jesus. There were about two squads left from Landry's platoon. I'd known it would be bad, but I hadn't thought it would be that bad. The highest-ranking ranger left was Quinn squad leader Sergeant McAfee. We have two walking wounded, Pops told me after a long pause to gather the information himself. Dog and Jumper. Dog has a broken left arm. Jumper thinks he has cracked ribs, but their suits are still airtight. Sir, McAfee began, then stopped. His sob was cut off when he turned off his mic for a moment, and when he came back on, he had composed himself. First platoon has 13 effectives. No wounded, worth mentioning. 
Everyone who got what might have been a survivable wound died from damaged air seals. Shit. And that was why I'd replenished the atmosphere, even though it hadn't wound up making a difference. I opened my mouth to give an order and realized I didn't have one to give. What the hell were we supposed to do now? Pops, I said. Double check the enemy. I don't want any of these fuckers suddenly coming to life and shooting us in the back. Have someone see if any of the Space Force survived. I doubted it. Not a one of the space-suited defenders had moved, and they looked to have been torn apart by the machine guns, but we had to make sure. Yes, sir. His voice was grim. He'd lost men before, but I knew for him it was like watching his own children die. McAfee, you with me? I asked. He was still sitting on the ground beside the corpse of Sergeant Kim, the platoon sergeant, not moving an inch. He didn't answer, and I caught a glimpse through his visor of his eyes staring straight ahead, unseeing. I sighed. I understood, and maybe it didn't make any difference at this point. Quinn, I said, have your people police the dead for spare ammo. Yes, sir. He sounded nearly as shaken as McAfee, but I had confidence he'd be able to pull his shit together. I thought it was likely a waste of time, but I knew I had to try to contact the element down at Bravo. Colonel Brooks, I called. Do you copy? Nothing. I tried again, and this time I got a reply, but not from Brooks. Major Clanton, do you read? Over. It was Captain Lee, his voice crackling with static. I read you, Lee. Ship Alpha has launched and all enemy forces at this end are down. What's the situation out there? Over. The situation is... We're fucked, sir. The Tavinians brought three carriers with them, and the whole place is swarming with fighters. We're heading out to give what help we can, and I wanted to let you know we won't be able to pick you up. Not that you'd want us to. Also, I have negative contact with Colonel Brooks at Bravo. The ship is still in the dry dock, and none of the rangers are reporting back. You might want to swing by that end of the facility and check out the situation. Good luck. Over and out. I took a long, analytical look at the people I had left. Most of the rangers were still sitting or kneeling, too stunned by their losses to get their brains functioning, though Quinn and a couple of people from his fire team were moving, pulling spare ammo drums off their fallen brothers and sisters. The Delta survivors were doing better, but they weren't superhuman. Dog was down on a knee by Preacher, hand on the dead man's shoulder. I made a decision. Pops, Quinn, I said. You two are coming with me. We're going to the other end of the dry dock to check on Colonel Brooks and the other element. Gunfighter One couldn't contact them and Bravo was still in the dock. What about the rest of us, sir? Quinn asked. Dog, you're in charge of everyone back here, I told him. I want you to find a sealed compartment. I know there are crew quarters and you have the codes to access them. Seal yourself inside and activate the emergency air reserves. There should be food and water available. And wait there for how long, sir? Dog asked. Until someone comes to get you out. Who, uh, sir? Tell me something, sir, Pop said, he and Quinn falling into a loose wedge formation with me at the head, just between the two of us. Yeah, I prompted. I hoped he wasn't going to ask me something deep about the men who'd died because I was trying very hard not to let myself deal with that just yet. When I did, it wouldn't be pretty, and it wouldn't be short. Did you really yell blood makes the grass grow and marines make the blood flow in the middle of a battle? Chapter 25 The silence grated at my nerves. Even my own footsteps were just muted vibrations through my suit drowned out by the chuff of my breath. I could have talked to Pops and Quinn, but it would have been tactically unsound to distract them and me from our surroundings. The hallways were broad, reminiscent of a concourse at an NFL stadium if the stadium had been built from solid metal rather than concrete. How long had it been since I'd been to an NFL game? Fifteen years? Twenty? I hadn't especially missed it, but now I promised myself I'd take Julie to a game. I was promising myself a lot of things lately, and it was easy to do because I figured I'd never have to keep them all. Nothing moved in the silence, but I hadn't expected it to. We were retracing our steps to the junction, and the ground was familiar, as barren and empty on the way back as it had been on the way in. I picked up the pace, despite the exhaustion of multiple adrenaline dumps dragging at me. Past the junction, the ground was new to me, but not unfamiliar. 
It was a mirror image of the other side of the station and seemed just as deserted until we reached a storage compartment just over the curve that would lead us to the Bravo ship. The door should have been sealed, but it was cracked open like someone had been peeking out of it, checking the hallway. I held up a hand and motioned at the door, knowing I could talk without being overheard, but giving in to old habits learned as a Marine infantry officer. Pops, I said, forcing myself to talk because it was stupid not to. You're first through. Quinn, watch our backs. There was nothing fancy about the approach. Quinn and I stacked at the door, and Pops ducked through. Friendlies, Pops' warning came only through a half second before I saw them myself. There were four of them crouched in the lee of stack of plastic totes, dressed in bright orange vacuum suits, hands raised and trembling. There wasn't much light in the storage room, so I couldn't see through their visors at first, but something about their body language and the shape of their suits told me immediately that they weren't human. Please do not shoot, one of the Helta engineers begged us, thrusting his hands up further, as if the elevation had some bearing in our decision whether or not we killed him. Put your hands down, Pops told him, bringing the barrel of his K.E. rifle to high port. What are you doing in here? Hiding, the Helter replied, as if it was a dumb question. Trying not to get killed, he waved at the shadows behind him. Trying to take care of him. I hadn't noticed the body laid out behind them. The spacesuit was blue, Space Force colors, but there was no IFF signal or name tape and I couldn't see through the visor in the shadows. I took a knee beside him and shined my suit's external light into the helmet, moving from one side to the other until it hit the visor at the right angle to not reflect off. It's Colonel Tigert, I announced. The XO's eyes were unfocused, and his suit was, on closer inspection, charred and battered, gouged in a dozen places. Although not punctured, there was a trickle of blood coming off a pressure cut over his eyebrow, and his mouth worked soundlessly. I think he has a concussion, I added. I looked back at the Helta, forgetting to turn my light off, and the alien's visor polarized against the glare. What happened? Where were you guys? Where did you find him? We were hiding in here, the Helta told me. The base commandant, your Colonel Whitley, she told us to hide, told everyone who could not make it to the solar storm shelter to hide wherever they could when the announcement was made that there were enemy ships coming. We heard the gunfire, and then there were several large explosions, and then the air leaked out, and we... He made an exaggerated shrug. Well, I went, and... You should show them, Fen Suyan, one of the other engineers suggested. He showed us. I'd thought we might be charging into a battle at the Bravo lock, but I was wrong. Instead, we walked into the aftermath of a slaughter. Oh, my God. That was Quinn. This was his company, or it had been. Their bodies were mixed with the Russians, well, parts of them. I didn't know what exactly had happened, but I had a clue. The airlocks were blown out here just like they'd been back at Alpha, and for the same reason. The shuttles had done a firing run on the enemy birds, but this time it hadn't just caused an atmosphere leak. What the hell happened here? Pops asked, walking amidst the scorched, flash-frozen pieces of metal-encased human flesh. I mean, God damn it, Andy, what the hell happened? I wanted to close my eyes, but I didn't think it would help. The image would be burned into my brain forever. The walls were scored from shrapnel, blackened and peeled from heat, but most of the blast had been directed forward. It had shredded everything ahead of it, three platoons of rangers and most of a company of Chernobog, and, as far as I could tell, all of the Space Force crew besides Tigert. The Space Force security troops hadn't had any cargo jacks at this dry dock, or maybe the commander down here hadn't been as on the ball as the one at the other end. If they'd had any defenses at all, the explosion had wiped them out of existence. The cargo door was still there, still intact, and the ship beyond it. The Russians, I began, but the words caught in my throat. Chernobog. I tried again. Had to have brought breaching charges to get through the cargo doors. Either the missile strikes or maybe a grenade set it off. Maybe. It didn't matter. They were dead. I didn't even have to check the bodies to be sure. I didn't have to look at the IFF readings. 
The blast wouldn't have killed them immediately, but the fragments were hypervelocity, as fast as the round from a K.E. rifle, and there was no recovery from that many holes in your suit in a vacuum. I hadn't known Danny Brooks that well, not beyond a casual work friendship between two officers of close rank. She was married, had two kids, both in high school, and it was incredibly selfish, but all I could think was that this time I wouldn't have to be the one to tell the family. All the families. God. Oh, God, sir. They're all dead. Quinn again, moaning like he was dying, too. These had been his people, his friends, as close to family as you can get. We have to get on the ship, I said. We have to get it out of here. How the hell are we gonna do that? Pops demanded. He was angry, for which I didn't blame him, but I thought I detected despair in his voice, too, which I was not used to. Hopelessness. The fucking bridge crew is dead except Tiger, and he might have a fucking brain bleed. Get the Helta. Get them and Tiger on board. If they can get the ship flying, I remember enough from what Julie taught me to maneuver and fire whatever weapons are available. Maybe. I didn't need to tell him, but I was a bit sketchy on the details of how to jump the thing to hyperspace. But I knew the computer systems were self-guiding to some extent, so I had high hopes. Quinn, go get them. Bring them back here. You carry Tigert. He didn't move for a moment, and I thought I'd have to give the order again. Yes, sir, he said finally. Pops was staring at me. You really think we can do this? Just the three of us and a few hell to Tex? They can barely stand to watch MMA, much less fight a fucking battle. What do you think we're gonna accomplish? I didn't want to snap at him. Mark Tremonti was as close to unflappable as anyone I'd ever met except Jambo. And if he was rattled, it was because there was good reason to be. And there was something wrong with me for not being rattled. I think, I said, that we're going to do whatever we can with what we have left. I think it's our job. And I think if I'm going to die out here, and if the Tavinians are going to wipe us out, and everything that we've done these last couple years has been for nothing, well, I think I'd rather die killing them than sitting on my ass in the station waiting for the missiles to hit. What do you think, Mr. Tremonti? Why the fuck, I wondered, was I so cold? Why was I not gibbering, paralyzed with fear? Even if the rangers who died hadn't been part of my command, even if they hadn't exactly been my friends, I should have been scared shitless. Any sane person would have been. Even Pops was, I could feel it. Quinn, who was as steady a soldier as I'd seen at his age, was shaken. And I wasn't. Quinn was coming up over the curve in the corridor, tigered over his shoulder, the Helta shuffling reluctantly behind him. I used to think, Pop said, finally answering my question, that James Bowie was the coolest stony-eyed killer I'd ever met, a man who wouldn't blink when the tangos had us surrounded and outgunned. But you got him beat, Andy. You got him beat by a fucking mile. Not a chance. If Jambo was here, he'd be making some bad joke to distract everyone. Me? I'm just moving forward like a driver at night hypnotized by the white line. I tried to get to the personnel entrance beside the cargo lock without stepping on any bodies or parts of bodies. It was a losing battle. At least the security pad was intact, and it took my override code. The outer lock slid open, and I waved the others in. Come on, I urged them. Let's get this thing out of here before someone gets around to blowing it up. This will not work. Fen Suyan insisted, eyes not leaving the engineering control panel, fingers weaving patterns in the haptic holograms. He had his suit helmet off, and the internal padding had compressed his hair, leaving it spiky and clumped up, giving him a sort of wet rat look, and it was hard to take him seriously. This ship's main weapons are not functional. We have point defense turrets, and controlling those from the bridge is nearly impossible. They are slaved to the missile defense sensors for a reason. Thanks for pointing that out yet again, I told him, my patience fraying around the edges. The rest of the Helta had gone down to engineering to fire up the reactor and ride herd on the drives. But I'd gotten Fen Su Yan, chief technical officer of the Helta crew, to be my assistant bridge officer. I wished he would shut up. I was having enough trouble trying to remember the command sequence to access the ship's maneuvering thrusters, and every time I tried to ask the computer for help, it took me to a different screen for a tutorial, and then I had to find my way back to the original command screen. 
Who the hell had Daniel Gatlin contracted for this operating system, Microsoft? How's it going up there, boss? Pops asked. His voice came over the earbud from my comm unit rather than my helmet, because I had reluctantly divested myself of my armor in order to fly this damned ship. I felt naked in just my combat utilities. Get in there, I told him, biting back my initial response about how it would be going better if people stopped talking to me. How's Tigert? The sick bay isn't fully stocked yet, but we got him out of his pressure suit, and we're doing what we can for him. He's started to talk a little. You want me up on the bridge? No, you two stay down there and take care of him. I'd have to teach you how to use any of the stations up here, and I'm only about halfway sure how to do it myself. Strap down and hang on. This could get rough. Roger that. Good luck, Andy. There it was. Finally, something I remembered. The dry dock and the ship were computer animations on a screen, tiny as a model, and I traced a line sideways out of the shipyard framework, then touched a button marked Execute. I didn't feel the thrust, not with the artificial gravity, but I heard the steady pounding of the steering jets against the hull, like some downstairs neighbor complaining about the noise. In the image, the Bravo ship floated clear of the dry dock, and I reached out over the top of the helm station to the tactical board and stabbed at another control, bringing up the display from that station onto the main screen. What I saw was enough to make me want to run back to the shipyard and crawl into the solar storm shelter. Space is big. If I talk about the Earth-Moon system, it sounds like nothing compared to the vast distances I'd traveled since that first trip in the Truth Seeker. But it's still an incredibly vast area, over 200,000 miles from one body to the other, extending all the way around the planet. By comparison, ships, even the Helta cruisers the Tavinians had stolen and we had copied, were a few hundred yards long, and most of battling one of them was trying to get close enough to land a blow before they could dodge it. The entire Earth-Moon system was a battlefield, with so many cruisers, fighters, and shuttles that I couldn't keep one of them in sight long enough to identify it. The computers simulated energy weapons with blue flashes, drew yellow halos around missiles and railgun rounds, and highlighted friendly vessels in blue, while likely enemy ships got a demonic red, and the whole display seemed like the inside of an old kaleidoscope. I touched the one control I knew about simply because Julie had made a point that Oliveira never used it. He hated the voice interface with the ship's computer system, but I sure as hell needed it right now. Voice command system access, I said, trying to make each word as clear as possible, remembering Julie telling me about the trouble with the system misunderstanding the speaker until I got used to their vocal cadence. Clearance, Alpha, Echo, 4, 3, 9. Clearance recognized, Major Clanton, the familiar female voice told me. I wondered how much Gatlin had paid to use it. He probably passed the cost on to the government. I am designated Bravo. How may I help you? I need to activate computer-assisted navigation and tactical controls. Activate drive field to station keeping relative to the dry dock facility. Drive field activated. Station keeping confirmed. Station keeping was using the drive field to hold the ship in place relative to a known position. In this case, the dry dock. Not that I wanted to stay around here, but I didn't want to go drifting off until I had an idea where we should point the damned thing. Bravo, where is the greatest concentration of enemy fighters? I asked, unable to sort through the flickering light show on the screen to find the information myself. Highlight in green. The largest concentration of enemy fighters is currently 1,000 kilometers from our position. Highlighted in green on the display. The green glob was fairly close, consisting of about two dozen of the space fighters. General Oliveira hated that term, thought it sounded too much like something out of a 1980s Japanese cartoon. But we had to distinguish somehow between the Tavinian dual environment fighters, which were basically atmospheric fighter jets with rocket engines for short orbital flights, and the space-based fighter craft that they carried around in their carriers. These had no sort of aerodynamics, converted from the ubiquitous orbital transfer vehicles used by the Helta and their allies at every one of their space facilities through the simple expediency of plating the thing in alloy armor and strapping on a point-defense laser turret, then plopping a suicidal maniac into the middle as a pilot. 
Individually, they were vulnerable and lightly armed and only dangerous to a shuttle, but they were never alone. They swarmed over cruisers like a cloud of mosquitoes, concentrating their laser fire at the same point on the shields, trying to cause an overload and collapse the drive field. I had seen them destroy Helta cruisers during the battle for Helta Prime, and I knew if any of our ships were decisively engaged with an enemy vessel, the fighters would try to take advantage of their distraction and hit them from behind. Bravo, take us into the center of that concentration, I ordered, at maximum acceleration. Slave all point defense turrets to one targeting reticle and display reticle on the main screen. I shot Fen Su Yan a tight smile. I know we can't do anything about those cruisers without our main weapons, but we can sure as hell keep those fighters off their back. Would it not be wiser? He asked me, finally turning from the engineering console to give me a baleful glare. To simply take this ship and run, to preserve it, so that you maintain interstellar capability for another day. He who fights and runs away, I murmured, remembering something I'd told Junpa a long time ago, lives to fight another day. Yes, exactly, Fen Suyan agreed, as close to burbling with enthusiasm as his ursine race got. Maximum acceleration confirmed, the computer told me. Laying course to bring the fighters into range of the point defense lasers, Major Clanton? Negative, bravo, I said. We're going to ram right into them with the drive field and rip them to atoms. Fen Suyan's horrified expression made me laugh. Damn the torpedoes, I told him. Full speed ahead. Chapter 26 I had, in the last few years, lived the life of a fairly successful writer with a moderately lucrative TV show, which meant I'd spent about ten months of the year in a boring routine of writing eight hours a day and the other two months vacationing wherever the hell I wanted, since I wasn't married and hadn't been interested in a long-term relationship until I met Julie. I'd visited most of the more interesting national parks, gone to New Zealand to see the real Middle Earth, gone moose hunting in Alaska, and most relevant to the current situation, done lots of scuba diving down in the Florida Keys. The fighters were like schools of fry, trying to scatter at the appearance of a predator, but too small and too slow to get out of the way in time. And while Bravo might not have had the teeth of a great white shark, it sure as hell had the bulk. The drive field of a cruiser propelled the ship by churning up the fabric of space-time, a cosmic boat propeller, and any ship not protected by its own drive field would get caught in the churn and ripped into its component atoms. A few of the fighters got off parting shots, spitting into the face of their executioner before Bravo's drive field turned them into expanding balls of gas. Their deaths didn't go unnoticed and didn't come without a price. The cruiser shuddered and lurched with every impact, kinetic energy surging into the field like feedback, no single collision enough to attenuate our drive field, but the accumulation dragging at us. Can we please not do that? Fen Suyan asked, teeth bared. The drive field was not designed for such things. Improvise, adapt, and overcome, my friend. I understand what each of those words means individually, but what is their significance when said together in such a way? They mean that we're going to do what we can to win this battle, and if that means splitting this ship right down the middle, that's what we're going to do. I looked up, as if the ship's computer was the statue of some ancient god looming above me, and I was praying to it. Bravo, find us the next largest concentration of fighters and set a course into the middle of them. The computer was following my instructions, but I wasn't. I wasn't looking at the fighters, wasn't looking at the big picture of the battle. I was trying to find Alpha, trying to find Julie. It was nearly impossible with the cruisers spinning and turning and micro-jumping from high Earth orbit out past the moon and then back again. But finally, I picked her blue dot out of the sea of enemy red out past lunar orbit. She was engaged with two enemy cruisers, stinging them with her particle cannon lacking an impulse gun that would have finished the fight in minutes. Alpha moved like a ballet dancer, taking full advantage of the physics-bending capabilities of the drive, doing things neither the Helta nor the Tavinians had ever dreamed of even attempting in the huge ship. She might have been appointed the captain of the vessel, but with a crew of only a half a dozen, I knew she was running the helm personally, and maybe tactical as well, flying the cruiser like the biggest fighter jet ever. Bravo, 
shuddered with feedback as the computer carried out my last order and enemy fighters evaporated in our wake. I barely noticed, fixated on the laser batteries lancing in to strike Alpha from two different directions, at the rainbow ring flexing around her ship as her drive field came close to overload. She'd been streaking across the black, but now she slowed nearly to a stop, keeping only the momentum she'd had when she turned on her drive field. She was a baby whale in a bathtub until her field regenerated and I had no weapons that would reach that far. Except the ship. Bravo, I snapped. Micro jump as close to Alpha's coordinates as you can and initiate drive field intersect at a survivable angle with whichever of those two enemy cruisers is the closest after the jump. Yes, Major. Micro jump in ten seconds. What? Fen Suyan squawked, and I didn't need the translator to tell me what he was saying. Have you gone mad? I ignored him and hit the control to the general public address speakers. Prepare for micro jump. Everyone strap down and secure for field intersect. The Helton beside me was chanting something in his own language that my translation program informed me wasn't directly translatable to English, but was basically a death song. I figured if I had anything that could be called a death song, I would have been singing it too, if I could sing worth the shit. What would be a good death song? Maybe something from Guns N' Roses? I've always liked Sweet Child of Mine, but maybe Paradise City would be a better choice. We jumped. Then we jumped again, and it was exactly as unpleasant as it usually was, except I didn't puke. The view screen shifted from a view of half the earth and all of the moon to nothing, then to burnished bright silver mountains shifting on all sides of us, too fucking close and getting closer, and... Fuck! The word burst from me like a frag grenade exploding without any sort of intent, as reflexive as breathing for a marine. I'd expected it. Hell, I'd ordered it, but it still somehow caught me by surprise. We hadn't actually hit the Tavinian cruiser, of course, because the drive fields extended for miles from the ship in each direction. All we'd done was graze our field against one of theirs, and the collision had sent us in one direction and her in another. I didn't know what had happened to their ship, and it was a long few seconds before I was in any condition to speculate about what had happened to ours. I was strapped into the seat, and it was a damned good thing, because otherwise I would have been sliding out of it. A 240-pound linebacker had slammed into me, sprinting a 4040, or at least that was what it felt like. I couldn't breathe, couldn't think, couldn't control my muscles. It only lasted a few seconds, but in my head it stretched for hours. And when I finally sucked in air, I felt as if I'd been trapped on the ocean floor and had to swim to the surface before I could take my next breath. I pushed myself up in the chair and realized the computer was shouting at me. Major Clanton, the dry field is down. Full repropagation will take four minutes and twenty-six seconds. We will be able to maneuver in one minute thirty-five seconds. I heard the words this time, but their meaning couldn't penetrate the sand packed into my brain. I squeezed my eyes shut and shook my head. The words filtered downward into my consciousness. No drive. No shields. No weapons. Got it. This is engineering. The voice startled me because it was speaking English without an accent. But then I realized the computer was translating the Helta crew down there automatically. We have lost two power conduits. They are completely burned out and will need replacement. Two more are strained to the breaking point and will not take another field intercept. Don't worry about it, I muttered, yanking loose my seat restraints. We ain't got a field to intercept. Fen Suyan was lolling in his seat, one hand twitching, moaning softly. I wish I had the luxury of being insensate, but instead I had to live with the consequences of my decision. I stumbled over to him, touching my earbud. Pops, can you hear me? I called. Quinn? Yeah. We're here, Pops said, though he didn't seem happy about it. Barely. Get Tigert back into his suit and see if you can find a fucking escape pod. We're driftwood for a minute and a half and I don't know where the fuck we are. We are, Bravo informed me helpfully, approximately 30,000 kilometers from our previous position. Use imperial measurements, goddammit, I grunted, grabbing Fen Suyan's helmet and sliding it over his head. He jerked against me, and I had to hold down his right hand with my knee while I sealed the helmet in place, then touched a control on his suit's wrist to fill it with air from the tank. 
Metric measurements are standard for the Coalition and for the United States Space Force, the computer informed me. I don't give a fuck, I insisted, jogging to the side of the bridge to a storage closet where I'd stashed my armor. As you wish, Major Clanton. There is an enemy cruiser emerging from hyperspace approximately 230 miles from our position. Great, I said, wincing as I nearly pulled a muscle trying to get into the Svalen armor without someone else to cinch the gaskets. I got the only fucking AI system in the entire space force with an attitude. I pulled on my helmet and sealed it in place, then pulled my rifle out from around the back on its gimbal. Bravo, can we maneuver yet? At 20% of standard acceleration analog, Major. Well, don't be shy. Get us the fuck out of here as fast as the ship will take us. Out of here is a vague command, Major. Bravo. You are trying my patience. The blue glow on the main screen caught my eye, and I knew it had to be the enemy ship's particle cannon firing, and we had less than 20% drive field to shield us. God wound up and kicked Bravo like a can down the road, and I was thrown off my feet despite the gyros built into the suit, crashing down onto my backpack. And then I began floating above the deck, and the lights flickered. The view on the main screen went dark, and when it reappeared, the detailed computer animation based on the gravimetric sensors was gone, replaced by a flat optical image from a camera feed somewhere near the bow of the ship. Hull penetration over engineering, the computer reported. Complete power loss from main reactor. All power conduits have failed. Artificial gravity has failed. But I'm so glad you're still with me, I said through clenched teeth. I was helpless, stranded in midair, but thankfully the suit had a provision for that. I peeled back the protective sleeve from the wrist control unit and touched a control to activate the magnetic anchors on the soles of my boots. Slowly, at first, I began sinking to the deck. Thank God I was closer to the deck than to the overhead, or I would have had to walk across the overhead to the bulkhead and back down around to the deck. And I needed to be on the deck, because I knew what was coming next. My feet touched with a thump, and I took a step toward Fen Su Yan. He was awake and aware now, thrashing in his seat, panicking, I thought, either at the sudden lack of gravity or maybe at the realization it meant we were floating and helpless. He hadn't even remembered to activate his suit's mic, but I could see his mouth moving inside the visor of his helmet. I think I might have mentioned earlier something about how if the external damage to a cruiser reaches all the way to the bridge, it pretty much means the ship was so much driftwood. We were already driftwood when the final shot came. There was a crackle of static electricity between the fingers of my left hand, a flash of light so bright I could see it through my helmet, through my eyelids, and a wave of heat, and then nothing. Chapter 27 I shuddered with a sudden chill and tasted metal. No, this is wrong. I'm dead, I shouldn't be cold. Unless Dad was right and there is a hell and I'm in it. I opened my eyes and wished I were in hell. Instead, I was lying on the cold metal deck of a ship staring up into the emitter crystals of four laser rifles and past them into the colder, steel-blue eyes of the four Tivinian soldiers holding them. Two men, two women, and the main differences were that the men had better mustaches and the women looked more bloodthirsty. I tried to jerk upright from instinct at the sight of the weapons and the fearsome expressions of the soldiers wielding them, but my hands were bound behind my back with something unyielding. I'd been stripped of my armor, though they'd left me my clothes, for which I was thankful. I don't suppose, I said, my words rasping out of a dry mouth. Any of you guys speak English? And yet I do, Major Clanton. The voice was familiar, though I couldn't place it at first. Female, strong, bombastic. The accent was atrocious, vaguely Eastern European in the way that Boris and Natasha from the Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons were vaguely Eastern European. I sat up, cautiously, trying not to alarm my captors. I was on the bridge of a cruiser. I could tell that immediately. Ours, the Tavinians, the Helta, they all looked the same because they all came from the Helta design. The screens were in the same place. The bridge stations were in the same place. The hatchway was in the same place. The Tavinians had added their own little touches to the decor, of course. 
Heads. Helta, Scrith, Vironian, Shamblisi, affixed to the bulkheads in a neat row beneath the screens and over the hatchway. No humans, because they would have looked too much like their own, I suppose. I was so absorbed by the heads, I nearly missed the captain. She stood over me, right fist on her hip, left resting on the butt of a holstered laser pistol, and I knew why her voice had sounded familiar, despite the accent and the fact she was speaking English. Her face was harsh and cold and beautiful like a glacier carving its way into the side of a mountain. Her red hair tied into matching braids, and I had seen her before on another Tavinian ship, the Belenus, during the battle for Helta Prime. She was Captain Cartimandua, and even more than letting her live, I regretted telling her my name. I suppose you did not expect to see me again, she said, sauntering closer. If smugness had a face, it would have been hers. I am honored to meet you in person this time, and not through a screen. I almost asked her how she'd come to speak English, but that much was obvious from her accent. The Russians. How did you know it was me? I asked instead. I never showed my face back on the Belenus. I scooted my feet beneath me and looked around at the soldiers guarding me, wondering if they'd let me stand. No, you did not, she agreed. But our new allies, the Russian Republic and the People's Republic of China, they have extensive files on you. Her full lips quirked into a smile. You are, I understand, quite famous on your world. Great. I tried to get to my feet, but something hard and blunt like a gun butt smacked into my left shoulder and knocked me back to the deck. I bit back a curse and the groan of pain coming hard on its heels and scowled at the soldier who had hit me. One of the women, of course. How am I alive? I asked. Your armor is quite impressive. Cartimandua paced around me, pushing past the guards. They yielded to her, not just with a deference to her authority, but almost with awe. She grabbed me by the back of my collar and hauled me to my feet with impressive ease. The woman was as tall as I am and maybe thirty pounds lighter. It saved you from the brunt of the blast that destroyed the bridge of your ship. It couldn't conduct all of the static charge from the particle cannon away from you, however. I wanted to ask her about the rest of the crew, about Pops and Quinn, but I controlled the impulse. Let me rephrase the question, since you haven't been speaking my language that long. Why am I still alive? She laughed at that, a cruel sound. I was sure it had been the last sound many an enemy of hers had ever heard. Ah, a better question indeed. You are alive because the Confederation values prisoners of your reputation, Major Clanton. Not just for what you know, but for what you represent. Vanquished enemies who were once fierce but have been brought down. You will be kept alive to parade before our rulers and then before your people. Once we have conquered this source to demonstrate to them they are truly beaten. And then you will be publicly strangled to death over the communications network you call the Internet. Your execution broadcast alongside those of your president and your military leaders, as an example. Pour encourager les autres, I murmured. I briefly toyed with the idea of trying to argue morals with her, pointing out that she was killing humans, just like her, that it had to be against their philosophy or religion, or whatever they called it, to slaughter her own kind, but it would have been hypocritical of me and definitely wouldn't have worked. I had to try something, but my head was pounding and my mouth was dry, and thinking wasn't coming easy. Surrender, I said finally. Captain Cartimandua blinked as if she wasn't sure she believed what she'd heard. Pardon, she said, but are you offering to surrender to me? Because that's not necessary, given our situation. Surrender to me, I clarified, and I can guarantee you that you'll be given a ship of the line, a glorious war to fight, and a palace of a home on Earth, on the Source. You have to believe the elders are on our side, that the Source is destined to prevail, right? That's part of your religion, isn't it? Join us. Be on the winning side. I figured she'd laugh. I would have laughed. Instead, she tilted her head, looking at me from a different angle, as if she were actually considering it. A bold suggestion, she acknowledged. 
one worthy of a warrior of your reputation, and not without its temptations. She sighed, either regretful or doing a good job of faking it. Unfortunately, even with my sheep, your forces are too badly outnumbered. Come. She jerked her head toward the main screen. I will show you. I didn't need her to interpret the details on their main tactical display. I'd been standing behind Julie's shoulder while the Helta trained her and the rest of the bridge crew on their systems. We'd changed a few things on the Jambo, but I could tell friendly from enemy. I just had to remind myself to reverse them since I was on a Tavinian ship. The Tavinian tactical officer glowered at me but said nothing, probably too fearful of offending Captain Katimandua. Whatever face he made couldn't have been uglier than what I saw on that screen. Bravo was dead and dark, split from bowed hangar bay, hanging off the starboard side of the Tavinian cruiser, its momentum lost to the death of the dry field. It was startlingly close in the view, and I knew something of the magnification settings of the tactical display, so I knew we were still within a couple miles of the dead ship. Did anyone else survive? I asked. I hadn't wanted to give her the satisfaction, but I had to know. Your health of friends? Carty Mandua scoffed. <laughs> no. The engineering room was destroyed, all within killed by exploding power conduits. And the one with you on the bridge did not live through the killing stroke of our particle cannon. She cocked her head, that same admiring gaze that almost seemed like she was assessing me as a sexual partner. It was admirable to attempt to fight us in a ship with no weapons, by yourself, with only a few cowardly helter scum. I didn't reply, just searched the screen for the rest of our ships. I found the Tavinian cruisers first and counted. There had been nine when they arrived in system, along with three carriers, according to Captain Lee. The carriers were nowhere to be found, either destroyed or jumped out of range once it became clear they would be of no further use. Of the cruisers, there were six left intact. Two were gone, probably vaporized by impulse gun rounds, since I was fairly sure they wouldn't run out on this fight. And a third still was tumbling out of control in a decaying orbit, much too close to the moon. Two to one odds wouldn't have been that bad, if we still had them. The Delia Strawbridge was drifting, dark on thermal. Drive field dissipated, her silvery skin marred in half a dozen places by black scars penetrating the interior of the ship. I knew it was her because I'd seen her sensor profile from the shuttle. The cowling around her impulse gun mount hadn't been completed before she launched, and the length of her railgun was a black line running down her dorsal spine. Only two of your ships remain, Carty Mandua told me, as if I couldn't see it for myself. The one you called the James Bowie still fights valiantly. And she did, despite the rainbow ring glowering from her drive field, a sure sign it was losing strength. All it would take was one shot from her impulse gun, and another of the Tavinian cruisers would vanish from reality. But the enemy captains knew that, too, and they were staying out of the way of her spinal mount, also aware that the gun could only fire straight ahead. It will take hours, perhaps, to destroy her, but we know she will not flee. There is nowhere left for her to run to, and as for the other... The other was the Alpha, Julie's ship. She was chugging through real space toward the Jambo, intent on helping Oliveira set up a shot with the impulse gun, but I could tell just by her speed that she was damaged. Cruisers using the drive field streaked through space at the equivalent of a hundred gravities, but the Alpha was crawling, her drive field attenuated by multiple hits. Even now, two Tavinian cruisers were shadowing her at the edge of particle cannon range, and as I watched, one of them surged forward and fired. It was remote far away, happening to someone else, like I was watching a documentary on the subject years later. I kept telling myself that, building a shell to protect me against what I knew was coming next. It didn't work. The Alpha's drive field collapsed and took half the ship with it. The drive nacelles, the reactor, the fuel stores all disappeared in a flash of actinic white. Squeezed out of existence at the atomic level by the gravimetric wave falling in on it from all sides. And so was I. I collapsed to my knees, my legs unable to bear my weight. She was gone. 
Was there someone you cared about on that ship? Cartimandua asked. She might have been sincere, might not speak English well enough to give the words their correct intonation. I might have been reading intent into an innocent question, not a taunt, but... My, I couldn't think through the featureless red haze, and I had nothing left to lose. I sprang to my feet without a plan, without a strategy, my hands bound behind me but determined to kill her, and ran straight into the butt of a laser rifle. The guard had been aiming for my face, but I wasn't so blinded by rage that I didn't remember to tuck my chin into my chest the way I'd learned during so many years of martial arts, taken at first because I could afford it and I was bored, and later honed by Jambo and his Delta team in the gym. Instead of striking me across the jaw, the butt of the gun grazed the side of my head, still hard enough to knock me flat, my vision filled with stars. I blinked them away and rolled onto my side, looking past the laser rifles trained at me and into Kartimandua's chill blue eyes. I searched for fear inside of me, but there was none left. I had nothing to offer but rage, and nothing to stop it but my death. If you leave me alive, I told her, my voice cold and emotionless, I'll get loose eventually, and when I do, I'll kill as many of you as I can until you kill me. You might as well just shoot me now. I hadn't prayed, really prayed, like I believed it in decades, not since I'd left home and joined the Marines. I prayed now. Just let them kill me. If I'm going to hell, it can't be any worse than this. She glared at me, more annoyed than angry, but she pulled the laser pistol out of its holster on her belt. Very well, she acceded. I suppose you've earned that much. She aimed the crystalline emitter between my eyes, and I smiled. It wasn't a bad way to go. A klaxon sounded, and Cartimandua spun, her gun hand going to high ready, fingers slipping off the trigger. She snapped something in her language to the tactical officer, and he responded with urgency, pointing at the screen, and without my comm unit, I didn't understand a word of it. But I understood the icons on the display, popping into existence in a ragged line just past lunar orbit. They were cruisers. Twelve. Fourteen, sixteen of them, one appearing on the heels of another, so close I was afraid they might have an unintentional field intersect. And they weren't Tavinian. I didn't speak the language, but I distinctly heard the words Shamblisi and Helta from the tactical officer, and I got some satisfaction from watching his face go white. Whiter, I should say, because all these Tavinians were about the whitest white people I'd ever met. The Alliance had come through. Help had arrived. I should have been elated, should have been whooping in victory, watching the cruisers sweep down like hungry sharks, their particle cannons stabbing into the night. A Tavinian ship disappeared as four different Alliance vessels fired on her simultaneously, collapsing her dry field into a quantum singularity in a microsecond. And another began to drift powerless, her nacelles burst and glowing white-hot, naked to space. But all I could think was that they were too late. Oh, Earth was saved, and without the Divinians to back them up, the Chinese and the Russians would draw in their horns and claim it had all been the work of some rogue faction of terrorists who would be handed over to the International Criminal Court. The day was saved, and I didn't give a fuck. They were too late for Julie. Carte Mandua speared me with a glare. It seems I no longer have the luxury of allowing you to die, Major Clanton she told me, shoving her pistol back into its holster. My superiors will wish to know what you know, which, I'm afraid, will be most unpleasant for you. She nodded toward the guards and snapped a command. It calls me to have to run, she told me, but at least I won't return without a prize. Chapter 28 Two of her soldiers grabbed me under the arms from behind, and I didn't bother to struggle, as they lifted me to my feet. The Tavinians, unlike the Helta and us, kept the hatch to the bridge secured, so one of the guards went ahead of us to touch the control for the door. He was standing directly in front of it when it slid aside and something white-hot punched through his chest and out his back, spraying the guard holding my right arm with steaming hot blood. 
I knew what was happening immediately, the realization a jolt of energy revitalizing me. The soldier let go of my right arm, a hand reflexively reaching to wipe his eyes, and I stamped downward into the knee of the Tavinian on the left. He howled an epithet and let go, and I leaped forward, expecting Cartimandua to shoot me in the back but beyond caring. A hulking figure in a suit of Svalin armor stepped through the hatchway and sprayed the bridge with K.E. rifle fire. I couldn't see through the visor, but the 75th Ranger Regiment scroll on the shoulder was plainly visible, and I knew it had to be Randy Quinn. He'd swapped out his drum from tungsten penetrators to anti-personnel incendiaries, and the burst of energy at the end of the barrel heated the bundle of sintered metal into a plasma as it left the weapon. The red and white splashes of burning metal looking very much like some sort of sci-fi movie energy weapon. Tavinian crew shouted and dove away from their stations seeking cover, and the burning metal tore into control panels and display screens, sending showers of sparks flying and acrid smoke drifting through the bridge. I sprinted past Quinn and nearly ran into the armored chest of Pops. This way, he said, his voice blaring over the external speakers of his helmet. He grabbed me by the arm and hauled me along beside him down a short corridor from the bridge to an enclosed alcove I recognized from our own cruisers and the Heltas as well. It was the entrance for the bridge escape pod bank. He yanked open an oval hatch and pushed me ahead of him into the pod. It was impossibly cramped, theoretically meant to hold six people, but I didn't know how Pops and Quinn were going to manage to squeeze into it. And that was before I noticed Colonel Tigard already strapped into one of the seats. I tumbled forward and nearly slammed my head into the control console in the center of the lifeboat, unable to use my hands to stop my fall. I managed to get a foot beneath me and shoved myself sideways into one of the acceleration couches beside Tigert. The XO was still unconscious inside his spacesuit, but I didn't know if that was from his initial concussion or the treatment they'd given him in the sick bay. Where the hell did you guys come from? I asked, watching with horrified fascination as Pops contorted through the narrow hatchway. When the ship got hit the first time, Pops told me, grunting with effort as he pulled himself inside, then turned and offered a hand to Quinn. Me and the kid took Tigert and beat feet for the hangar bay. We figured we'd see if there was a shuttle in there that we could all use to evac the ship if things got too bad. We didn't find a shuttle, but we did find some zero-G maneuvering packs, and when the enemy ship came close enough to send a boarding pod out, we snuck in the other way. Quinn caught part of his backpack on the corner of the hatch and yelled in frustration, grabbing a handhold inside the pod and yanking himself through, landing on his back. Pops lunged past him, ripping his sig from its chest holster and firing off a full magazine at something out in the corridor before he pulled the door shut and latched it. Brace yourself, he warned me, smacking a button in the center of the control panel. This is gonna get rough. He wasn't lying. The bridge was deep in the center of the ship, which meant that the escape pod had to get itself through the tunnel, past the hull, and away from the presumably exploding ship and do it fast. That was accomplished by quick burnout solid fuel boosters, and I'd heard the acceleration from an injection rated at around 9 Gs. Mercifully, I blacked out. I think I turned on this thing's emergency beacon, Pops mused, staring at the control panel, shaking his head. But I ain't sure. He pushed himself away and floated back to one of the acceleration couches, catching a restraint strap and using it to anchor himself. He and Quinn had both taken off their armor, strapping the suits down in their own couches, where they sat waiting patiently as if they were about to join in the conversation. Thankfully, Quinn had managed to get the restraints off my wrists first. Not that there was anything I could do with my hands other than twiddle my thumbs. Do you think the ship jumped to hyperspace? Quinn wondered, face pressed against the pod's single viewport. You couldn't even see the stars through it because of the interior lights but he hadn't moved from the port since he'd gotten out of his armor nearly two hours before. Where did the Alliance get them? I think, I told him, that if the ship had been taken out, we were close enough that we'd have gotten fried right along with her. Which meant Cartimandua was still alive somewhere out there, and would have an even bigger hard-on for me. Not that I cared about anything. We'll be okay, Pops insisted. Mostly for Quinn's benefit, I thought. Someone will see us floating out here eventually. Whether I got the signal activated or not, we'll be back home in no time. Home, I mumbled, 
Where the hell is that? Your home's with us, Andy, Pops told me. With the team. I rubbed my eyes, pretending to be tired, but mostly trying to hide the tears from him because they wouldn't be held back any longer. I can't do this anymore, I told him. I'm going back to Vegas, to my house, going back to being a hack science fiction writer with a shitty TV show. I did my fucking part. Someone else can carry the weight now. She wouldn't have wanted you to give up. My head snapped up, and I glared at Pops, something of the same red haze descending that had hit me on the Tavinian ship. I guess we'll never know what she would have wanted, will we? My grip on the edge of the acceleration couch tightened, my knuckles going white. I sucked in a deep breath and forced myself to relax, pushed the rage back beneath the overpowering weight of despair. I'm seeing something out here, Quinn said, pressing his face even closer to the port. There's something moving. I'm seeing something glowing. Might be maneuvering thrusters. Pops pushed across the pod and nudged the kid out of the way, trying to get a look, angling this way and that, grunting in obvious frustration. You fucking with me, kid? He demanded. I don't see a damned thing. The life pod shuddered. My grip tightened against the side of my acceleration couch to keep from floating off it, and I looked upward at the docking ring set in the nose of the little boat. Something banged against it, then metal screeched, grinding against metal. Pops pulled his sig from the holster on the chest plate of his armor, and I looked at him askance. It's not the Tavinians, I told him. No, he agreed, but it could still be the Chinese or the Russians. And if you're pointing a gun at whoever comes through that hatch, I pointed out, their first response will be to shoot us and cut us loose. Put it away. He scowled at me, but did as he was told. I settled back and waited, finding it was too much effort even to stare at the airlock. More grinding and rattling shook us, and finally, a gentle hiss of air as pressures equalized and my ears popped. The airlock hatch swung outward, and a blue Space Force pressure suit appeared in the gap, a SIG 9mm shoved ahead of it, the muzzle swinging back and forth to cover all four of us. Don't move! The voice was young and male and nervous. Then the command repeated again in Tavinian. Pops glared at him, gesturing at his teak brown skin. Do I look like a fucking Tavinian to you? He demanded. The space suited figure pushed up the visor of his helmet. He was even younger than he sounded, maybe nineteen. His eyes wide and his mouth in an O. Then his expression firmed up and the muzzle of the sig ceased to waver. I don't know if all Tavinians are white, he reasoned. They might just not have had any African, uh, African Tavinians on their crews so far. All I know is this escape pod has Tavinian markings, and the automated beacon we found here in the shuttle was on a Tavinian frequency. Now you guys are going to need to turn around and put your hands behind your heads. A bare hand grabbed the kid by the shoulder, and he looked back into the airlock of the shuttle. It's okay, technician. They're Americans. Julie Nieves's grin appeared over the technician's shoulder. I'll vouch for them. I didn't speak. Didn't move. Didn't breathe. I knew it had to be a hallucination, maybe brought upon by the concussion or the static shock that had knocked me unconscious back on the Bravo, and I was waiting for her visage to disappear, to morph into a stranger's face. It didn't. She pushed the young enlisted man out of the way and pulled herself through the lock, and then she was in my arms, and she couldn't be real, but she was, and I was kissing her and tasting the salt of tears, unsure whether they were hers or mine. And when I could finally speak, I only said one word. How? How what? She asked, teasing, smiling through her own gentle sobbing. How did you manage to find someone as awesome as me? How have I not kicked you to the curb yet? That too, I admitted, laughing perhaps a little hysterically. How did you survive? I saw your ship explode. What, do you think your ship was the only one with escape pods? The words were sarcastic, but her expression sobered immediately, and I think she would have sagged against me if there had been gravity. The implosion took out engineering. Bonwell and Hayden were in there. They never had a chance. The bridge was cracked right down the middle, and three of the four escape pods were damaged. The reason I'm not still wearing my spacesuit is that it was half-melted, and the rescue crew had to cut it off me. I hadn't noticed until then the bandages wrapped around her forearms. Another on her lower leg, her fatigue pants torn away from it. She shivered in my arms. 
It was a damn close thing, Andy. Closer than I ever want to see again. I took her face between my hands and rested my forehead against hers, the two of us floating together in nothingness for just a moment. I hate to interrupt, Pop said, clearing his throat, but I'd really like to get Colonel Tiger into the shuttle while they can still do some good for him. Come on, Julie urged me, pushing me ahead of her into the waiting grasp of the Space Force technician. General Oliveira is waiting for us on the Jambo, and I understand he has some company. Chapter 29 Blood, brother! Anu Neem Klaas said, his hands stuck out awkwardly for a shake. I greet you in the human manner. That is the greeting of a friend, I told him, pulling the big wolf man into a hug. This is the manner in which we greet our brothers. The whole bridge crew and assembled aliens were all staring at us, and I didn't care. God bless the big hairy asshole, he'd saved us all. Anu patted my shoulder stiffly and awkwardly, and I let go after a moment, not wanting to cause an interstellar incident. I was just glad I'd picked up a comm unit in Earbud before coming up to the bridge. Julie had let me know I might need one. Thank you for convincing the others to come, I told Anu Neem Klaas. We wouldn't have lived through this without your help. I turned to the other Alliance representatives gathered on the bridge of the Jambo, Vironian and Shamblisi and Helta, and nodded my gratitude. Without all of your help. I am saddened to learn of the death of Captain Junpa, the Helta officer said. I couldn't remember his name and didn't know if the octopus and the lizard man were the same ambassadors who we'd met on the Skrith homeworld or totally different people. Junpa gave up his life to save our world, Michael Oliveira declared, back to his normal, self-consciously dramatic senior officer self now that the battle was over. He will not be forgotten. Our nation, our coalition, and our entire world will honor him among our own heroes and legends. Oliveira didn't look any the worse for wear, but that was more a function of how deeply the bridge was buried than how much of a beating the Jambo had taken. I'd seen her on the way in with the search and rescue shuttle, and the old girl had gone ten rounds with the heavyweight champion. Her impulse gun mount was gone, ripped away, and huge black gouges had been burned into her sides where the drive fields had been overloaded locally by enemy particle cannons. Just a few more minutes, and she would have shared the fate of the Delia Strawbridge and been lost with all hands. Roberto Garcia had reappeared from the self-imposed exile of his compartment once the bullets stopped flying, and he moved in to gladhand the Alliance representatives, which wasn't easy with the Chamblisi who didn't have hands. I left him to it drawing Anunim Kloss away from the others into a huddle, with me, Julie, and Oliveira. Tell me honestly, brother, I said. How did you do it? How did you change their minds? It was not I alone, he said, hand going to his chest. I went to my government and pled your case, and they agreed to send what forces we had independent of the alliance. The Helta had already committed to your cause. And once both of us decided to support you, the Chamblisi were forced to agree, because the Alliance would have disintegrated otherwise. He woofed, which the translator informed me was the equivalent of a laugh. The ugly bastards aren't happy about it, but there's little they can do, particularly now that the Tavinians have been defeated. Anu bared his teeth in savage joy. This is two clear defeats for the enemy in just months. Two more victories than we have had in ten years. Even the Chamblisi cannot gainsay this. His gaze flickered to the other representatives, who were following Garcia off the bridge. Your pardon, my brother, but I must stay with the others, lest they be tempted to renege on agreements made in the spirit of desperate haste now that the battle is over. I watched him go shaking my head in disbelief. And all because I killed a fucking elk with a spear, I mused. Shit, now that he's here, I should take him to Alaska and try to get a moose. I should have you busted back to Lieutenant, Oliveira growled, no amusement on his face. Hell, I should bust you both down to Space Force Technician, first class. You were both supposed to take those ships and leave. Get them out of the system and keep them viable for us in case we needed them in the future. If the damned Alliance hadn't shown up, we'd have wound up with no starships at all. Mike, 
I said to him, earning a raised eyebrow. If the Alliance hadn't shown up, there wouldn't have been any future to save them for. I chuckled. Besides, once Tigert got wounded and the rest of the crew was dead, I don't even think I could have found another star system to run to. I was stuck with that damned virtual assistant system you hate so much. Sir? Julie asked. How did things go downstairs? It seemed pretty bad last we heard. Downstairs was Earth. It was interesting how quickly we developed our own lingo after just a couple years in space. I wasn't sure I was at home enough in space to refer to Earth quite that casually yet. It was pretty bad, Colonel, he confirmed, the ramrod stiffness going out of his back, his shoulders sagging. Casualties ran into the tens of thousands, and a shitload of those were civilians. But once you took the ships out of dry dock, things died down. The entire attack downstairs was a distraction to keep our eyes off the ships. And let me guess, I said, lip curling in a cynical snarl. The Russian and Chinese governments are claiming it was rogue elements and hardliners, and they condemn the violence and pledge to apprehend and prosecute everyone involved. It sounds like you wrote the press release for them. The muscles in Oliveira's jaw clenched tight. I'll lay you even odds the bastards get away with it, too. Popoff and Chairman Zhang are smart enough to know when the fight's over, and it's time to just take what they can get. And President Crenshaw is pragmatic enough to act like he believes them, in exchange for whatever he can squeeze out of them in private. You don't approve? Julie said. Her arm was hooked through mine, and she hadn't taken more than a few steps from me since she'd joined me in the shuttle, and I was okay with that. It galls me, Oliveira admitted. I don't know if I could keep my mouth shut in public, which is probably why I'll never be president. Never say never, I cautioned him. You're a war hero, and you might live a long time. I shrugged, thinking of Danny Brooks. Maybe, if you get out of this fucking business. Is that what you're going to do? Oliveira asked, eyes sharpening, as if he could see into my thoughts. Get out of this business? What I'm going to do, I said, slipping an arm around Julie and leaning on her for support is make a lot of next-of-kin visits, attend a lot of funerals, and a lot of posthumous medal ceremonies. I swallowed the lump in my throat and squeezed my eyes shut for a second before I could go on, forcing cheerfulness into my voice. Then I'm going to take leave and get married. I looked a question at Julie. You want to have a ceremony or just let Elvis marry us in one of those Vegas wedding chapels? As tempting as that sounds, she said, tilting an eyebrow at me, I'd like to invite my folks and my daughter. Then you're certainly invited as well, General Oliveira. And after the honeymoon, which will be just as long as I can strong-arm the president who owes me one into allowing, and as luxurious as my royalty checks can cover, then, and only then, will I even try to decide what the hell I'm going to do next. We, Julie reminded me, squeezing my bicep. What the hell we are going to do next, I corrected myself. Congratulations, he said. But his eyes narrowed, as if he wasn't buying it. But Julie, you can't tell me you're ready to give up serving on a starship for the domestic life. Mike, she told him, laughing. I have lost count of how many times in the last two years I've almost died. What I'm ready for is a goddamned rest. When I think, Julie said between gasps, that we could have been lying on a beach on Kauai... Come on, I said, grunting the words, leaning into the steps cut into the trail, my quads burning with the effort, the straps of my backpack cutting into my shoulders. Just look at that view. Would you trade that for a beach in Hawaii? Grinnell Lake shone aquamarine in the morning sun, nestled in the green hills of Glacier National Park. Well, green and a little white. We were pushing the season and tempting fate backpacking Glacier in mid-September and there was a dusting of snow from last night, but it was melting off quick. I was betting we had a window for a three-night backpacking trip. It's a great view, she admitted, pausing for a second and leaning over to get the weight of her pack off her shoulders. There are a lot of nice views in Hawaii, too. Hey, we did Bali already. I took advantage of the break to grab a water bottle and suck down a quick drink. We agreed you'd pick the first half of the honeymoon and I'd pick the second. You know I like the mountains. I nudged her, grinning lasciviously. Besides, this time of year, we'll have the campground pretty much to ourselves. Like I'm going to have the energy for that, she scoffed. 
Then she frowned and her head tipped upward. Is that a helicopter? I don't know. I shaded my eyes and searched the sky, cloudless and painfully blue. It was about 45 degrees, but I was still sweating. Did you already call for an evac? There it is, she said, pointing. Her scowl deepened. Is that a Black Hawk? It was, and it was the dark green of an army bird, the white star on the side confirming it, and it was heading straight for us. Oh, shit, I murmured. You don't think... She trailed off, looking between me and the helicopter. They really wouldn't do that, would they? The helo was almost directly overhead now, about 200 feet above us and descending. When the door opened and a soldier kicked a rope ladder down to us, I knew that, yes, they indeed would do that. Major Clanton, Colonel Nieves, the pilot's voice came over a loudspeaker in the side of the bird. Please board the aircraft. Hey, assholes, Julie yelled up into the thump-thump of the rotors. We're on a honeymoon. I sighed and grabbed the ladder when it whipped by. There was no point in arguing. Baby, I told her, I think the honeymoon's over. When the Black Hawk had taken us to a private jet at the Glacier Park Airport, I'd been convinced we were heading to Texas. It wasn't quite that bad. The base in Idaho was a three-hour flight, and there was even beverage service. Michael Oliveira was waiting for us in the briefing room at the Alpha site in Idaho, which I had halfway expected. Anu Nim Klaas was also waiting, which I had not. Brother! Sister! He greeted us, offering me first a nuzzle and then a hug, then doing the same to Julie, who looked bemused by the whole thing. I beg your forgiveness for calling you away from your journey, but I fear the news I bring could not wait for your return. You called us back? I asked, not trying to hide my confusion. Don't blame me, Oliveira insisted. Ambassador Anonim Klaas contacted the president and asked for you, and that was pretty much the end of the debate process. What's up? Julie wondered. What's so urgent? Tell me the Tavinians haven't started causing trouble again already, I pleaded with him. Holy hell, they couldn't have that many warships left, could they? No. They have drawn in their horns and begun to concentrate what defenses they have left in their home system and a few colonies around it. The Scrith bared his teeth. The Shamblisi and the Helta have begun a campaign under guidance from your advisors to retake the shipyards they've captured, and with those out of their grasp, it will be some time before they are again a threat. Then what's the problem? The Helta and the Shamblisi have long kept gravimetric sensors along the outer edges of their territories, trained outward, hoping for some signal, some sign that there are more of us out there, more races seeded by the elders. Before the war they built them, not just in their own systems, but in ours, and the Vironians as well. Many of them were lost when our outer systems fell to the Tavinians, but we have, of late, retaken several of these worlds as the enemy has fallen back. He gestured to Oliveira, and the general touched a control on his comm unit. The holographic projector above the conference table at the center of the room snapped to life and showed us a star map. One system was highlighted in red, though I couldn't have told you where the hell it was in relation to Earth from looking at the map. In this, the Death Roaring System... We finally checked the last ten years' worth of recorded readings from the automated sensors. The gravimetric sensors can detect hyperdimensional communications signals, Oliver explained. And we have picked up just such a signal, Anu told us, bristling with excitement like a puppy who just found a mirror. We can't interpret it, but it's definitely not a natural pattern. And it's coming from here. He jabbed a finger at the map, and another system lit up in red, connected to the first by a line that seemed to go on forever. It's at least five hundred light years from the edge of our settled systems, inward toward the galactic center. You think it's an alien species? Julie asked him. For the first time since we'd boarded the helicopter in Glacier, she seemed genuinely interested rather than annoyed. We think, Anu said that it may be the elders themselves. I whistled softly. 
This is farther than anyone has traveled before, he explained, and we have no idea what sorts of threats we may face. We would not risk such a journey without protection, and no one is more qualified to guard the expedition than you humans. What do you say? Oliveira asked, smiling crookedly, arms folded over his chest. Are you two going to retire to a life of domestic bliss? Or do you want to travel halfway across the galaxy and see if we can find the elders themselves? I met Julie's eyes, and she shook her head. I know you want it out of this. I don't want to drag you back into it. I tried not to grin like an idiot, but it was a losing battle. <laughs> You're asking me, I said, laughing softly. If I want to boldly go where no man has gone before? Oh, good God, Oliveira moaned, rubbing at his temples like his head hurt. Maybe this isn't such a good idea. I only have one question, I said. When do we leave? This has been Return Fire, Book 3 of the Earth at War series. Written by Rick Partlow. Narrated by Scott Aiello, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2021 by Rick Partlow. Production copyright 2021 by Pramantha Publishing. To learn more about Rick Partlow's novels, please visit rickpartlow.com. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.